Good morning, everybody. Uh, I welcome you to our fourth and final day of uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation hearing. Over the last three days, the American people heard directly from the judge. He sat through uh, hours and hours, and I think my staff uh, calculated 32 and a half hours uh, of our uh, colleagues' statements and, of course, our colleagues' questioning. I think he made a very compelling case that he is one of the most qualified nominees, uh, if not the most qualified that we've seen for the Supreme Court of the United States, and I have seen, I think, 15 of them. He demonstrated uh, that his 12 years of exemplary judicial service on the nation's second highest court uniquely qualifies him for a promotion to the nation's highest court. In fact, on today's first panel, we'll hear from two witnesses from the American Bar Association, the ABA, whose assessment, particularly by Democrat leaders, I like to quote that they refer to it as the gold standard of judicial evaluation, has rated Judge Kavanaugh unanimously well qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit now how today's uh, going to evolve. Each ABA wit witness will have five minutes to make an opening statement. We'll then have five minute rounds of senators questioning of the panel. We will have three more panels after the <coughs> ABA panel where we will hear from 26 additional witnesses. Uh, we will have uh, three more, uh, Oh, 26 additional witnesses. Many of these witnesses include uh, the judges, former law clerks, students, friends, and associates. They will help uh, make the case that not only is Judge Kavanaugh one of the most qualified nominees that we have, uh, Judge Kavanaugh is also an exceptional judge, teacher, coach, volunteer, and dad, and I'm sure we'll hear that. Now, I want to point out one person that's going to come on a later panel because he has deep Iowa roots. I'm pleased and proud to hear from Professor Adam White, grew up in Dubuque, Iowa, graduated from Dubuque Well at High School, the University of Iowa and Harvard Law School, and Adam's parents live in Bettendorf, Iowa. So he's probably not here yet, but I welcome Adam, and I hope to meet his parents as well. We will divide the time equally between the majority's 13 and the minority's 13 witnesses. Each witness have five minutes to make an opening statement, then five rounds for senator questioning of each of the three panels. Our first panel today will feature two uh, representatives from the ABA Standing Committee of the Federal Judiciary, Paul Moxley and John Tarpley. Uh, I'd like to have you folks stand now so that I can swear you. Uh, you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yeah. Before you give your testimony, I know a fine lawyer in Des Moines by the name of Mr. Brown who does a lot of what you're doing, and I know he spends a lot of time doing it and takes it very seriously. Uh, so let's, uh, uh, did you two folks, do I get to make a I'm sorry, statement? you do get to make a statement. <laughs> hey, I apologize. I, uh, go ahead. You, you should make a statement. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't have any questions for the two panelists, but I want to thank them both for all the hard work the ABA does, not just on the evaluation of Judge Kavanaugh but on your evaluation of all of the district and circuit court nominees that come before the committee. I, in particular, pay special attention to the recommendation. And uh, for me, speaking personally, it is very important. And I want you to know that. And I believe I speak for members on my side as well. For decades, the American Bar has provided an analysis of judicial nominations to provide the Senate and the American public with an important assessment of a nominee's qualifications. 
So thank you. Um, the kind of rating it is, is to some extent what colleagues know of colleagues. Um, and I think it's important because we see one side of a person, but the ABA sees their professional side and hears about their professional side. And I think that's very important. The rating is not determinative, and by no means is it the only consideration necessary to evaluate a nominee. It does provide the useful insight into whether the nominee has the legal competence, temperament, and integrity to be elevated to the federal bench. And I think it's critically important for the ABA to be allowed to follow its process and finish its work before a nominee has a hearing. And I know I am, Mr. Chairman, speaking for our side on that point, because this enables the committee to ask questions of the nominee, especially if the ABA's evaluation suggests areas of concern in the nominee's record. So I hope we can return to such a progress, uh, process. Once again, thank you for your hard work and welcome today. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moxley, do you want to start for your group? Happy to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ranking Member Feinstein. Uh, we're honored to be here today representing our committee and explain our evaluation of uh, Judge Kavanaugh. We gave him the highest rating possible, which is unanimously well qualified. For over 60 years, we have conducted thorough, nonpartisan, non ideological peer review of nominees to the federal courts. We assess the nominee's integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. The Standing Committee does not propose, endorse, or recommend nominees. We only evaluate the professional qualifications of a nominee to the courts. I'm from Salt Lake City. John Tarpley, to my left, is from Nashville, Tennessee. And in the gallery is Bob Trout. And we are also assisted by Pam Bresnahan, who was the chair of this committee in July when uh, the nomination came in. Uh, to be a nominee to the Supreme Court, one must possess exceptional professional qualifications. As such, our investigations of a nominee is much more extensive than the other federal courts. First, all of the circuit members of the committee, which are 14, participate in the evaluation. Every federal circuit in the country is covered by these 14 people, and not, in, not just the circuit in which the nominee resides. Second, while the Standing Committee independently reviews the writings of the nominee, we also commissioned three reading groups. In this instance, we had the University of Maryland, the University of Utah, and a professional group. And in this group of people were approximately 48 law professors and distinguished uh, practitioners. Members of the reading groups independently evaluated factors such as the judge's analytical abilities, the clarity of writing, knowledge of the law, application of the law to the facts, expertise in harmonizing a body of law, and the ability to communicate effectively. We contacted and solicited input from almost 500 people who are likely to have knowledge of his qualifications, including federal and state judges, lawyers, and bar representatives. Some of these people were identified in his Senate questionnaire, which you're all so familiar with. Also, our committee had a confidential evaluation performed on Judge Kavanaugh in the years 2003, 2005, and 2006 
when he was nominated to the D.C. Circuit Court. We also, Mr. Tarpley, myself, Mr. Trout, met with the judge for about three and a half hours in early August, and since then have talked to him regularly on the telephone, had email exchanges and the like. We concluded that his integrity, judicial temperament, and professional competence met the highest standards for appointment to the court. Our rating of unanimously well-qualified reflects the consensus of his peers to have knowledge of his professional qualifications and we reached out to a broad range of legal professionals, including almost 500 people, and we conducted about 120 personal interviews. And with that, that concludes my opening statement. Mr. Turpey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking <coughs> Member Feinstein and members of the committee. Uh, good morning. I'm John Tarpley. As my colleague Paul Moxley reported, I am the lead evaluator of the American Bar Association's investigation of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to the United States Supreme Court. It's my privilege to be here, and it's my privilege to present this testimony on behalf of the committee's evaluation of Judge Kavanaugh's professional qualifications. Let me point out at the start, the standing committee did not consider Judge Kavanaugh's ideology his political views, or his political affiliation. It did not solicit information with regard to how Judge Kavanaugh might review on specific issues or cases that could come before the United States Supreme Court. Rather, the ABA Standing Committee's evaluation of Judge Kavanaugh was based on a comprehensive, nonpartisan, non-ideological peer review of integrity, professional competence, and judicial temperament. In evaluating integrity, the Standing Committee considers the nominee's character and general reputation in the legal community, his industry, and his diligence. The Standing Committee found that Judge Kavanaugh enjoys an excellent reputation for integrity and is a person of outstanding character. It was clear from all of our interviews and other lengthy conversations that he learned the importance of integrity from a very early age and throughout his life. Importantly, many of the lawyers, judges, and others interviewed praised his integrity. They said his integrity is absolutely unquestioned. He is a person of the highest morality and the highest ethics. He is what he seems, very decent, humble, and honest. Another said he always seeks to be fair. He is not result-oriented. He wants to do the right thing. On the basis of our comprehensive evaluation process, the Standing Committee concluded that Judge Kavanaugh possesses the integrity for our highest rating, a unanimous well-qualified. Professional competence. This enc encompasses qualities such as intellectual capacity, judgment, writing, analytical abilities, knowledge of the law, and breadth of professional experience. A Supreme Court must uh, possess all of these exceptional qualities. Judge Kavanaugh's professional competence easily exceeds these very high criteria. One of the reading group members noted in reviewing his scholarly work, their view was that Judge Kavanaugh writes and analyzes the law and the application of the facts to law and that with exceptional clarity and that his opinions are well organized, resulting in clear precedent. Another said Judge Kavanaugh is an excellent writer with a flair for making comp complicated facts very understandable. Given the breadth, diversity, and strength of the positive feedback we received from judges and lawyers from all parts of the profession, the committee would have been hard pressed to come to any conclusion other than that Judge Kavanaugh has demonstrated exceptional professional competence. Those with whom he have, has worked and those who have been involved in cases over which he has presided have applauded his intellectual acumen, his thoughtful discernment, and his written clarity. As a result, the ABA's Standing Committee has determined that Judge Kavanaugh possesses sufficiently outstanding professional competence to be rated unanimously well qualified. In evaluating judicial temperament, the ABA Standing Committee considers a nominee's compassion, decisiveness, open-mindedness, courteousness, patience, and freedom from bias. 
Lawyers and judges overwhelmingly praise Judge Kavanaugh's judicial temperament. They said, among other things, he is very straightforward. He maintains an open mind about all things. He is an affable, nice person. He is easy to get along with and even has a good sense of humor. Can you imagine that, a judge with a good sense of humor? He is really a decent person. He has, his temperament is terrific. He is thoughtful, fair-minded, always fair-minded in his questions to counsel, thus our highest rating in this category. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I note that the ABA Standing Committee shares the goal of your committee to assure a qualified and independent judiciary for the American people. On behalf of the ABA's more than 400,000 members from one end of the country to the other, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present this statement explaining our evaluation. We are a very diverse group of lawyers, and we agreed unanimously that Judge Kavanaugh meets our high standards and rated him as unanimously well qualified to serve as an associate justice on the United States Supreme Court. Thank you again for this opportunity, and thank you for your service. Questions of you. I'm going to start with Senator Graham, but before I do that, uh, I just want to thank you not only for your testimony, but you and your colleagues that did this uh, review. We thank you very much for that part of your public service and your dedication to the rule of law. Uh, Senator Graham and then Senator Feinstein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that was an <coughs> incredible explanation and overview of a well-lived life. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, he sounds like a great judge, but a lousy politician. <laughs> I don't, he has no chance in my business. Uh, what I would like to do is thank you, because very seldom do we have moments like this <clears throat> uh, in modern politics where you pick people outside the rim of politics to give us a, some insight about a person like you have done. Often, not often, but sometimes we disagree with the ABA's rating from a Republican point of view. I'm glad you do what you do. I want it to continue. When you reach a conclusion that I disagree with, it won't be because I don't respect your opinion. From this committee's point of view, I think this is a valuable input. Some of us think you may be more left than right at times as an association, but that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is the quality of your work and I think you do the country a great service. So just to sum, sum up, intellect, A+. Plus. Absolutely. Agree with that, Mr. Moxley? Yes. Integrity, A+. Plus. A++. Plus plus. Again, we have nothing in common, I don't, with Judge Kavanaugh, so <laughs> as far as uh, A++. Plus plus. I think I've got integrity, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put myself in the category of this man in terms of his ability to impress his peers. Uh, would you say he's mainstream in terms of being a judge? Absolutely. He's at the top of the stream. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard the word radical used when it came to Judge Kavanaugh? No. Not in, not in all of the evaluations that we've done, and we communicated with more than 100 lawyers and judges who work with him on a regular basis. If he's confirmed, do you think the court will be in good hands if he's a member of it? We gave him our, our unanimously well-qualified rating. It's our highest rating, absolutely. You agree with that, Mr. Moxley? Absolutely. Are either one of you running for president? Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll save that job for you, Senator. <laughs> Didn't work out. <laughs> Senator Feinstein. I have no questions um, except to say that I think the report in writing is very helpful. Uh, I think the individuals' names that are down here who have participated in uh, different aspects of it is very helpful. I think we have something that becomes part of the standing record. Yes. And there has been some controversy about the ABA, as you probably know. And I think the way to, to really solve it are reports like this, which are thorough and contemplative and, um, and helpful. So thank you. Thank you. We 
We understood we needed to make a motion for the admission of the statement as well. Uh, it, I just think it's automatically accepted uh, because we always say you have five minutes and a longer written statement would be uh, included. Senator Cruz, or uh, go ahead, Senator Cruz. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I want to briefly enter into the record. I should, uh, I should say that uh, we do all this without objection. I don't hear any objections so that the report is received. Go ahead. So I want to briefly enter into the record a letter from the Solicitor's General of 12 states, including the state of Texas. Uh, these SGs have written in their personal capacities to express our strong support for the confirmation of Judge Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, they write, quote, the Solicitor General serves as the state's chief appellate litigator. Thus, we represent our states in the U.S. Supreme Court, carefully study the work of the court, and have a keen appreciation for the role that the court plays in safeguarding the rule of law including vital federalism and separation of powers principles. In our view, Judge Kavanaugh would make an outstanding addition to the nation's highest court. Throughout his distinguished career, Judge Kavanaugh has demonstrated an unwavering commitment to preserving the rule of law and advancing the legal profession. And so I'd like to enter this in the record. Without objection, it will be received. Uh, Senator Coons. Let me just ask uh, both of you one question, if I might. Um, would it concern you if we proceeded to consider a nominee for a judicial post without taking into account the ABA's advice? Paul? Yes. <laughs> you, uh, I'll just add to that. Paul knows that I'm the wordy one of this duo, but uh, I will add to that. Yes, I think it is. Uh, it's an it's an incremental part of the process. It's an important part. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I'm really interested in the kinds of judges that we have. All of our 410,000 law members bring a unique perspective to this process. Our individual committee members bring a unique, serious perspective to the process. It's valuable work. We believe that we do, and we think it's important to the process. What, what I would add to that is that um, the thing that's hard to get your mind around is that um, if you have practitioners from a particular uh, district or circuit and they're well known to the courts and you call the judges in your district or the lawyers in your district, they're going to be, because they know you, they're going to be more honest and candid with you about a particular, and since it's confidential, and part of our rule is that if someone brings up negative information about a nominee, unless we take that information back to the nominee for them to rebut it, we don't use it. But it gives, it gives the work that we do more authenticity, at least in our minds it does. And obviously we're doing this on a pro bono basis, and we think it's important uh, or we wouldn't be doing it. Well, because thank you. Uh, we're, interested, we're interested in having good courts, and we represent everyday people who are dependent on the courts. I consult and rely on the ABA ratings uh, when I'm considering district court, circuit court, and obviously Supreme Court <laughs> nominations. I appreciate your input both on Justice Kavanaugh, but this is input that I look for every time we're doing a confirmation hearing, and I think it's valuable, and I think it ought to be part of our regular process. I appreciate your appearing before us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Crable. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't have a question, but now I do. Uh, <clears throat> I, too, uh, appreciate uh, deeply the work that the ABA does and the ratings and reviews that it gives on all of our candidates. To me, that's not the question that this committee has been struggling with. The question is whether the ABA, or anybody for that matter, should be given a black ball and be able to prohibit or ban a candidate uh, from being considered by this committee if it doesn't give it its approval. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Incidentally, um, one of your fellow from Idaho was chair of this committee, Tim Hopkins. A great attorney, great, good, good great, friend. Great lawyer and great man. Um, I don't think that um, we only see our part of the ball. And what we're familiar with is the the competence of nominees, their integrity, and their judicial temperament. Uh, you may have other considerations that aren't on our mind, 
And I don't think we blackball them. We just give our recommendations. Mr. Tarpley? I agree with that. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony here today. I Absolutely. appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I want to join in thanking you for your excellent work and the values that you uphold in this work, the highest traditions of our profession, which is advocacy for people, regardless of their station in life, their status, their background, their race or religion. Uh, and for that kind of advocacy to work, we need judicial independence. And I want to uh, thank you for making that a specific criterion in your report. And you remark that uh, you believe that Judge Kavanaugh would uphold judicial independence. Uh, I hope that you join me in the very, very strong feeling that attacks by public officials, and I'm not going to mince words, by the President of the United States on our independent judiciary are a disservice to judicial independence and the integrity of our judicial system. I can respond quickly on that one, Paul. The, the ABA feels very strongly that a fair and independent judiciary is a linchpin of our society. The Founding Fathers set it up like that. It survived all these hundreds of years. And we feel very strongly about the fair and independent judiciary. What I would add to that is that a federal district court can declare an act, an executive order is unconstitutional, <laughs> enter injunctions. It's also true for legislative uh, bills. And that's an integral part of our legal system, the federalism and the fact that each branch of government is co-equal. But attacks on the courts that undermine the faith and confidence of the public in the credibility of our courts are a real blow to judicial independence, are they not? I don't disagree with that. I, I want to just note for the record that both of our guests seem to, to be in agreement with that yes. proposition, and I thank you very much. Senator, Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Do you have colleagues in the audience uh, who work with you on this effort? Certainly. We mentioned uh, Bob Trout, a distinguished lawyer here in the District of Columbia, just immediately behind us, who uh, was our uh, local person on the ground who did a tremendous amount of work, and Denise Cardman our staff representative from the American Bar Association. We're proud of both of them. Um, Mr. Chairman, with your permission, may I ask the, uh, them to stand? Yes, would you please? I want to thank all of you for your hard work and your input. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for being here. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, do you have a question? Gentlemen, your um, evaluation of the nominee <clears throat> um, related to his qualifications and produced a conclusion that he was well qualified. Unanimously well qualified. In the evaluation of the nominee's qualifications, did you uh, have a chance to look at any <coughs> patterns in his decisions on uh, the court? We looked at a number of decisions. Our reading group examined every decision that he rendered. Uh, they read many of his writings. To be candid, I did not see a pattern in his decisions. If there were a, if there is a pattern to the decision, it's uh, what we saw was an allegiance to the law, a dedication to looking at the facts of each particular case and applying the law to the facts of that case. 
and a, and a faithfulness to precedent. Did you make any effort to uh, cross-reference who the parties are emicky were in these cases in that uh, review? Yeah, I'll, ans I'll answer that, Senator, and I'm not sure if you were here during the beginning part of our <coughs> remarks. I wasn't. Yeah, but we had, um, we had three different reading groups who participated in this evaluation, and there were two different law schools that participated, University of Utah and University of Maryland, and then we had a practitioner's group, and this consisted of 48 people who broke broke the law into different areas and gave us a report on, on their um, And in that opinion. evaluation, did it take into account what amici, for instance, were appearing before the court? Yeah. The amicus curiae oh. that appeared before the court. Yeah. I mean, that was a part of the record in every case. Obviously, but was that part of your analysis? We we did not look at who the parties were to the or case. Or who the amici were. We looked, we, and when the cases were read, it was considered as to who the parties were, yeah. as well as who all the amicus curiae were. But in terms of looking for any pattern, there was no cross-referencing <laughs> between decisions and who amici and parties were. Don't think so. Okay, just wanted to check. Okay. Well, the reason I asked that question, to be totally upfront about it, is that as we showed earlier, when certain amici come before the D.C. Circuit, amici who will tend to be associated with and funded by very powerful, very wealthy right-wing interests, they seem to have a better than 90 percent win rate in front of this particular judge. And I know that he says that he makes decisions based only on the quality of the legal work and the argument before him in which case it seems that these particular amici seem to have some very superhuman lawyering uh, going their way because uh, a win rate above 90 percent to me is a bit of a signal that there may be something else going on to pursue since you never looked at that underlying statistic, presumably you drew no conclusions about it. That's correct, but okay. if, Thank you. if it be helpful to the Senator, we could have the reading groups look at that particular question. I don't know that we have time, but I'll consider that. I'll get back to you. Thank you, Senator. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess uh, all my colleagues have asked the questions they want to ask, so we thank you, and we'll call the second panel. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, we'll, we'll wait just a minute while people get the right names up here, and then we'll have the second panel come. indicated to the audience that we have three more panels where we will hear 26 additional witnesses. Many of these uh, witnesses include uh, Judge Kavanaugh's former law clerk, students, friends, and associates. Our next panel um, includes the following uh, 10 witnesses, uh, five uh, for the uh, majority uh, and five for the minority. We have... Uh, Congressman Richmond, Mr. McLeod, Ms. Garcia, Gary Weintraub, Olson, Ms. Baker, Ms. Sinzak, Professor Murray, and Professor Amar. Uh, let's see. I get, 
Uh, I would ask if you would stand, and so I, I should have said this before you sat down, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, do, uh, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you God? Thank you for your affirmation. Now, uh, when the congressman comes, uh, this will be his introduction. Uh, Cedric Richmond is a U.S. Representative, Second District, Louisiana. Currently serves as Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. Luke McLeod serves as Law Clerk for Judge Kavanaugh, uh, 13 and 14 years. I mean, 2013, 2014. He also served as Law Clerk uh, for Niemeyer, U.S. Court of Appeals, Fourth. Justice Sotomayor, Supreme Court and he's an associate Williams and Con Connolly. Rochelle Garza serves as managing attorney of Garza and Garza Law, located in Brownsville, uh, Texas. Louisa Gary is a teacher at Friends Academy, Locust Valley, New York. She's known Judge Kavanaugh for 35 years. Liz Weintraub is an advocate uh, so specialist at the Association University Centers on Disabilities, Silver Springs, Maryland. She previously served as a fellow in Senator Bob Casey's office. Ted Olson is a partner of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. Uh, he served as Solicitor General of the United States 2001-2004 and as Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel 1981-84. He's argued more than 60 cases before the Supreme Court. Alicia Baker is a pastor of the Free Methodist Church in Indiana. Colleen Rowe Sinzak is a senior associate, Hogan Lovells. Lovells. Uh, she previously served as law clerk for Chief Justice Roberts and Just, Judge Garland on the D.C. Circuit. Uh, Ms. Sinzak is a student of Judge Cap Kavanaugh's Harvard Law School. Uh, professor Melissa per Murray, professor of law at New York University School of Law. She previously served as a law professor at University of California, Berkeley. Professor uh, Kael Amar is a Sterling Professor of Law, Political Science at Yale University, where he teaches constitutional law in both Yale College and Yale Law School. After graduating from Yale Law School, uh, the professor served as a law clerk to then Judge Breyer on the U.S. Court of Appeals, First Circuit. Uh, the professor taught Judge Kavanaugh when he was a student at Yale Law School. So uh, we'll uh, start with you, Mr. McLeod. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, members of the committee. I'm honored to speak with you today about my former boss and my current friend and mentor, Judge Kavanaugh. I had the privilege of serving as one of Judge Kavanaugh's law clerks from 2013 to 2014. During that time, I worked closely with the judge, day in, day out, helping him to prepare for arguments and draft opinions. I witnessed firsthand the judge's approach to deciding cases large and small. When I saw leaves no doubt that Judge Kavanaugh would make an outstanding Supreme Court justice. I need your signature. Judge Kavanaugh is a fair-minded, an independent jurist, regardless of the parties to the case or the issues being litigated. Judge Kavanaugh worked hard to understand every argument and perspective. There was always another opinion to read, another piece of the record to review, another angle to explore. That was true even when a case turned on legal issues the judge knew well. He never looked for an easy answer or assumed that he had considered all of the relevant points. Judge Kavanaugh pushed himself to master every aspect of the cases he worked on, and he expected his clerks to do the same. Uh, to be sure, Judge Kavanaugh and I did not always see eye to eye on what the law required, but the judge did not want clerks who reflexively agreed with him or who never offered a contrary opinion. Just the opposite. Judge Kavanaugh has made a point of surrounding himself with a diverse group of law clerks, diverse ideologically, diverse racially, and from diverse backgrounds, so that he can better understand all sides of a given issue. I can vividly recall spending hours with my fellow clerks gathered around the judge's desk, debating the meaning of some statutory phrase or the best way to understand a precedent. Invariably, the opinions that Judge Kavanaugh produced reflected his careful consideration of and respect for views other than his own. Moreover, when we disagreed, I always knew that Judge Kavanaugh had come to his position honestly based on a rigorous analysis of the strengths and weaknesses of the arguments before him. There was no hidden agenda or partisan axe to grind, just the law, always the law. These qualities have earned Judge Kavanaugh a sterling reputation for his work on the bench. But Judge Kavanaugh has also shown himself to be a leader when it comes to his work outside of chambers. 
I especially admire Judge Kavanaugh's efforts as an advocate for those who are underrepresented in the legal profession. He regularly speaks to diverse law student associations to encourage their members to apply for clerkships. The judge also actively mentors the minority students he teaches, helping them become future leaders within the law. Judge Kavanaugh's commitment to promoting the careers of minority attorneys is also apparent from his own clerk hiring. Of his 48 law clerks, 13 are racial minorities, including five African Americans. These percentages are nearly unheard of amongst his peers. Many of the judge's minority law clerks have gone on to clerk for the Supreme Court, something that is still all too uncommon in these days. I am fortunate to count myself among them, but I would not have even applied for that position had it not been for the support and encouragement of Judge Kavanaugh. Again and again, during the year I worked for him, Judge Kavanaugh showed himself to be a model of judicial excellence. But even more than his intelligence and his diligence, it is Judge Kavanaugh's character, his fundamental decency and kindness that inspired me then and continues to inspire me now. Despite being one of the most prominent judges of his generation, Judge Kavanaugh remains humble and gracious. He is unfailingly polite to everyone he interacts with at the courthouse, from his colleagues on the bench to litigants to the court's professional staff. Judge Kavanaugh also volunteers regularly in his community and encourages all he knows to do the same. He is, in short, a dedicated public servant in the truest sense of those words. I will always be proud, incredibly proud, of the time I spent as Judge Kavanaugh's law clerk, and I am prouder still today to support his confirmation to the Supreme Court. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for, for the opportunity to testify in this hearing on the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court of the United States. My name is Rochelle Garza. I'm an attorney and managing member of Garza and Garza Law, PLLC in Brownsville, Texas, along with my brother-in-law partner, Miles R. Garza. My practice is focused on working with children, immigrants, and victims of violence, including unaccompanied minor children uh, through the areas of immigration, family, and criminal law. I am proud to have been the guardian ad litem for the young woman known as Jane Doe, an unaccompanied immigrant minor who the Trump administration attempted to block from accessing abortion. And I am here today to talk about what this experience was like for Jane and the impact that Judge Kavanaugh's ruling had on her life. Jane was 17 when she left her home in Central America, where she was physically abused by her parents and traveled thousands of miles to seek safety. In September of 2017, she arrived in the United States after a long and dangerous journey. As she later said, my journey wasn't easy, but I came here with hope in my heart to build a life I can be proud of. She was put into the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement and placed at a facility for immigrant children in the Rio Grande Valley. There, Jane learned she was pregnant. She immediately knew she did not wish to proceed with the pregnancy and expressed this to the facility staff. But as we were about to learn, Jane would face unprecedented obstruction by the Trump administration. I will never forget meeting Jane for the first time. She was petite, 17 year old. But as I quickly learned, no one should underestimate her. Her resolve was strong and she was very certain about her decision to terminate her pregnancy. In Texas, minors seeking to terminate their pregnancies must obtain parental consent or a judicial bypass, which is an order from the court allowing the minor to consent to the procedure on her own. It was in that context that I was appointed Jane's guardian ad litem. A state court granted her bypass, and we scheduled her appointments and confirmed the medical costs would be covered by a private source. It was then that the government stepped in and ordered the facility to prevent her from going to her medical appointments. The way that Jane was treated was unbearable. Even after she made her decision, she was forced to undergo biased counseling, including a medically unnecessary sonogram at an anti-abortion crisis pregnancy center. As Jane later said, people I don't even know are trying to make me change my mind. I made my decision and that is between me and God. Against Jane's objections, they told her mother she was pregnant and wanted an abortion. And even though Jane disclosed that when her older sister became pregnant, her parents had beaten her until she miscarried. Jane was placed under constant surveillance and no longer allowed to leave on outings or exercise. Despite all of this, Jane was strong. She was determined not to, to be forced to carry the pregnancy to term against her will. So we fought back on her behalf. We filed a lawsuit in Texas state court to require the facility to allow Jane to be transported. At the same time, the ACLU pursued a constitutional lawsuit 
in federal court in DC on my behalf as Jane's guardian ad litem. Although the ACLU represents me, to be clear, I'm testifying on my own behalf. The ACLU obtained an emergency order from the district court to stop the government from blocking Jane's abortion, but the government appealed. Judge Kavanaugh issued an order giving the government 11 more days to find a sponsor for Jane, something they had already failed to do for the previous six weeks. Furthermore, at the end of those 11 days, Judge Kavanaugh's order would not have granted uh, Jane that Jane could finally get the care she needed. Rather, she would have to start her case all over again, and the government could appeal. This could have taken weeks and might have forced her to carry the pregnancy to term against her will, particularly because Texas bans abortion at 20 weeks, and Jane was already 15 weeks pregnant. The pain that this caused her is impossible to describe. Throughout her, her ordeal, I saw her suffer. No politician or judge saw firsthand what she went through. As she later said, it has been incredibly difficult for the, to wait in the shelter for news that the judges in Washington, D.C. have given me permission to proceed with my decision. Thankfully, the full appeals court overturned Judge Kavanaugh's decision, and I was with her when she had her abortion. I saw the relief that she experienced when she was able to realize the decision that she knew was right for her. But at that point, Jane had been forced to remain pregnant against her will for an entire month and by the time, from the time she obtained her judicial bypass. I am and will always be in awe of Jane, and she possessed a profound strength of character. She believed that no other girl should have to go through what she went through. And as she said, no one should be shamed for making the right decision for themselves. I can think of nothing more human or more American than what I saw in Jane. Knowing that she is now pursuing the life she hoped for gives me great pride. She, she may have been petite, but she ignited change. And just like she said, this is my life, my decision. It was an honor to represent her and to be by her side and to witness true perseverance and to share her story with this committee today. Thank you. Um, Ms. Garrett. Chairman Grassley and Ranking Member Feinstein. My name is Louisa Gary. I'm a high school teacher and coach, so it is unusual for me to not be in the classroom with my students on the first Friday after Labor Day. But I'm honored to be here to voice my support of my college classmate and longtime friend. I met Brett Kavanaugh in 1983, almost exactly 35 years ago today. We were both incoming freshmen at Yale. Brett was standing under a tent with his parents, waiting to depart for the freshman outdoor orientation. I grew up in a small town in Ohio and was accustomed to saying hello to everyone, so I walked up and introduced myself. Brett warmly received my greeting and thus began a friendship that continues to this day. Our enduring friendship might surprise some because in certain ways we are quite different. I have been teaching and coaching high school students for the last 30 years while Brett pursued a high profile career in law. Brett comes from a Catholic upbringing in a city and tends to have a conservative outlook. While I would describe myself as a moderate Quaker who seeks out running trails and ocean beaches. Our differences have allowed us to learn from each other and see things from a different perspective. We've maintained a close friendship based on our mutual respect, support, and trust. One of the things Brett and I do have in common is an appreciation for competitive sports. We both have daughters, and we often talk about the benefits of youth sports in raising strong, independent girls and women with confident voices. Brett and I not only watch a lot of sports, we also run together. We first started running together while Brett was in his first year of Yale Law School, and I was working at Yale and training to compete in the 1988 US Olympic trials for track. Brett was not much of a runner, but he could keep up with me on an easy warm up. After he ran his first three mile race, <laughs> Brett announced that he wanted to run the Boston Marathon in his third year of law school. He asked me to promise to train and to run it with him, and I agreed. Even though I was a competitive runner, I had never run anything close to a marathon in distance, but Brett's faith in my ability as a runner and coach gave me confidence to take on this challenge. During the marathon, Brett waited for me through water stops and bathroom breaks, just as I waited for him through leg cramps and blisters. We ran together step for step for 26.2 miles and crossed the finish line at exactly the same time. We ran the Boston Marathon together again, step for step, two more times in 2010 and most recently in 2015 in celebration of our 50th birthdays. Four hours is a long time to spend with someone as you physically and mentally struggle through the miles, but I was lucky to go through it with breath. 
whose humor, fortitude, and idealism elevates those around him. Oh. Brett and I share an interest in the growth and development of young people. Many people have heard about Brett's basketball coaching expertise, but I believe even more students have benefited from taking a class with Brett at Harvard, Yale, or Georgetown. Brett is a bright, articulate, and engaging educator, and he is generous with the time and attention he devotes to mentoring others. In November 2016, Brett welcomed juniors from my school to the federal court for a field trip to learn about the judicial system. As we prepared for the visit, my students wanted to know, is Judge Kavanaugh conservative or liberal? I responded that they should wait and determine the answer on their own. Brett spent over an hour with my class explaining his role as a judge, discussing current issues facing the Federal Court of Appeals, answering the students' questions, and listening to their voices. He spoke passionately about his belief in the judicial system and the importance of the separation of powers in government. As we left the Federal Court, a couple of students immediately remarked, we couldn't tell. Is he conservative or liberal? Can you tell us? I responded, that's how it's supposed to be. The judiciary is supposed to be independent. Brett has a wide circle of friends of diverse political viewpoints and often shows a willingness to step into potentially uncomfortable forums with a spirit of collegiality. At our 30th Yale College reunion, Brett joined a panel on free speech. The panel broadly represented the diverse perspectives of our classmates, and each of the panel members spoke respectfully about the challenges faced by universities in addressing issues of free speech. When discussing how to balance a wide range of opinions, Brett quoted the character Atticus Finch from the book To Kill a Mockingbird and emphasized how important it is to, quote, stand in a person's shoes. Brett doesn't just speak words of empathy and tolerance. He listens and acts upon these words. His friends and colleagues describe him as a kind, thoughtful person and a good listener. I leave it to others to speak to Brett's judicial record. I am here to speak to his outstanding qualities, personal qualities, as a lifelong friend. Brett Kavanaugh will be a voice of fairness and integrity as a Justice of the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gary. Now, Ms. Weintraub. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and the members of the committee for believing that I have something important to say about Judge Kavanaugh. 51 years ago, I was born with every policy and an intellectual disability. I entered a world that had low expectations for me and people like me. Judge Kavanaugh has shown that he has the same low expectations, and I'm here to tell you that he's wrong. I have achieved more than many thought possible for someone like me. I work full-time as a professional, where I host Tuesdays with Liz, a weekly YouTube series where I talk to people about policy in a way that people with intellectual disability can understand. You're all invited to be my guest on Tuesdays with Liz. Today I live with my husband, who also happened to have a disability. And to, together we make our own decision. It had not always been this way. In my 20s, some professionals and my parents decided to put me into a private institution. My parents loved me, but instead of treating me like an adult with opinions and preferences and asking what I wanted, they made the decision for me like I was a child. This was wrong. In the self-advocacy movement, there's a saying that we hold very dear to our heart, and that's nothing about us without us. This means that any decision that affects us should include us. We expect to be part of the conversation, even to lead the conversation. Self-determination is a basic human right for all people with disability. People with intellectual disability have opinions and preferences, and they should be recognized. Judge Kavanaugh's nomination matters to me. Reading the Dell versus DC case made me very upset because Judge Kavanaugh's decision did not respect people's rights. 
and their freedom of choice. This is wrong. The low court in Delft told the D.C. government that it needed to ask people with intellectual disability if they wanted certain medical treatment. That requirement respects the civil rights of people with disability. Judge Kavanaugh had a chance to stand up for the rights of the women in the case, but he failed. He said that the D.C. government did not even need to ask them what they wanted, but could decide for them what was going to happen to their bodies. Would it have been too hard to ask, ask them what they wanted? Every adult deserves to be treated like a grown-up and have the right to be asked what they wanted, especially when it's about their own bodies. If they needed support to uh, if they need support to understand and make an informed choice, then give it to them. Our country is founded on liberty and justice for all, and all means all. I worry about the Supreme Court justice who doesn't believe that we, as people with intellectual disability, can make decisions for ourselves. If Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed, I'm afraid that my right to make decisions for myself will be taken away. I ask you for myself and my community, when you vote on Judge Kavanaugh, please do not vote to turn the clock back and take the rights that I and others have fought for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Weintraub. Um, I assume that if you're like everybody in the House of Representatives, you're always busy and you'd like to go, uh, you want, that's why you're probably on first. So I think I'll go to Congressman Richmond. Welcome. I, I previously had introduced you as the Congressman and uh, Chair of the Black Caucus. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. And uh, we did have pending votes, so... Uh, I want to uh, thank you for the courtesy and, and apologize for being late. And I want to thank the ranking member, um, Senator Feinstein, for uh, being here. Uh, <clears throat> earlier this week, uh, a senator argued that, or stated that, it's not the U.S. Supreme Court that's supposed to fix this country culturally, economically, socially, spiritually. Courts should not try to fix problems that are within the province of the U.S. Congress, even if the U.S. Congress does not have the courage to address those problems. Our courts were not meant to decide these kinds of issues. That logic would mean that African Americans wouldn't be able to attend integrated schools, buy a home previously owned by a white person, or lodge at certain hotels. In many cases, the high court has acted when Congress had neither the courage nor the will to act. For nearly eight decades, African Americans have fought to secure historic legal victories that have significantly bent the moral arc of the universe towards justice, even at times when progress felt incremental. <laughs> Nonetheless, we know that reversing meaningful progress for decades to come would be profoundly devastating and an affront to all who courageously fought on the front lines, some of whom I currently represent as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. President Trump has seized on this opportunity to pack the court by selecting judicial nominees who lack pragmatism and are often strikingly unqualified and proven intolerant bigots. We're in the midst of a fundamental shift towards nominees that embrace ideology at the fringes of mainstream legal thought. The current administration has nominated and with the help of Senate Republicans have confirmed a range of nominees who confirmation hearings pretend a precarious legal fate for communities of color moving forward. Mr. Kavanaugh's confirmation will fortify a generation of destructive conservative ideology at a time when several historically significant legal challenges will come before the high court. As members of the CBC, 
We cannot overstate what is at stake for African Americans and communities of color across the nation. Judge Kavanaugh, who relies heavily on the same textualist reading of the Constitution employed by former Justice Scalia, possesses a conservative judicial record that leads us to believe that voting rights, education, criminal law outcomes will be greatly endangered in the coming years. A careful, in-depth evaluation of his record, which has largely been shrouded in secrecy and withheld from public examination, uncovers writings that illustrate sparse commitment to equal protection under the law. Additionally, Judge Kavanaugh's lack of deference to precedent is staggering and inconsistent with other conservative judges who currently preside on the D.C. Circuit Court with him. A judge who frequently questions key legal precedents represents a grave danger to many legal frameworks that have advanced the African-American community. Voting rights, from Ohio to Wisconsin to Georgia, the vestiges of Jim Crow have resurfaced under a new cloak, unchecked and unabated. While these states are no long, longer conducting literacy tests, the effects of their new policies have been implemented with staggering precision and efficiency. By a five to four vote more than five years ago, the court struck down section four of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, making section five of the law essentially unworkable. The decision has precipitated a myriad of voter suppression efforts across the country. Most recently, the Randolph County Board of Elections and Registration in Georgia inexplicably considered a proposal calling for the closure of more than three quarters of the polling locations in, in the 60% black county, including one location that is 97% African American. Despite the eventual rejection of this ill-fated proposal, the federal government never bothered to intervene and fulfill its statutory obligated responsibilities. Simply put, there is no longer any active federal mechanism dedicated to oversight and safeguarding an individual's constitutionally protected right to vote. As I told you in January of 2017, Jeff Sessions' record on civil rights is questionable and one that shows that he does not care about enforcing civil rights. It is when this it is within this context that we have grave concerns about Judge Kavanaugh's opinion in the 2012 case of State of South Carolina versus Holder. In 2011, under the fully viable Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Obama administration blocked enforcement of South Carolina's state-issued photo ID law because it affected up to 8% of black South Carolinians. In his ruling to uphold the law, Mr. Kavanaugh claimed it does not have the effects that some expected and some feared. Not only is this statement inexplicably tone deaf, it is also inconsistent with reality. These same real life consequences reverberate to other elements of everyday life for black families. On criminal justice, Judge Kavanaugh's record on criminal justice is entirely unsatisfactory for a country persistently struggling to hold law enforcement accountable for mass incarceration and police brutality. He has expressed a desire to overturn precedent that protects civilians from officers engaging in activities inconsistent with the Fourth Amendment. He suggested that probable cause standards should be more flexible, which would expose more African American to fail policies, police tactics like stop and frisk. Additionally, Judge Kavanaugh's support for narrowing individuals' Miranda rights would hurt people of color who are disproportionately subject to excessive law enforcement engagement in their respective communities. And the, lastly, affirmative action. Mr. Kavanaugh's record on affirmative action is particularly disturbing and ripe for intense scrutiny. Almost 20 years ago, while in private practice, he wrote that in the future, the Supreme Court would agree that in the eyes of government, we are just one race. Given the Department of Justice's recent investigation in the Harvard University's admission practices, we're deeply troubled by the increased likelihood this will come before the Supreme Court in short order. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I will submit the rest of my testimony for the record, but I will just conclude uh, by saying that with the cloud of criminality and lack of transparency, the Congressional Black Caucus, which is 48 members, we represent 78 million Americans. And I just want to say for the record, of those 78 million, only 17 million are African American. We represent a vast variety of people, and we represent a collective conscience of this country, black, white, in the spirit of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner, who gave their life. Uh, to make this country a more perfect union and to fight for civil rights and to fight for justice. And it is in, within that spirit that we have grave concerns and oppose the nomination of Justice Kavanaugh. And thank you for your time, and I know I went over.
very much, Congressman. Uh, now we go to Mr. Olson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and members of this committee. I have had the privilege of practicing law throughout the United States for over 50 years in state and federal appellate courts and 63 times before the United States Supreme Court. I have argued to 20 different Supreme Court justices appointed by 11 presidents from President Eisenhower to President Trump, one-fifth of our nation's justices appointed by one-fourth of our presidents. My experience has given me firsthand exposure to justices numerous presidents have selected for the Supreme Court, the qualities that these justices have exemplified, and the standards they have established for themselves and for their successors. Each of these justices has manifested the highest professional and jurisprudential standards, the qualities we expect in justices appointed by presidents of any political party. I have won and lost my share of decisions from justices appointed by presidents of every political background. I can say that in every case, my clients and arguments were received with respect understanding, and great care. Americans are rightly proud of the Supreme Court and its justices, the envy of the world. I will elaborate on five of the characteristics that I have seen in Supreme Court justices. First, intelligence and learning. A justice on the Supreme Court must understand the Constitution, the separation of powers, the Bill of Rights, the role of each of the three branches of government and federal laws ranging from antitrust and patents to criminal procedure and the environment, and I could go on and on. The court decides 75 cases each year involving an awesome range of complex subjects demanding from each justice an extraordinary breadth of understanding, experience, erudition, judgment, and insight. Secondly, respect for precedent and judicial tradition. The justices before whom I have appeared have uniformly manifested abiding respect for the role of the judiciary and past decisions of the court. Not every precedent is inviolate, of course. As Justice Breyer has explained in his book, Making Democracy Work, the court has occasionally been mistaken or wrong but its errors have generally been corrected over time. The justices are mindful of the importance of stare decisis and the public's reliance on past decisions, but within the context of overarching fealty to the meaning and intent of the Constitution and the rule of law. Third, open-mindedness and independence. Justices, of course, have their individual histories, predilections, and past writings, but each justice must examine every case on the merits, carefully review precedents, briefs, and oral arguments, and the views of their colleagues, and only then come to a decision. Any other, approach, any other approach would, as Justice Ginsburg has explained, display disdain for the entire judicial process. Fourth, integrity. The justices of our Supreme Court, like our judiciary, judiciary in general, reflect rock-solid integrity. We may strongly disagree with the court's decisions from time to time, but no credible critic would suggest that the court's decisions are corrupt or dishonest. Our citizens respect and obey even very unpopular decisions because they believe in the integrity of the judicial process and the honesty of our justices. Fifth, temperament. An open mind and respectful temperament and collegiality are vital to the Supreme Court. And the justices before whom I have appeared uniformly listened to and probed 
often intensely, the arguments presented to them. But however strongly they have disagreed in a particular case, they have remained respectful, warm, and gracious to their colleagues and to the advocates who appeared before them. I have known Judge Kavanaugh for two decades. I know from personal observations and experience that he possesses and has consistently exemplified the qualities that I have described. He received an outstanding education in one of the nation's finest law schools, clerked for extraordinary jurists, including the justice he is being nominated to replace, taught constitutional law at Harvard Law School, served in the executive branch and in private practice, and for 12 years at the highest level of the federal appellate judiciary. He is thoughtful, gracious, open-minded, respected by his peers, and widely praised by the lawyers who have appeared before him. Our system contemplates that justices will be appointed by presidents of either party, as lawyers who appear before the court, and as Americans who must live with the court's decisions, we cannot expect that our cases will be decided by jurists who always agree with our positions. But we can aspire to a judiciary that will be prepared, perceptive, competent, open-minded, open -minded, honest, and respectful. That is the jurist that is Brett Kavanaugh. He is the kind of person and judge that we expect and deserve on the Supreme Court. I hope you will confirm his appointment to this court. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Now, Ms. Baker. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Alicia Wilson Baker. I am a pro-life Christian and ordained minister from Indiana. I am someone who has denied the birth control I needed because of my insurance company's religious beliefs. And I'm honored to be here today, truly honored, to speak on behalf of everyday women. If Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed to the Supreme Court, I fear that many women, especially those who can least afford it, will not get access to affordable birth control because of their employer's religious beliefs. Birth control allows women and people to control their lives, and without it, women's health and their futures are at risk. I'd like to tell you about my background. I grew up in a devout Christian family in California. My parents were leaders in our church congregation. My childhood is filled with happy memories of attending church, learning how to put faith into action through mission trips and serving our community. I decided to go to seminary and become an ordained minister so that I can serve others. I currently work at a local neighborhood center in urban Indianapolis, where I collaborate with local agencies and neighbors to improve the quality of life in our neighborhood. In 2015, I met and fell in love with my best friend, Josh, who is here with me today. Like me, Josh is also a Christian who believes that faith is a verb. It's about how we live our lives. And like me, Josh had decided to wait until marriage to have sex. Once we got engaged, we knew we would not be ready to have children right away. So we started researching birth control options. Josh and I were on a tight budget as we struggled to pay off our student loans and save for a home. We were relieved that the Affordable Care Act requires health plans to cover birth control at no additional cost to us. On my doctor's advice, I decided to get an IUD. But what I got was a nightmare and a $1,200 bill. It turned out my insurance company had a religious objection to covering my birth control. Nothing in our faith disapproves of birth control. We were making prudent and responsible decisions for our family. But our beliefs and our decisions were overridden by the religious beliefs of an insurance company. In the days leading up to our wedding and for several months after, I was fighting with my insurance company, sending appeal after appeal. In the end, Josh and I scrounged together the money but we had to use the money we had set aside to pay off our student loans and buy our first home together. I still feel a pit in my stomach when I remember the stress and anxiety that we went through just as we were starting our new life together. But I know I am fortunate. I was ultimately able to pay that bill. But what happens to those who cannot pay for their birth control? 
What happens to those who face an impossible choice between getting the health care they need and putting food on the table, or paying for childcare, or staying in school? If Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed to the Supreme Court, access to affordable birth control will be in jeopardy. Just three years ago, Judge Kavanaugh heard a case which is about something similar to what Josh and I had experienced. In that case, Judge Kavanaugh would have allowed employers and universities to use religion to deny birth control coverage to individuals. If Judge Kavanaugh had his way, courts would give free reign to those who claim their religious beliefs override the law. As a Christian, I am against such broad interpretations of religious freedom. It is not right that employers may be allowed to use religion to avoid following the laws of the land. I fear that some will use this reasoning not to protect religion, but as a way to discriminate. I shudder to imagine what this means for real people, for the communities I work with every day. At this critical moment, when so much is on the line for women and their family, my faith guides me. Proverbs 31, eight through nine says, speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. As a person of deep faith, I would never impose my religious beliefs on anyone, and no one else should either. My religious beliefs are separate from the law, and that's how it should be. But Judge Kavanaugh's record shows he does not respect this critical separation. This committee and the Senate must weigh the harmful impact that Judge Kavanaugh would have on the health and well-being of so many people. I urge this committee to block his nomination to the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baker. Now, Ms. Red Cesarek. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Feinstein, and members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee about my former Harvard Law School professor, Judge Kavanaugh. I took Judge Kavanaugh's separation of powers class in the winter term of 2009. In the years since, he has served as a trusted mentor to me. My experience as Judge Kavanaugh's student and mentee has led me to offer my firm support of his nomination to the Supreme Court of the United States. In some ways, my support for Judge Kavanaugh is unsurprising. A recent New York Times article cataloged the exceptionally strong reviews that Judge Kavanaugh's students have given to his teaching. Over the years, students' anonymous feedback forms have consistently lauded the judge as an outstanding professor, one who strives to present a balanced view of the material in class and who makes himself uniquely accessible to students outside of the classroom. I wholeheartedly agree with that praise. Multiple articles have also detailed Judge Kavanaugh's role as a mentor and sponsor for young lawyers, many of them females and minorities. You have heard about Judge Kavanaugh's impressive record of hiring women and diverse law clerks. But Judge Kavanaugh's efforts as a mentor are not limited to his clerks. He also works to maintain connections with countless law students and young lawyers across the country. Judge Kavanaugh is an invaluable resource and advocate for those starting out in the profession and a champion of diversity in the legal world. Ever since I took his class, he has been a mentor and a sponsor, offering friendly advice, helpful support, and a listening ear as I've navigated the stages of my legal career. When I was considering applying for a Supreme Court clerkship, Judge Kavanaugh generally, generously offered his advice and support, helping me to obtain a clerkship with Chief Justice Roberts. And when I went back to work after having my first child, a lunch with Judge Kavanaugh helped bolster my enthusiasm for my legal career. In other ways, however, my support for Judge Kavanaugh may strike some as surprising. I am a registered Democrat, and from 2010 to 2011, I had the great honor of serving as a law clerk for then judge, now chief judge, Merrick Garland on the DC circuit. In that role, I experienced firsthand what a brilliant, fair, and kind jurist he is. I believe the judiciary and the country as a whole 
has suffered greatly from the failure to confirm Chief Judge Garland to the Supreme Court. I nonetheless support Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation. In my view, preserving and protecting the integrity of the judiciary means supporting and confirming highly qualified judicial nominees, regardless of whether one agrees with the politics of the party that nominated them. In my experience, Judge Kavanaugh has the traits that make him eminently qualified to serve as a justice on the United States Supreme Court. His impressive intellect is obvious, but the judge is also open-minded, he is principled, and he is even-handed. I'd like to speak a little more about each of those qualities. First, in my interactions with Judge Kavanaugh, he has always demonstrated open-mindedness and intellectual integrity. When I think back on the judge's separation of powers class, it isn't his lectures I remember. It is his insightful questions and the classroom debates they sparked. The course touched on some of the most important issues in our constitutional democracy. But rather than telling us what to think about them, the judge asked questions that enabled us to develop our own views and share them with the class. More than that, he seemed genuinely interested in hearing our varying perspectives. One of my favorite law school memories is engaging in a fierce debate with, with a separation of powers classmate over whether INS versus Chadha was correctly decided. Judge Kavanaugh seemed delighted to hear both sides, and he encouraged us to develop our conflicting views. With Judge Kavanaugh, I was confident that if I could make the right argument, he would accept my position. My belief in Judge Kavanaugh's open-mindedness has deepened over the years through my one-on-one -on -one conversations with him. I often can't resist sharing my views on separation of powers issues, and he is invariably an engaged listener and an insightful questioner, despite the fact that we come from different sides of the political aisle. Second, in my experience, Judge Kavanaugh is highly principled. By that, I mean something very specific. He carefully delineates the difference between policy preferences and what the law demands. In the separation of powers class, we often discussed current events and the way they implicated various constitutional concerns. Policy considerations inevitably came up, and we certainly discussed those. But the judge would repeatedly remind us that those policy concerns are beside the point if the Constitution dictates a different outcome. More generally, the judge taught us that the way to discern the legal principles that undergird our democratic system is to look to the text, history, and precedents regarding the Constitution, not our policy preferences. Third, Judge Kavanaugh is even-handed and treats people fairly and with respect. In class, he gave the same consideration to the views of all students. I consistently felt he was judging our answers based on our ability to reason clearly and support our points, not based on any political or ideological standard. Judge Kavanaugh's even-handedness goes beyond respect for var varying ideologies. In my experience, he treats everyone equitably, regardless of their gender, race, or background. One would think, or at least hope, that in 2018, that should not be remarkable. But as a woman, I know that explicit and implicit bias continue to plague the legal profession, just as they plague the rest of society. Far too often in my career, I have felt that I was been being treated as a female lawyer, rather than just as a lawyer. But with Judge Kavanaugh, I have never felt that way. In my interactions with him, I know that I am being judged on the merits of what I say, nothing less and nothing more. I believe that a person with such sterling credentials and experience as a judge who so clearly values integrity, principle, and fairness is eminently qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. I therefore enthusiastically support Judge Kavanaugh's nomination. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Murray. <laughs> Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, thank you so much for the opportunity to appear at these hearings on the confirmation of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to the United States Supreme Court. My name is Melissa Murray, and I am a professor of law at New York University School of Law, where I teach constitutional law 
family law, and reproductive rights and justice, and serve as the faculty co-director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Prior to my appointment at New York University, I was the Alexander F. and May T. Morrison Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley, where I taught for 12 years, served as faculty director of the Berkeley Center on Reproductive Rights and Justice, and served as interim dean of the law school. Like Judge Kavanaugh, I too am a graduate of Yale Law School. Over the course of these hearings, much has been made of Judge Kavanaugh's warmth and kindness towards his clerks and those in his community. These accounts resonate with me, as Judge Kavanaugh and I have traveled in similar professional circles over the years. In fact, I too have had lunch with him, and I can attest to his friendliness and charming demeanor. But this nomination is not about whom I would befriend or with whom I would have lunch. It is not about how Brett Kavanaugh treats a handful of women from elite institutions. It is about real people on the ground, people like the women to my right and the people they represent, who will not have lunch with Judge Kavanaugh, who will not meet with Judge Kavanaugh, but who will nonetheless depend on Judge Kavanaugh to protect their constitutional rights to make decisions about their lives. As you've heard from women like Alicia Baker and Liz Weintraub, confirming Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court would threaten people's ability to make fundamental personal decisions, including deciding whether to have an abortion. Reproductive rights are under serious threat in this country. What we have seen over the last two decades is a concerted strategy that would dismantle Roe versus Wade piecemeal, not in one fell swoop, but rather through a death by a thousand cuts. This nomination is the culmination of that decades-long effort to destroy Roe versus Wade incrementally without necessarily formally overruling it. The Supreme Court stands as a bulwark against this assault on reproductive freedom. Just two years ago in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, Justice Kennedy joined a majority to reaffirm the undue burden standard first articulated in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, thereby reaffirming the court's commitment to protecting reproductive rights. But Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to replace Justice Kennedy imperils the court's ability to continue to hold the line on reproductive freedom. In Garza versus Hargan, the only abortion case to come before him, Judge Kavanaugh voted to block a young immigrant woman from receiving abortion care and insisted that she remain pregnant against her wishes, weeks after she had made her decision and after she had completed all of the state-imposed requirements. Although he claimed to follow Supreme Court precedent in Garza, Judge Kavanaugh's opinions evinced a crabbed and skeptical view of these precedents, a view that is completely out of step with the high court's own view of those cases. Despite his claims during these confirmation hearings that he was respecting Supreme Court precedent on minors and abortion, in fact, his dissent shows the opposite. He ignored the Supreme Court's holding in 1979's Bilotti versus Baird that allows minors to complete a confidential judicial bypass in lieu of parental or guardian consent. Jane Doe had already met the Texas requirement of a judicial bypass by the time her case came before Judge Kavanaugh, so further delay to seek a sponsor was wholly unwarranted. Further, Judge Kavanaugh did not explain how the government's flat prohibition wholly preventing Jane Doe from accessing abortion failed to constitute an undue burden under Casey or a pre-viability ban under Roe. Nor did he weigh the potential harms to Jane Doe stemming from a further delay against the purported benefits of that delay, as is required by Whole Women's Health. Judge Kavanaugh's record in Garza suggests that rather than respecting precedent, he will undermine or ignore it. And in so doing, he will provide the necessary fifth vote that would utterly eviscerate the right to abortion. During these hearings, when asked by you, Senator Feinstein, whether he agreed with the statement that a woman's right to control her reproductive life impacts her ability to participate equally in the economic and social life of the nation, Judge Kavanaugh's reply was not, I agree. Instead, he said, I understand the importance of the precedent set forth in Roe versus Wade. We have seen this before. In 2005, then Judge Roberts came before this committee and stated that Roe is the settled law of the land during his own confirmation process. Despite this earnest declaration, as a justice, he voted to uphold a statutory scheme that would have shuttered 75% of the clinics in Texas. If this is what it looks like to respect precedent and treat Roe as settled law, 
then these are empty promises. Since 2011, politicians have passed over 400 new laws in 33 states across the nation that shame, pressure, and punish women who decide to have an abortion. Some of these laws would ban abortion as early as six weeks before a woman may even know that she is pregnant. Others would require doctors to convey a falsehood to patients, telling them that abortion leads to breast cancer. The point of these restrictions is to make it difficult, costly, and in some cases impossible for women to obtain an abortion. And as such, these restrictions impede women's ability to participate equally in the social and economic life of the nation. And these restrictions are especially detrimental to young women, women struggling to make ends meet, women of color, immigrant women, rural women, and women who have already had children. In practice, these restrictions mean that Roe is merely a hollow promise and not a reality for many women. To be clear, Roe versus Wade is not a decision invented by activist judges. It is part of a century's worth of jurisprudence that protects an entire constellation of rights, rights relating to family, marriage, parenthood, contraception, and personal autonomy and intimate life. A vote against Roe is whether to overrule it as a formal matter or gut it through in incremental cuts puts all of those rights in jeopardy. And make no mistake about it, a vote for Judge Kavanaugh is a vote against Roe. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Professor Marie. Now, Professor Amar. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, distinguished senators. My name is Akhil Amar. I'm the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale University, where I specialize in constitutional law. I've previously testified before this committee on seven occasions, and it is always a solemn responsibility to appear here. Here are my top 10 points. Point one, Brett Kavanaugh is the best candidate on the horizon. The Supreme Court's biggest job is to interpret and apply the Constitution. Kavanaugh has studied the Constitution with more care, consistency, range, scholarliness, and thoughtfulness than any other sitting Republican federal judge under age 60. He's the best choice from the long list of 25 potential nominees publicly circulated by President Trump. I say this as a constitutional scholar who voted for Hillary Clinton and strongly supported every Supreme Court nomination by Democratic presidents in my adult lifetime. Point two, originalism is wise and nonpartisan. Studying the Constitution requires diligence and intelligence, especially for those like Kavanaugh who are originalists, paying special heed to what the Constitution's words originally meant when adopted. I too am an originalist. In prioritizing the Constitution's text, history, and structure to discern its principles and distill its wisdom, we originalists are following in the footsteps of George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Marshall, Joseph Story, and Abraham Lincoln, among others. Originalism is neither partisan nor outlandish. The most important originalist of the last century was a towering liberal democratic senator turned justice Hugo Black, the driving intellectual force of the Warren Court, who insisted on taking seriously the Constitution's words and spirit, guaranteeing free speech, racial equality, religious equality, the right to vote, the right to counsel, and much more. Among today's scholars, the originalist cited most often by the Supreme Court is also a self-described liberal and registered Democrat, yours truly. The best originalist heed not just the founder's vision, but also the vision underlying its amendments especially the transformative reconstruction and woman suffrage, uh, reconstruction amendments and woman suffrage amendment. I believe that Justice Kavanaugh will be in this tradition on various vital issues, voting rights, governmental immunities, congressional power to enforce the reconstruction amendments. Justice Kavanaugh's constitutional views may well be better for liberals than were Justice Kennedy's. Point three. Kavanaugh's writings reflect proper respect for tradition and precedent. Originalists start with the Constitution's text and structure, but almost always need to consult other constitutional sources, such as tradition and precedent. Harmonizing these different constitutional sources requires great legal acumen. Kavanaugh's record shows that he is adept at harmonization. Point four, Kavanaugh's views on executive power have strong constitutional foundations. Many of Kavanaugh's views about the executive branch are quite standard. On several other executive branch topics, 
Kavanaugh's views are not yet conventional wisdom, but are nevertheless sound and indeed align well with the testimony I offered this committee in 1998 and 2017. Point five, the best basis for assessing would-be Justice Kavanaugh is the track record of Judge Kavanaugh. The judicial track record is more proximate and relevant than Kavanaugh's prejudicial life. Point six, Kavanaugh would work well with his new colleagues. I predict that Kavanaugh, a studious and open-minded conservative who likes listening to and engaging with moderates and liberals, will be a pro-intellectual and anti-polarizing force on the court. Point seven, judicial nominees should not make substantive promises about how they would rule on specific legal issues, nor should they make recusal promises that closely approximate substantive promises. Point eight, senators may properly oppose the judicial nominee simply because they disagree with the nominee's general constitutional philosophy or likely constitutional votes on the bench. Point nine, the current Senate confirmation process is badly flawed and should be changed for future vacancies. Point 10, back to point one. Responsible naysayers must become yaysayers of a sort. They must specifically name better nominees realistically on the horizon. If not Brett, who? Distinguished Republicans, Kavanaugh is your team's brightest judicial star. Rejoice. Distinguished Democrats, don't be mad, be smart, be careful what you wish for. Our party controls neither the White House nor the Senate. If you torpedo Kavanaugh, you'll likely end up with someone worse, someone less brilliant, less constitutionally knowledgeable, less studious, less open-minded, less good for America. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you all very much. Uh, uh, before I ask my questions and take five minutes to do that, uh, uh, Senator Tillis is going to chair this committee after I get done asking questions. Uh, for this panel, I should say, I'll be back, uh, but I w because I'll be gone when you uh, separate, I want to thank all of you for your participation in this process. And uh, then I think after this panel, it's uh, scheduled that we would have a lunch break. Uh, I'm going to start with Mr. McLeod because uh, it seems to me you've uh, uh, clerked for uh, different people of different views on, on interpreting the law and the Constitution. Judge Sotomayor, I believe, and then also Judge Kavanaugh. So I'll let you uh, define yourself what the most character, most important characteristics of the Supreme Court justice is, and if you see uh, Judge Kavanaugh uh, meeting these. Well, I think the most important characteristics are, first of all, um, intelligence and faithfulness to, to the law. I think Judge Kavanaugh, as uh, his reputation shows from his years on the DC Circuit, has those characteristics uh, in spades. I think something that's maybe underappreciated in terms of the work the Supreme Court does is how closely the justices work together. And I uh, share just, uh, Professor Marr's view that Judge Kavanaugh would work well as, as a colleague on the Supreme Court. He's talked during these hearings about the idea of a team of nine working together uh, with his colleagues on the court to achieve a goal of uh, justice and interpreting the law fairly. And I think that he would live um, that model if he were appointed to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask Ms. Gary this, but it's based upon a very strong point that Professor Murray made that uh, uh, we hear a lot about what uh, Professor, or I mean, uh, Kavanaugh has done for uh, people that have worked close with him. Uh, she fears that he may uh, not take uh, the average American's uh, point of view into mind in his work as a judge. So what would you want the average American to know about Judge Kavanaugh as a person and how he might see their problems, not the people he's associated with all of his life. Push the button, will you? In my experience, Judge Kavanaugh listens and hears uh, everyone he speaks with. I do think he considers people uh, from a variety of backgrounds. I don't think he's lived um, only in one sphere. I think he has exposed himself to a wide range of people. And I think that he would listen empathetically and hear their voices. And probably a point he's made and uh, uh, how he uh, serves uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, for low-income people at congregate meal programs, as an example. Uh, would be uh, one way I would see from what he has said. Ted Olson, you 
are famous in the legal community in this town and, and around the country as well. Uh, so you ought to uh, interact with a lot of people that in turn have interacted with uh, Judge Kavanaugh. What do other members of the legal profession say about the experiences that they've had with Judge Kavanaugh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a very good question. The fact is that throughout his legal career, I have heard nothing but the highest praise for Judge Kavanaugh as a human being, as a lawyer, uh, and as a judge. As far as I can tell and as far as I have heard, he is uniformly respected by his peers on the D.C. Circuit with whom he has worked in many cases for 12 years or more, uh, including also the most recent appointees to the court. Every lawyer that I have spoken to who has appeared before Judge Kavanaugh has respected the experience and has related to me the fact that he has listened, he pays attention, attention. It's impossible to tell exactly how he is going to decide until you read the decisions that he makes. So in summary, the answer to your question is, I do not know of a lawyer or a judge who is more uniformly respected in terms of his personality, his character, his integrity, his fairness, and his competence. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Sinzak, uh, you uh, uh, obviously uh, remember him as a uh, good teacher. What, what are those qualities, if you can transfer them to being a good judge and eventually a Supreme Court justice, what would you say about what you learned to him in, in, in class versus uh, his being a, a judge? I think the qualities are directly transferable. I think he was a great professor because he not only listened and engaged more than he talked, but he knew how to get people um, explaining their arguments in the best possible way. And I think that as a judge, too, he needs to listen to everyone before him. He needs to be able to engage with different viewpoints. And then also, he needs to be able to um, treat those viewpoints equally. And as a, in our class, I think that he was um, open-minded and wanted to listen to all to people of all ideologies equally, wanted to hear the different sides of a, uh, of a discussion. And similarly, I think that as a justice, he will listen to both sides of an argument. He will consider those. And then thirdly, he knows what's important in the law. I mean, he, he wasn't just a teacher, he was a law professor. And what he told us was that what matters in the law is what the law says, not what your policy preferences dictate. And I think that in many ways, that's the most important quality uh, for a justice. And I think that he exhibited that. Yeah. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much. I want to just pick up on the last sentence that you said that um, the issue qualities really shouldn't matter. It should be the fairness, the likability, the qualifications only. <clears throat> and that might be fine if some of the critical things that many of us, and I'm going to speak for myself as a woman who's been a mayor, I represent 41 million people. And um, Ms. Baker, America is like you out there today in the young woman. I see it over and over and over again. And Ms. Weintraub, I am so proud of you. Stand tall, be strong. Um, you're quite wonderful to be here today. So, um, and Professor uh, Murray, I think you are very cogent. I thank you for your remarks. I've never in all my years here been with a panel, the majority of whom are women, and each one of you brought a different point of view, and it is very, very welcome. For me, um, Ms. Garza, uh, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if I could, because the Jane Doe case um, is really a problem for me because what it showed was there were so many things in her treatment I didn't like. The way she was treated by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, she was subjected to unnecessary sonograms, you know, forced to go to a crisis center, 
sub subjected to harassment, as I understand it, um, had been physically abused by her parents, and went to a Texas judge and received uh, an order of approval. I don't have that order of approval. What did that order of approval say? Um, well, in Texas, you have to get a judicial bypass to bypass the consent from your parents and to consent to your own abortion care. Um, and that order is typically based on uh, a best interest assessment, uh, whether or not it's in Jane's best interest to go ahead and proceed with making that decision on her own or um, whether or not she's sufficiently mature enough. So in, 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 in this case, she was, it was in her best interest to go ahead and proceed with that. Texas court decided that, and uh, that's how the case moved forward. Now, the panel that um, the nominee in question was on, uh, were questions asked? Were you there? Uh, no, you're, no yeah, I was. It was an appellate court, I understand that. So. No, I was not there. However, I did listen to it. Um, the question was not in, uh, the order was not in question. Uh, a, te a Texas court made that decision. Uh, Jane went through every single hoop she needed to go through in Texas, including complying with the Texas law the two days, um, and she was just being blocked. She wasn't being allowed to be, to, to go to her medical appointments, and she wasn't allowed to be released to her ad litems, to myself as her guardian ad litem or her attorney ad litems that were appointed by state courts. And, and why was that? just to obstruct her uh, ability to enact her decision. It, it was a policy enacted under ORR and uh, they directed the facility not to allow her to be released. So, yeah, Professor, Fa uh, uh, Professor Murray, um, I think the arguments have been made here and my great query is um, women have never historically been treated equal. And finally, you know, we got the vote. It began to change. We were able to go to higher education. Um, the United States began to uh, accept women. And now the world seems to be changing uh, in favor of women. What I am most worried about this is that Roe goes down. And for what this meant in my generations, which were the 50s, uh, excuse me, the 50s and 60s, when the death toll uh, was estimated to be between 200,000 and a million 200 of women that went to illegal abortionists and died. Um, I don't want to see us go back to that day. And so that is inherent in this vote. Um, weapons in this country are inherent in this vote. And if you look at where America is going, also the quality of the individual who's going to sit in that deciding seat, I think overwhelms most else. Your analysis, and you spoke very cogently, how would you analyze this judge affecting those issues? Thank you, Senator. It's clear to me, reading Judge Kavanaugh's opinions on these reproductive rights cases, that he says he is following Supreme Court precedent, but that is not the case. In the Garza case, which is the only abortion case to come before him, Judge Kavanaugh said he was following the settled precedents, yet he did not even engage the question in whole women's health versus Hellerstedt, which would have required him to weigh the benefits of a delay against the burdens it would have imposed against Jane Doe. That's required by the Supreme Court under its most recent decision in whole women's health versus Hellerstedt. He did not engage that at all. In requiring that Jane Doe take an additional 11 days for the government to seek a sponsor, his decision defied Bellotti versus Baird, a 1979 case where the Supreme Court held that a state cannot require a minor to obtain parental consent or even to notify a parent unless it provides an alternative judicial bypass option for determining whether an abortion is in the best interest of that minor. And as Ms. Garza has said, Jane Doe went through that state-required procedure to have a judicial bypass. She obtained that bypass 
a Texas state judge determined that an abortion was in her best interest, the government then still prevented her from obtaining the abortion care she needed. And Judge Kavanaugh's decision, which would have required the government to continue looking unsuccessfully for a sponsor for an additional 11 days, would have further delayed her care, making it almost six weeks from the time she decided to have an abortion until when she could actually receive it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to each of the witnesses who are here. Uh, Professor Amar, let's, let's start with you. You are widely acknowledged to be one of the most respected constitutional law professors in the country. Uh, in your opinion, is Judge Kavanaugh qualified to serve as a Supreme Court Justice? Unquestionably. How would you compare his level of qualifications uh, to other Supreme Court nominees without specifically disparaging any, any other nominee? I have great respect for all the justices, but if um, I would actually say, without naming names, that you know I might rank him. I might predict that at the end of uh, were he to be confirmed by this body at the end of his service, he he would rank well above the average. I mean, in the I would say in the top tier of um, modern justices, and the modern justices are quite impressive. Uh, Ms. Sinsdak, you, you were a student of Judge Kavanaugh's. That's oh, correct. Uh, what was he like as a professor? Uh, well, again, he, he was um, open-minded, principled. Um, he was very fair. Um, I mean, he was also a, a really nice guy. I, I take the point of my colleagues that likability isn't, uh, isn't necessarily a criteria, so I, I didn't uh, gear my, my, my comments in that direction, but he was wonderfully warm. He took students out to dinner and was very friendly. So a am I right that you were part of the legal team that brought a challenge to President Trump's so-called travel ban? Is, th is that right? That's correct. Um, and, and in your experience at Harvard with Judge Kavanaugh as a professor, you found him fair, open-minded, willing to listen to views from multiple perspectives? I did. I like to hope that I used a lot of the things I learned in Judge Kavanaugh's class to bring that challenge against what I still consider an unconstitutional order. Mm -hmm. Mr. Olson, uh, you served with Judge Kavanaugh in the George W. Bush administration. Uh, you, were, you were Solicitor General while he was in the White House. What was your experience uh, in terms of any professional interactions you had, had with him at that time? We did not have a great deal of professional interactions because his position in the White House did not directly relate to what the Solicitor General was doing. We worked often with the counsel to the President the White House right. Counsel. Um, but from time to time, there were opportunities to see the kind of input that he was providing to the people in the White House, the senior officials in the White House, including the president. president. Uh, he was scrupulous, as far as I could tell, scrupulously balanced in making sure that the president and other senior officials in the department were receiving, were receiving even-handed uh, presentations so that he would re assure that if one side was being advanced to the president, that the other side was also being demonstrated. His thoughtfulness uh, impressed, I think, everyone around him that was dealing with him, both from the standpoint of the White House and the Justice Department. Now, you've argued in courts of appeals all over the country. Have, have you had the opportunity to present oral argument before Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit? I have. I presented the argument in one of the cases involving separation of powers, the constitutionality of the Consumer Finance Protection Board. Um, and we heard that case en banc in the, in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, all of the judges were engaged in that case. It was the kind of case that the D.C. Circuit is very good at because it involves separation of powers, it involves the structure of government. Um, all of the judges on that case were engaged. The argument must have gone on for a couple of hours. Um, Judge Kavanaugh was, was as engaged, if not more so, than the other judges. He, At the end of the day, he did not agree completely with the arguments that we were making, but he wrote a very thoughtful, reasoned opinion um, concurrence opi concurring opinion with respect to 
uh, a concurring dissenting opinion with respect to the constitutionality of the Consumer Finance Protection Board. He very carefully parsed what the Supreme Court had said in the Free Enterprise Fund case and came to a conclusion that was, I thought, very persuasive, uh, although I didn't completely agree with it, very persuasive and um, reasonable. But let me thank each of the witnesses for being here on this panel. And, and I want to e echo what uh, Senator Feinstein said in particular. Ms. Weintraub, th thank you for your powerful and inspirational testimony. Thank, thank you for being here and being part of this panel. Thank you. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Richard Richmond, thank you so much for being here and for your leadership. Um, I asked some questions uh, yesterday of the judge about voting rights. And I referenced data from the Brennan Center for Justice showing that 23 states, uh, as you know, have now uh, have more restrictive voting laws um, than they did in 2010. Uh, can you elaborate on the consequences of Shelby County? And as you know, uh, yesterday Judge Kavanaugh noted that Section 2 of the law remains in effect uh, and is, in your view, Section 2 sufficient uh, to protect voting rights. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, Section 2 is absolutely not sufficient. And <clears throat> for states like the state I come from and some of the other southern states that were Section 5 states which had to pre-clear uh, their uh, actions that affect voting rights, uh, they were not chosen by random. They were chosen because of their past history of affirmatively trying to disenfranchise minority voters. And so because of Shelby, uh, you don't have that anymore. And you saw the race to the legislature as soon as Shelby was uh, decided, where e the courts held that the disenfranchisement and the discrimination basically was done with laser-like precision. So Word you, from the circuit court. Yes. So you see the <clears throat> vote ID laws you just saw in Georgia where they... Uh, there was an attempt to close polling uh, locations right before gubernatorial race with the opportunity to elect the first African-American governor in this country. So it's a big concern for right. us. Right. And gerrymandering, as you know, this past term in Abbott v. Perez, 5-4 Supreme Court upheld a number of Texas electoral maps uh, that the dissent said burdened the uh, rights of minority uh, voters. Again, 5-4 decision. Uh, based on Judge Kavanaugh's record, his testimony before the committee um, what do you think the future holds there when it comes to gerrymandering with him on the court? Uh, we're very concerned. And, and if you look at uh, the effect that it has in terms of uh, representation, uh, especially for minorities, and I'm not just saying that uh, what's important is the ability to elect a minority candidate of your choice. Uh, in many instances, uh, minorities choose to elect non-minorities, like Steve Cohen, who represents Memphis, Tennessee, and does a amazing job, but the ability to elect uh, a minority is important. And so if the court shifts towards, uh, makes a drastic uh, shift in terms of gerrymandering, then we, uh, we face the ability of rolling back the clock in terms of African American and minority representation in this country. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Baker, uh, thank you so much. I don't think we focused enough on that case and you really uh, brought it to light here. Uh, can you tell us uh, quickly why it's important that women are able to access affordable contraception, as well as the impact that you think Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation could have on the laws in this area? Absolutely. Um, for me, as a Christian, I definitely believe that, um, well, one of my favorite Bible verses is uh, John 10.10, 10, in which Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. And I definitely believe that birth control helps us to live our best lives as women. It helps us to uh, go after you know, education or our careers. Um, helps us to better plan our families um, and when we're ready to have children, and so um, if and when. And so I really think that is critical um, to helping empower women um, and continue the uh, advance forward for women in society. Thank you very much. And I, th I think the, uh, the idea here is that you were someone um, that is pro-life, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, you're someone that just simply wanted to be able to afford contraception after you got married. That's correct. Right? 
Yes. And so the Affordable Care Act, uh, there you were hoping to use those provisions and to be able to, there's other things in there that's helpful as well, not getting kicked off of insurance with pre-existing conditions, an issue that came up here a number of times in our questions and concerns. Um, but one of them was that you were hopeful about getting contraception that you could afford. Is that right? That's when correct. you got married. Yes. And so then what happened here is you um, go and you get an IUD and then you find out that the employer is somehow able to exercise their religious rights. Um, could you explain that just a little more? for people? Yeah, absolutely. So I had even gone and done my due diligence and checked with my personal insurance company about the benefits and everything and made sure that it was all clear, not just my knowledge of the ACA and it said it would be covered. And so when I went to get my ID, they give a pregnancy test as well um, to, you know, because it is being used as contraception. And so um, went and got put in, and then a few weeks later, we got the EOB for $1,200, and that was about a month before our wedding. And right. as you can imagine the stress that already comes with planning a wedding and then putting that on top of it. We're trying to start our new life together, and so it was just a very difficult thing. Thank you. And Professor Amar, I, I would ask you questions, but I'm out of time, and also you'd have to recuse yourself since you're my daughter's college advisor. Um, but I would, I would like to note uh, that your comments about the judge having standard conventional opinions, maybe we can talk about it after, but it just is not my opinion based on looking at his rulings on uh, net neutrality or okay, some of the things he said about Chevron or what he said about the Consumer Financial <laughs> Protection Bureau. Um, and so I'm looking forward to debating that with you at, at a break. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to thank all of you for coming today. I know uh, a lot of work went into your statements. I find this kind of testimony very helpful. Uh, number two, I want to especially thank my colleague, Congressman Richmond. I've known him uh, a long time before he became uh, a distinguished congressman. He was a distinguished member of the Louisiana House of Representatives. And he is a, a smart guy and a fine American and a good guy, too. Uh, number three, Ms. Baker. You're a Methodist. Free Methodist, that's correct. Right, I'm a Methodist too. <laughs> when Becky and I got married, I, I was raised in the Presbyterian Church. My parents founded two Presbyterian churches, so I was a Presbyterian, and my wife Becky was a Methodist. So we compromised, and I became a Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Sinsdak, did I say that right? Sinsdak. Sinsdak, I appreciate your testimony too, as I did the testimony of all of you. And I apologize again for hitting you in the head when I was going down to. That's okay. Congressman no harm. <laughs> and, um, Mr. McLeod, you, what year did you clerk for? Judge Kavanaugh? I clerked for him from 2013 to 2014. Okay. And then you went on to clerk for the Supreme Court after that? I, I did, Senator, for Justice Sotomayor. Okay. And now you're with Williams Connolly? Yes, Senator. You're an associate there? Yes, Senator. Have a lot of free time, do you? Not much, Senator. <laughs> um, I agree with my colleague, Senator. Einstein, that our world is getting better for women. I, I, uh, I'm biased, of course, but I think our world is getting better for many Americans. I'm proud of that. Um, in, the, in the last 20 months, um, the United States Congress and President Trump have uh, cut taxes, increased wages, helped create uh, 4 million jobs, delivered 4.1% of 
growth in our domestic product, deregulated the economy, uh, improved health care, I believe, for our veterans. Um, strengthened our military, stood up to um, China and Iran and North Korea and Russia. And last but not least, we, uh, we have confirmed some, I think, very accomplished men and women to join the federal judiciary, including but not limited to one Supreme Court justice and I think soon to be a second Supreme Court justice. And uh, I, uh, I'm proud of that record. And I thank you all again uh, for, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much. Um, Professor Amar, you mentioned recusal, so let me follow up with you a little bit on the recusal question. <clears throat> when you have a um, judicial nominee whose name has been put forward by the uh, subject of an ongoing criminal investigation and by someone who has been named in open court as directing other criminal activity in the event that those criminal investigations should ultimately come before the court and the nominee of that subject and that named co-conspirator is then on the court, it is fair to say, is it not, that the question of recusal is a very live and legitimate issue? Senator, it, it is, and I think back to the Nixon tapes case where one justice who had been uh, appointed by Richard Nixon and who had worked in the Justice Department and, and Watergate involved questions about the head of the Justice Department, uh, John Mitchell, one justice, then Justice Rehnquist, did recuse himself so um, in the, the Nixon tapes case, <clears throat> and three did not. My thought is that that has to be decided uh, when the case arises and there should never be a promise of any sort to any nominator or to this body in the confirmation process about how you'll vote or even how you'll recuse. You decide that um, when the case comes before you. And Rehnquist decided it one way, and three other justices appointed by President Nixon decided it the other way. Now, since that episode, there has the Nixon episode, there has been some case law at the Supreme Court developed in the area of judicial recusal, has there not? Uh, there has. Um, uh, uh, one thinks, for example, of Justice Scalia's decision not to recuse himself in a case involving uh, uh, Vice President, then Vice President Cheney in his official capacity. I meant actually legal precedent as opposed to behavioral precedent at the court. Uh, and I'm specifically referring to the Caperton decision. Oh, sure. Decision. Sure. <clears throat> um, what is your summary of the Caperton decision? Thank you, uh, Senator. So um, one important thing to understand about that case which arose out of West Virginia is it involved a state judiciary, uh, a state elected judiciary. And one problem with state uh, elected judiciaries, I know a lot of states have them. I'm not a fan of them, nor is uh, Justice O'Connor, uh, retired Justice O'Connor, who's actually made a crusade uh, of this issue, is you have to raise money to run, and then you don't have life tenure, and you have to raise money to run again. And that makes it very different, it seems to me, than um, a federal judge. One of the great glories of the federal system is um, once you're confirmed it's, there's, it's, uh, to the Supreme Court, it's a life tenured position, and you shouldn't make any promises of getting it, but even if you did, they're not really, as a practical matter, easily enforceable because you never have to run again. So I see uh, that case as quite distinguishable in important ways. It also involved a financial... Look at the standard. Look, what was the standard that the court used to apply to the judge 
in question to determine that he was constitutionally required to recuse himself? Was it not that the uh, funder, by virtue of the amount of funding that he put into the race, had a significant and disproportionate influence on that judge occupying that seat? Th that was part of the standard. If memory well, serves, it's an standard. opinion uh, of, of, of Justice Kennedy for whom uh, Brett Kavanaugh clerked. And uh, there were about 40 different factors, actually, that in the dissent by Chief Justice Roberts were sort of identified as possible limiting considerations in that case. But you're absolutely right, Senator. The standard it, was significant and disproportionate influence in putting the judge into that seat, correct? It, was, it, it did involve a, a huge financial contribution by a private person um, in a case that was provided. already pending um, when, um, uh, uh, when uh, the, the, uh, the person was running for um, the state Supreme Court. A, a pending case, a huge financial contribution by a private um, individual. Um, um, uh, and in if, this it, case, you have a pending criminal investigation, and you have somebody who has done a good deal more than put $3 million towards getting that judge in the seat. He has actually 100% put that judge in the seat. Do you not see that there is any potential relevance between the Capron decision and the decision that Judge Kavanaugh would face if confirmed? Uh, may I answer? I th thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. So. Um, uh, uh, it's not 100 percent. That's what this body actually is about. Um, presidents don't put people on the Supreme Court. And if you had any concern whatsoever that any promise of any sort was made um, to the president or anyone in the White House about uh, 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 this litigation, I would say you should vote no, because pr promises are improper. Um, uh, 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 there. Um, uh, there is another relevant precedent um, on judicial um, recusal. And, and to repeat, uh, when that case comes before the Supreme Court, were Justice Kavanaugh uh, uh, to be on it, he's going to have to make that decision, as is everyone else. I just don't want him to promise anything one way or another as part of the process of becoming Justice Kavanaugh. But I start con law every year teaching Marbury versus Madison, which, uh, as you know, actually has a really interesting recusal question arguably in it because John Adams at the very end of his administration is putting John, his Secretary of State John Marshall on the court and then the case comes uh, before uh, now Chief Justice John Marshall and there's a real question whether he should recu have recused himself. I believe he should have but that's because he had first-hand knowledge of adjudicate fact of, of the case but not merely because he happened to have been picked by one president because all um, justices are picked by one president or another one and, and confirmed by a Senate. So it's actually the first question we do in Marbury versus Madison is the judicial ethics recusal question. And I don't think it's sufficient a basis for recusal, just that you happen to have been nominated by a president who happens to be implicated um, in um, a, 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 a litigation. That might not be enough. Senator Feinstein will be recognized for a correction of the record. Thank you. I appreciate this, Mr. Chairman, because I apparently misspoke. Um, it is the estimates of the number of illegal abortions in the 50s and 60s that range from 200,000 to a million two per year. I said deaths. That is not correct. Senator Hatch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Olson, you're, uh, uh, you've been at the center of the D.C. legal uh, community for decades. Uh, what is Judge K Kavanaugh's uh, reputation among the lawyers you know? And how is he, uh, how is he uh, thought of uh, and regarded? I do not know of anyone in the judiciary uh, or in the legal profession in Washington, D.C., or anywhere around that, uh, who is respected more than Judge Kavanaugh. Now, there are other judges, of course, who have uh, a reputation of which is very, very high. Um, the D.C. Circuit, on which Judge Kavanaugh sits, is populated by very, very talented, um, very fair um, uh, judges, uh, many of whom could be 
perfectly well qualified to be in the Supreme Court. But my experience um, of, with respect to Judge Kavanaugh, it would be hard to describe someone with a greater reputation. Well, thank you. You've appeared before Judge Kavanaugh in court many times. Now, what kind of a judge is he, or what type of a judge is he during oral argument? He is very attentive. Um, like other colleagues on that court, as I said, this is a very, very fine court. But my experience has been that he has not only read the briefs, but he understands the history that brings the case to the court. Uh, he's very, very thoughtful. He asks very hard questions uh, of the litigants, on, no matter which side you're on, very perceptive. The sort of thing that you experience in the United States Supreme Court, where the justices are probing the strengths and weaknesses of your case, and an advocate has to be ready to answer those hard questions. Judge Kavanaugh asks those hard questions, and you can't tell from his questions where he's going to come out in a case. He's looking for information and analysis and input from the advocate. That is what a good advocate hopes for in a good judge. Well, thank you. Professor Amar, uh, what are the most important qualities you think senators should look for in a potential Supreme Court justice? And uh, why should people from both sides uh, of the political aisle, Republicans and Democrats, support uh, Judge Kavanaugh's nomination? Uh, Senator, uh, I did. Uh, uh, I do believe that the most important job of the Supreme Court is constitutional interpretation and implementation. It does other things, but that's the most important. And Constitution doesn't define itself. It requires a lot of, of, of careful study. Um, and I just thought that Judge Kavanaugh, more than any other sitting uh, federal judge, a Republican federal judge under age 60, has has studied it with more care and scholarliness and consistency and range. He, he's read very widely. I refer um, you to the very interesting exchanges he had with, with Senator Lee, for example, about the Federalist Papers. How many people would know Federalist 37 and 39, maybe 10, maybe 78? Um, uh, so, uh, um, but I, in answer to, uh, um, uh, Senator Cruz did ask me a question and I should have said one other thing. Um, uh, it's not just that I think he's, he'll be good on his own on the court. Um, uh, is that I think he will actually um, help bring out the best in others. I think it's a small group, and, I, and when I think about the one-on-one -on -one interactions and the collegial interactions, um, I, I see him as a, exceptional. And the final thing that I, I really do want my, my fellow liberals and Democrats to, to hear is I believe he actually um, is, going, is uh, likely to be um, better than many are saying, even on this panel, on things like voting, rights on congressional power to implement um, the Reconstruction Amendments. Many originalists um, don't pay enough attention to the amendments, to the women's suffrage amendment, to the Reconstruction Amendments. And when I read what Judge Kavanaugh has written, both on the bench, including a voting rights case that I actually think was a, a, an impressive opinion, um, uh, and I contrast that to Shelby County, for example, which I think was the worst decision of the last um, 20 years, in, in fact, or 15 years. I actually am optimistic about Judge Kavanaugh as someone who will very seriously take um, the vision of the Reconstruction uh, generation and the woman suffrage generation alongside the founding generation. Well, I want to compliment this whole panel. It's been an excellent panel. You, you folks uh, are really helping us here on the committee with, uh, with your testimony from from every one of you on the panel. So I'm uh, proud of you, appreciate you. It's one reason why this system does work better. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Senator Coons. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Tillis. Um, Congressman Richmond, welcome. I um, just wanted to follow up on the line of conversation there with Professor Marr. Um, do you think Judge Kavanaugh is the right nominee to replace Justice Kennedy, uh, particularly given Kennedy's a critical voice uh, and vote in Fisher versus Uni University of Texas? For the Supreme Court upheld UT's race-conscious admission policies and given Judge Kavanaugh's decisional record? No. <clears throat> no, and that's a very real concern. Look, uh, the question's been asked now very consistently about affirmative action, whether it's in uh, the Bakke case or other cases about whether it's still necessary. And I'll just say this, um, and it's, we'll 
take it out of legal lease for a minute and just take it to plain old physics. Uh, if a ball is rolling down the hill, the only way to stop it is to apply equal and opposite force. And the ball of racism and discrimination in this country uh, rolled down hills for centuries. And the only way to stop it is an opposite but equal force. And that's what affirmative action, and that's what those cases mean. And if you look at some of the decisions, and you look at Scalia's uh, uh, comments in the last case, he actually questioned the intellect of African Americans and their ability to, to, to succeed at uh, prestigious universities. So when you couple the other justices and their opinions with Kavanaugh's record, that's what leads to uh, the real concern about where we're going to go with affirmative action, race-based uh, factors and admissions and others. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, Ms. Baker, um, thank you for both your testimony and your witness today. Um, and thank you for bringing forward what is a, a challenging uh, and very personal fact pattern. Um, I just want to make sure I heard right. In some ways, I think for you, the most shocking thing and the most upsetting thing um, was a decision that chooses the religious liberty interests of your employer, a company, really, nonprofit, but a company their views on what contraception you should be able to access versus your views about what you ought to be able to do in preparing for marriage and preparing for parenthood. Is that what sort of stuck most as I understood your testimony today? That really in particular struck you as just baffling that the religious liberty interests of a company ended up trumping yours. Yes, absolutely. That is something that has stuck with me um, throughout the whole process. Thank you. Professor Murray, I thought you did a particularly powerful job of explicating the range of ways in which Judge Kavanaugh's writing and opinions um, caused some hesitation or concern. Um, it's in Priest for Life in his dissent that he was particularly clear about his view that the complicity of a corporation in being forced to check a box should outweigh the liberty interests of a real live breathing person. Can you just comment on why that tension might um, strike you as uh, novel, or why, given Hobby Lobby, you might see this as a very um, difficult long-term trend line in this court, should Judge Kavanaugh be confirmed? Thank you, Senator. Um, there are a number of troubling um, messages that Judge Kavanaugh evinces in that dissent in Priests for Life. Um, the first that strikes me is exactly the concern that Ms. Baker related. The Supreme Court has said in Eisenstadt versus Baer, decided in 1972, the year before Roe versus Wade, um, that the right of privacy, if it means anything, is the right of the individual, whether married or unmarried, to make a decision so fundamentally affecting the person as whether to bear or beget a child. The decision about what kind of contraception a person uses is certainly wrapped up in that, and the Supreme Court has acknowledged it. In the Hobby Lobby case, uh, five justice of, justices of the court said that ensuring access to contraception was a compelling governmental interest. What we saw in Priests for Life is that Judge Kavanaugh would defer substantially to the wishes of an employer um, to, uh, based on the employer's religious beliefs and the employer's faulty understanding of the accommodation process to deny an individual like Ms. Baker who has made a reasonable contemplative choice about what is best for her and her family um, and instead defer to the wishes of the employer and that is deeply concerning. Chairman, one last question if I might. Professor, just to continue, I, I don't know if you got to see my line of questioning of Judge Kavanaugh, I think fairly late last night, about the Glucksburg test. Um, he said all roads lead through Glucksburg uh, and I went through a line of examination with him about whether or not if that test deeply rooted in this nation's legal history and tradition, if that had been applied, whether the outcome would have been the same in a whole range of cases relating to marriage, to intimacy, to access to contraception. Um, and as Justice Kennedy wrote, I think importantly in Obergefell, if rights were defined by who exercised them in the past, then received practices could serve as their own continued justification and new groups uh, could not invoke rights once denied. Are you concerned that Judge Kavanaugh might depart from Justice Kennedy's uh, vital jurisprudence in substantive due process and that that might have a real impact on how justice is dispensed in these areas going forward? I think it's clear from Judge Kavanaugh's judicial record, Senators, that he is not a jurist in the mold of Justice Kennedy 
who frequently upheld these precedents like Whole Women's Health, like Planned Parenthood versus Casey um, in his writings. Judge Kavanaugh um, in these decisions has evinced a crabbed and narrow understanding of the right to liberty. The right to liberty that is enumerated in the Constitution is not fossilized in amber. It has changed over time to admit individuals who would not have been contemplated within the body of the people at the time of the founding or even just as the Reconstruction Amendments were being ratified. So decisions like the right to marry have evolved. We didn't have a situation where individuals who wished to marry a person of the same sex could do so until just 2015. Um, these decisions are all imperiled um, by a justice who would follow history and tradition unfailingly toward his outcome. Thank you. I have many more questions, but I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks to all of you for being with us today. Mr. Olson, I'd like to start with you. Your name has been used a lot uh, this week in our proceedings. Uh, n not necessarily uh, with your whole name, uh, but your last name has made many appearances with a lot of references to Morrison v. Olson. I was wondering if you could just tell us briefly a little bit about your experience with that case. Well, the Morrison v. Olson case, as everybody uh, on this committee knows, uh, involved the constitutionality of the independent counsel statute under a statute that required the appointment of an independent counsel by members of the judiciary uh, prevented the removal of the independent counsel, uh, except under very narrow, narrow circumstances. The constitutionality was challenged in the United States Supreme Court in a case that I think of as the Morrison case, but other people refer to as Olson, Morrison versus Olson. Um, and the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of that case on a seven to one vote, uh, with, in my judgment, a very, very persuasive dissenting opinion by Justice Scalia. Um, over time, I've heard from a number of people in the academic world, um, the legal academic world, that Justice Scalia's opinion dissenting in that case, which was, he's described as, he did, did describe as one of his most important contributions to jurisprudence, has received much more favorable attention over the years. The importance of it is separation of powers and the extent to which power vested by uh, Article II of the Constitution in the President shall be reserved to execution by the President or whether it shall be taken from the President and given to other individuals who are not accountable to the electorate through the electoral process. And of course I could go on and on, but I don't think you want me to do that. Uh, it is an important case and it may be revisited someday. And you, ra you raise a great point in, in that respect, uh, uh, judicial independence, somebody's willingness to stand out, stand alone, uh, at times dissenting or perhaps concurring uh, in the absence of additional support can end up having a big influence as Justice Scalia's dissent in Morrison v. Olson made clear or, or in the case of, for example, Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in Youngstown's Cheatin II versus Sawyer. Over time, they acquired more meaning. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Sinsdak, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your class with Judge Kavanaugh. What was that like? And uh, I, I noticed that you mentioned INS v. Chadha, something that he got you excited about. How did he get the class excited about Chadha? Uh, well, I think it's naturally an exciting case. Um, I tend to agree, but I've met exactly five people on planet Earth who agree with me there. So. Uh, well, I mean, I think part of it was that he would, as I mentioned briefly in my remarks, uh, open class talking about current events. So he was very much about contextualizing uh, separation of powers issues as they were affecting the real world, um, which kind of took what is a lengthy but scintillating opinion and kind of put it in, in, in a, in, so it was about putting it in a practical, uh, pra practical context of thinking about the legislative versus the executive power. Great, uh, thank you. Professor Amar, I can't uh, resist the opportunity to talk to you about Hugo Black. Uh, you, you mentioned Hugo Black as someone you admire, um, uh, someone you would look to, and yet he's someone who um, has authored a number of opinions I assume you would disagree with, the author of Korematsu, for example. Uh, tell me about your affinity for Justice Black. Yeah, Justice Black always carried a copy of the Constitution around with him, um, and I was um, uh, charmed when Brett Kavanaugh pulled his out and it looked pretty well worn to me as if he had maybe looked at it a time or two. Uh, Justice Black reminds us that you don't have to have gone to a fancy 
law school to be one of the greats. I know it's been a concern for some. They think, oh, it's just the, Professor Amar just likes the fellow because it's an Ivy League club or something. Uh, you come to my office and you see in, in my office Abe Lincoln, um, two pictures of Abe Lincoln, and he's a guy who had less than a year's formal education in his whole life. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and Hugo Black didn't go to a fancy law school. He came from the Southland. He was actually underestimated, I think, in part because of that. There's a very interesting piece about country lawyering in the New York Times by um, um, uh, just an op-ed yesterday about how folks who sometimes come from the Southland or speak a slightly different way are underestimated by fancy pants um, Yankee Ivy League types. So, so Hugo Black actually, um, and He's a southerner who really under a southern white person who really understood the Reconstruction Amendments. He was there in Brown versus Board of Education, and the people from his hometown didn't like what he did in Brown versus Board of Education. He championed incorporation of the Bill of Rights against the states. He championed the right of even indigents in Gideon versus Wainwright, but long before that, in a case called Johnson versus Zerbst, um, uh, indigents to, to have counsel. He was the driving intellectual force of the Warren court, say, saying all sorts of things before Warren and Brennan got on the court. And this body might be interested just in the fact that he was a former senator turned um, uh, 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 justice. Um, and we don't have so many of those right now, uh, but maybe in the future we will. And it is a reminder that you do want all sorts of diversity on, on, on your court. And, and it, it really is an issue maybe if they're all coming as federal court of appeals judges um, uh, from a few schools. That, that's a genuine concern to, to think about. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Boimenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. This panel really is extraordinary. Uh, some really powerful advocates. Thank you, Congressman Richmond, for your standing so strong in a dark and dangerous time for our democracy. When the history of this era is written, my view is that the heroes will be our independent judiciary and our free press. And uh, I'd like to ask you, uh, Mr. Olson, uh, by the way, in the interest of full disclosure, you and I argued before the Supreme Court together. You may not remember it because it was one of 63 for you, but it was <laughs> one of four for me. Uh, I remember it very well, Senator. Thank you. And we won nine to zero in upholding the sex offender registry case. Correct. Uh, I uh, am deeply troubled by the attacks on our judiciary and most especially from the President of the United States. You are absolutely right when you say, and I'm quoting you, our courts are the envy of the world. They depend on the faith and confidence of the public. Courts don't command armies or police forces, and the President's attacks on the court undermine that credibility. And so I asked yesterday, Judge Kavanaugh about some of those attacks, and I was disappointed in his responses. He would not even go as far as Neil Gorsuch did, now Justice Gorsuch, in saying that attacks on the judiciary are disheartening and demoralizing. I also cited to him some remarks made by President Trump about Justice Ginsburg saying, quote, her mind is shot, resign. Uh, we are all embarrassed by her. Uh, don't you think that Judge Kavanaugh and members of our judiciary and all of us have an obligation to stand strong against these kinds of attacks? I can only speak for myself. Um, I have the greatest respect for our judiciary in this country. I meant what I said, it is the envy of the world. Uh, it is the envy of the world in part because very, very fine people are put on our courts and our judges and justices exercise independence uh, from the appointing authority and from everything in their background. They make independent 
decisions based upon individual cases. I deplore statements criticizing the integrity or intelligence of members of our ju judiciary across the board. As far as Justice Ginsburg is concerned, I have to say that she is someone that I have the hugest respect for. She is a hero in this country, a warrior. She stood for many, many great things. She argued cases in the Supreme Court that broke ground on behalf of women and be on behalf of all of us, and I respect her. Um, I've argued before her. I lost uh, a very significant case uh, uh, involving um, the Virginia Military Institute, which she decided I was representing the state of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, she is an extraordinarily talented, able person. She remains so to this day. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Garza, uh, when uh, Judge Kavanaugh came before our committee and I asked him about the real world consequences of the delay, he characterized it as simply a delay in your client being able to terminate her pregnancy. I wonder if you could describe for us what the consequences were and whether those consequences were apparent in the record so that they would have been known to a member of the court. And I want to thank you, by the way, for the great work that you're doing in Brownsville. I visited Brownsville. I know what you're doing to try to prevent separation of children from families and passports being taken away from American citizens and some of the other cruel and inhumane practices going on there. But if you could t talk to us about some of those consequences, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for your question. Um, well, I, I had to see Jane go through all of it. Um, delaying her further, she had already been delayed at that point for, for many weeks. Um, you know, the coercion tactics, the, the pressure, um, and she never once wavered, never once. And this, this could have affected her. She could have been forced to have a child against her will. She so that was a real a surgical procedure, didn't she, instead of the having medical other abortion. options? Yeah, if she, she had the option to do a medical abortion uh, early on, uh, but because she was delayed and uh, constantly, week after week, um, she had to have a surgical abortion. And were health risks? And the health, yes, and the health risks increased as she was being pushed further into her pregnancy. Uh, my time is uh, expired. Thank you. Uh, I have a lot more questions. This is a great panel, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. Thank you. Senator Booker. Thank you very much. Uh, so firstly, um, I just want to ask a, a, a couple things because I, I was uh, – confused by some of the very, uh, I guess, very very pointed uh, language. And so, Professor Murray, I'd like to start with you, if I can. Um, you, were, you were mentioning uh, the standards that were not applied in the Garza case. Yes. And, and, I, and I pulled the two cases you mentioned, uh, Bilotti, uh, um, uh, which discusses uh, striking down a parental consent statute as unconstitutionally burdensome. So why wouldn't a judge that, that sticks to precedent uh, stick to this case? I, I don't understand that. It is also something I don't understand, Senator. The Bilotti case was directly on point with the facts of the Garza case. Jane Doe had completed the required judicial bypass, which under Bilotti is an alternative to securing parental consent. And yet, despite her having done that, Judge Kavanaugh in his decision before the three-judge panel and again in his dissent, reiterated the need for a sponsor, right? A, someone, a support network to aid her in making this decision, adding additional delay. But I, Something but I swear, can, can, you, can you try to put yourself in the, the shoes of the judge? What excuse could he possibly have? There's a lot of bragging going on here that when it came to uh, abortion cases or anything that he would follow precedent. I just, I'm really sincerely don't understand how if this was the, the binding precedent of the court about undue burden, the story we heard was gut-wrenching about uh, what this individual had to go through, gut-wrenching. And there was a clear burden, right? There was, the, the more you waited, 
uh, the more of a burden uh, um, uh, was being put on this person. I just, I, can you really help me understand this? Well, during his testimony before this body, Judge Kavanaugh said that his insistence on Jane Doe having a sponsor was because she was a minor, she was alone in this country, and he viewed it as sort of a proxy for parental consent. But again, I go back to the precedent. The Supreme Court- So a proxy for parental consent, but I, I, again, I heard in the testimony from Ms. Garza here that she was, is it true that you were the appointed uh, guardian? Yes, I was her guardian ad litem. Right. And so that, that to me just doesn't hold water. I, in, in addition to precedent upon precedent, there were guardians upon guardians. She had a guardian ad litem. She had gone through the judicial bypass process. A judge in Texas had made the determination that an abortion was in her best interest, that she wanted the procedure, and nonetheless, ORR refused to let her leave federal custody, and then Judge Kavanaugh compounded that injury by refusing to allow her to have the abortion instead insisting that she have a sponsor, adding an additional 11 days And so to just the real delay. quick, the, the, the other case you, you mentioned, this whole women's health case, um, is again about weighing uh, certain standards, correct? It's about weighing burdens and benefits. And again, Judge Kavanaugh made no mention of that. He made no mention of the burdens of an additional delay. And Ms. Garza has spoken movingly about the difference between seeking a medication abortion versus a surgical abortion, which admits additional risk to the woman. Right, which I, so this fiction that somehow, and he used this, and what did you think of it when he used, and maybe Ms. Garza, I can ask you, what did you think of it when he used this, war, this language like abortion on demand? All the things, Ms. Garza, that, he, that you just outlined to us does not sound like abortion on demand. It sounds like you're signaling something to a whole bunch of folks so you can get yourself on a list so that you can be considered for the Supreme Court. Would you agree with that? Yes. Why, I, why I use that simply term? Yes. Why um, use that term? I, I don't understand what abortion on demand means because that was not the situation for Jane. I mean, she, she was one of the most vulnerable people in our community, one of the most vulnerable human beings. She was an immigrant, she didn't speak English, she was in detention and she was being put under extreme pressure. And, and I felt it was unfortunate that Judge Kavanaugh did not take that into consideration. So, so I just want to say this is like a fiction that is being presented to us, that somehow there was not an agenda here by this judge in his, for, to try out for the Supreme Court to a president that promised his supporters, I'm going to put somebody on there that's going to overturn Roe. Uh, uh, Cedric, real quick, you said uh, that the equal and opposite force rolling down when it comes to racism. You weren't saying that we should have racism against uh, another group or, or bigotry towards other people. You're talking about equal opposite force, a positive force of justice, force of light, right? Yes, <clears throat> exactly. And, and it was mentioned today all the economic improvements in the last two years, but what, what we have not talked about is the increased intolerance, racial intolerance over the last couple of years. When we grew up, uh, Senator Booker, it was well known about racial profiling and driving while black and that you could be stopped. But it's gone to another level now. Now it's just living while black. So whether you're studying at Yale, whether you're sitting in Starbucks, whether you're leaving an Airbnb that you purchased, all of a sudden, uh, just being African American uh, makes you a criminal suspect. And that has happened since this president was sworn into office. And so I just want to get you on the record because we're going to use your words. Uh, but you, you believe you deal with that issue by pursuing justice, not by pushing one, anybody no. down. It's just by trying to elevate folks up as a matter of justice. Yes. I just want to say to the chair, I have one more question. It's going to be mean. It's going to be a mean question. So please don't interrupt me, though. Let me get it out. And say potato to potato to you, but this is going to be mean. Let me get it out. Uh, Akhil Lamar, sir, Mr. Professor, I have one question for you. My final question. In your con law class, do you regret passing me? <laughs> you, you have a right to remain silent. Yeah. <laughs> you are under oath. I think the only thing that I ever did to my Wikipedia page was add your name as one of my former notable students because I'm so proud to be associated with you, even if we disagree on this issue, as we may very well. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Senator Harris. Thank you. Um, a conversation has come up, and Congressman Rich, Richmond asked you a question, but a conversation has come up during this uh, process that leads me to believe that there have been certain dog whistles that have been offered by this nominee, um, especially in recent years, abortion on demand being one of them. 
Um, another being a term that he used, Congressman Richmond, in, uh, in a Wall Street Journal op-ed that I asked him about, and the term is racial spoils system. And he referred to a racial spoils system. It was in reference to a, a Hawaiian case and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. But I asked him about the, the, the meaning of that term and what did he mean when he used that term twice. And he told me, quote, I'm not sure what I was referring to, to be entirely frank, when I asked him what did he mean by using that term. And I explained to him that it's a loaded term. And I, I would like for you to, to share with the committee what you understand that term to mean and how it has been used, based on your experience. Well, I'll tell you that it's very common dog whistle, especially uh, in the South where you're pitting, uh, and I'll just be as frank as I can, Lisa. where you're pitting poor white people against poor black people and your justification to poor white people is that the reason why you're poor is because minorities are scooping up all of the benefits that should be going to you. Mm -hmm. And this country is better than that. First of all, it's not true. Uh, but second, uh, those programs and those things that I think that he refers to uh, are writing that very wrong history in this country. But uh, just the use of the term is um, what we see far too often uh, today, which is uh, the dog whistle. It's not even a, a dog whistle anymore. It's just blatant pandering to uh, a base of people. And I believe that it's a lot more significant than even you uh, would address, but think of that in the case of race-based uh, factors in admissions, which will come back before the court because this Justice Department is investigating Harvard right now. So what does that mean for minorities that are applying to prestigious universities or universities all around the country? And that's why it's such a concern. And to emphasize your point, Congressman, um, and I actually mentioned this earlier in this process, uh, the judge has, has been lauded for um, the, the amount of thought that he puts into his writings and the words that he speaks and the fact that he would use such a loaded term and, um, and said he didn't understand what it meant um, was troubling to me as well. Professor Murray, um, even if a Justice Kavanaugh does not vote outright to overrule Roe, how else could he undermine a woman's right to make decisions about her health care. What other um, types of scenarios might come before the court short of overruling Roe that could impede a woman's access to reproductive health care or to an abortion? As I said in my opening statement, um, it's not just the threat of overruling Roe, but incrementally gutting its protections through a death by a thousand cuts. And there are at least over 10 cases currently pending at the lower federal courts that all in concern restrictions on the methods of abortion that so may if, be used. If, if you will, can you break down for the, 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 the American public that is watching this hearing so that you can l speak to those people who are watching the hearing about the things that they're familiar with that could be impacted short of a Justice Kavanaugh overruling Roe? Certainly. The restrictions um, that are pending throughout the states, and uh, as I said, um, there, are, there have been over 400 laws passed since 2011. These laws would increase wait times to obtain reproductive care like an abortion. They would eliminate certain methods of abortion like the dilation and evacuation procedure, which is the safest um, procedure that, according to doctors um, for safely evacuating a fetus from the womb. Um, they would also do things like require doctors to tell their patients falsehoods about the abortion procedure, that it leads to suicidal ideation or that it leads to breast cancer. These have all been disproven by science. A number of these laws have been passed, many of these laws have been challenged, and those cases are pending, and certainly there will be a case that may percolate and make its way to the Supreme Court. And if Justice Kavanaugh is on the bench, he will be in a position to decide. And to emphasize your point, all of these things could happen short of him overruling Roe if he were the deciding justice on that case. Again, 
We can make the protections of Roe utterly meaningless for millions of ordinary women in America by simply making this procedure inaccessible, by putting it out of reach, by making it impossible, by making women drive hundreds of miles to obtain abortion care, by making them wait hours, making them leave their jobs, leave their families in order to access care. That is their constitutional right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I have a document that I'd ask that uh, be added to the record and ask for consent for that. It's from Demos um, regarding this nomination. Um, Demos is a public policy organization working for both political and economic equality for all Americans. And the report is in opposition to Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation based on concerns that his confirmation would threaten equal justice for people of color and the future of racial equity. Without objection. Thank you. Senator Kennedy. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry if I, um, I just, I forgot to put into, uh, I ask unanimous consent that a letter from the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health uh, in opposition to Judge Kavanaugh's nomination also be entered into the record. Without objection, Senator Coons. Uh, thank you, Chairman Tellis. I too would like, uh, would ask unanimous consent that a letter be entered into the record from the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Uh, this letter expresses strong opposition to Judge Kavanaugh's nomination on behalf of 180 different organizations um, involved in uh, civil rights and human rights. Without objection, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Weintraub, can you talk about the dangers you see for Americans with disabilities and their civil rights if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed to the Supreme Court? Yes. Thank you, Senator Hunt. Hirono. <laughs> yeah. Um, Even the chairman has problems for pronouncing my names. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, I see, I see um, the issue about the Doe case. These are mm -hmm. three women with intellectual disability, very similar to myself and my friends. And we, they weren't asked what they wanted to do in their, um, to, um, um, personal decisions mm -hmm. around their body. And we all deserve the right to make decisions. And yes, these women may or may not understand about these issues, but but that's why we bring our friends. I would never go into a doctor's office myself. I would take my husband, I would take my supporters, um, I can tell you that. And it was in my written testimony. Um, I just was diagnosed with diabetes. And um, I brought in my husband. And we, we didn't understand, as I told you, my husband, um, also has a disability, and both of us didn't understand. So we we asked my sister to help us mm -hmm. to understand these issues. So what I'm basically saying is that nothing about us without us. We need to be told. We need to be involved in these decisions. And Judge Kavanaugh, took that away from us. Thank you. Thank you. There have been a, a lot of questions uh, raised about Garza. And um, Judge Kavanaugh testified that, um, this is for Professors Murray and Ms. Garza. He testified that uh, he viewed Garza as a parental consent case. But uh, uh, that was not a parental consent case. Would you agree? Both of you? It was not a parental consent case. The judicial bypass procedure yes. had been followed and was in lieu of parental consent. So why would, this, I would characterize that as a very uh, obvious misstatement of the question before the court. And when you get, get the issue wrong, you're likely to come up with the wrong uh, answer. So I think it was so fundamental that he mischaracterized or misstated the issue. Would you agree with that? Both of you, Professors Murray and Garzo? I, I mean, I would agree with that for, for sure. And 
So we can sit here. Would you agree? Yes, I agree. So we can sit here and talk about uh, whether uh, there should have been time for the sponsor to be found and all of that, but that only that is totally irrelevant. That's correct. To what irrelevant. should have been the real issue in this case, whether or not uh, she should have the right to abortion. So I think that is very troubling when somebody who's uh, about to be seated on the Supreme Court mischaracterizes the question before the court. Now, I did want to ask you, Professor Murray, if you, um, if you can talk about the contradiction in Judge Kavanaugh's dissents in Garza and Parent Priest for Life, because uh, I believe that he really wanted to reach a result in each case, they are different cases, but nonetheless, though, they both had to do with uh, women's reproductive rights. And in the end, he denied the women involved their reproductive rights. And I believe he misapplied the facts to the law to get there. So can you talk a bit about you know, the contradiction in the outcomes, uh, the dissents in Garza and Priest for Life? Sure. Um, I've spoken at length about Garza and the way in which Judge Kavanaugh ignored existing precedents such as Bilotti versus Baird, such as Casey and its undue burden standard, and Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, which requires judges to weigh both the burdens and benefits mm -hmm. of a particular restriction. Um, in Priests for Life, again, I, I've also spoken about that case, what we saw is such incredible deference to the employer and the employer's religious beliefs and the employer's view that doing something as simple as filling out a form to notify the government of its objections to providing the necessary contraception is an impermissible burden on religious exercise. That suggests a broad deference that would be meaningful, as Ms. Baker has testified, so he found to millions of women. undue burden in the Garza case, and um, definitely, you know, so very different. But what do you see as a common? Well, the common, the common element in all of that is element. there is no burden that's too great for the woman. Um, there is a burden in Garza on Jane Doe, and in finding a substantial burden on the religious exercise of the employers, there is a burden in the absence of contraceptive coverage to women like Ms. Baker. I think that's why there are so many people who are very concerned about Judge Kavanaugh being on the court because, as you said, there are hundreds and hundreds of cases that states have passed that limits a woman's right to choose. So for him to say that Roe v. Wade, even were he to say that Roe v. Wade has set a law, is of little comfort to those of us who support women's reproductive choice. Thank you. Professor Amar. Professor Amar, uh, welcome back to the committee. We, uh, my colleague here, Senator Coons, and I were talking about how much we enjoy um, your insights in spite of the fact that you hate our special counsel bill. And we also agree that we're not going to allow you to talk about it because we'd have to extend the hearing for two hours, <laughs> um, mainly because of Senator Coons's commentary. I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Judge Kavanaugh and his body of work, uh, some 307 opinions. and. Um, could you, if you've studied them, I assume you have, uh, can you give me any insights into uh, ones that you think uh, best reflect his, uh, his thought process in arriving at an opinion? In the appendix to my testimony, I offer a snippet from the Washington Post that I wrote um, about the PHH case. It may be, I think it's the same one that that uh, Ted Olson discussed involving the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and its structure. Um, and what imp and uh, uh, Senator Klobuchar, I think, in passingly mentioned it also before she ha uh, uh, in, in her remarks. Um, and what's impressive, uh, particularly about that case, is the only uh, case uh, by um, a, re uh, 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 Court of Appeals that I actually assigned my students last year. I usually just give them Supreme Court cases. And what's so impressive about, and this is long before the nomination, of course, um, is it's trying to take seriously the founding and its founding principles um, and the role of the president um, uh, and the bureaucracy. The first Congress agreed that presidents could fire cabinet officers at will. It's called the decision of 1789. It's very basic. 
Um, the Supreme Court has unanimously uh, reaffirmed that. It, 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 the Supreme Court um, agreed with that in a very famous case called Myers. It's uh, written by the beginning of the 20th century by former President uh, Chief Justice Taft. And today's Supreme Court takes it very seriously. Um, uh, and so just Judge Kavanaugh was confronted with the decision of 179 that says cabin officers are basically fireable at will. And yet we have all these independent agencies, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the uh, Federal Communications Commission, that, whose members aren't removable at will, but only for good cause. And I know you think, oh, this is perilously close to what I'm not going to talk about, and I won't talk about it. Um, but um, so how are we going to take seriously the founding, but also take seriously the 20th century with the rise of independent agencies that have been affirmed again and again and again by the Supreme Court? And I thought Judge Kavanaugh came up with a beautiful synthesis of founding first principles and, ref and respect for um, modern um, understandings and, and, and institutions. Um, and, uh, I, 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 it, uh, and I do predict that the Supreme Court, uh, when the case finally goes up, will um, perhaps embrace something very similar to, to, to that uh, approach. And, and, uh, and he'll fit in very well with John Roberts on one side. Um, maybe Elena Kagan um, will, will be um, uh, 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 part of, uh, of that. She understands executive power also um, with someone like uh, Clarence Thomas or, or, uh, um, and, and some of the others on, on the other side. So I think he'll, he, he will work at, for a team of nine, but he will, and he will respect the founding a lot, but he also takes seriously modern precedents and modern realities. Thank you very much, and thank everybody on the committee, Mr. Olson. The only comment I'll make, uh, Senator Blumenthal, um, talking about that 9-0 decision. I'm not a Supreme Court expert, but that's a pretty definitive uh, opinion. Is that right? Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to thank all of those on the panel. I, I, take, I take complete credit for it. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank you all on the panel. I thought your opening testimony was outstanding, and with panels this size, it's very difficult to direct questions to everyone. Uh, but we do appreciate you all being here, Congressman. Thank you for your time and, and for your attention throughout the entire hearing. We're going to take a 30-minute recess for lunch. That will give us time to transition to the next panel. So we will return at 1.03. We're in recess.
before I introduce the panel, uh, I, 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 if nobody told you that push the red button before you speak, uh, otherwise we won't be able to hear you. Uh, so uh, the next panel is uh, followed by uh, eight witnesses. Four are for the majority and four are selected by the minority. Uh, we have a Mr. Kramer, a Ms. Esman, Eastman, Ms. T Tableson, Mr. Corbin, Mr. Lachance, Ms. Mahoney, Ms. Uh, Smith, and Mr. Christmas. Uh, I would ask you at this point uh, if you would stand, and I'd like to have you uh, uh, take an oath. Uh, do you swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you all very much for responding. Now I would like to <coughs> inter uh, say a little bit about each of you so the public watching on television or anybody in the audience knows. Uh, Alea. Eastman is a, let's see, I'm, I'm going, yeah, okay, is a student, oh, you know why I'm, I should be starting with Mr. Kramer. Uh, A.J. Kramer is federal public defender for the District of Columbia, very important position. He's held the position since the creation of the Office of Federal Public Defender for the District of Columbia in 1991. Now, I don't know, but... I'll bet you'd be one of the longest serving people in that position any place in the country. Uh, we have Alea Eastman, a student from Parkland, Florida, and a survivor of the very bad <coughs> school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Quite a tragedy you went through, and we'll hear about it, I'm sure. Rebecca Tableson served as law clerk for Judge Kavanaugh from 2010 to 2011, later clerk for Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court, and was an associate of Kirkland and Ellis. She currently serves as federal prosecutor in our Iowa's neighboring state of Wisconsin. Uh, Jackson Corbin is a student from Hanover, Pennsylvania. And uh, that's all the information I have about you, but if you want to tell us any more about you, we won't take it off of your time uh, that you have to speak to us. Then we have Hunter Lachance, the student from Kennebunk, Maine. And then we have Maureen Mahoney, serving as Deputy Solicitor General of the United States from 1991 to 1993. She is a retired partner of Latham and Watkins. Melissa Smith is a teacher at U.S. Grant High School, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Kenneth Chrisman is the Executive Vice President for Business and Legal Affairs, Mar Marvista Entertainment. He is a 1991 graduate of Yale Law School, and uh, you were a classmate of Judge Kavanaugh. So I welcome all of you, and I think we'll proceed with Mr. Kramer. Uh, and then we'll have our questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Senator Whitehouse. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today on behalf of Judge Brett Kavanaugh's nomination to be a Justice of the Supreme Court. I have been, as um, Chairman Grassley said, the federal public defender in Washington, D.C. since 1990. Prior to that, and I think all you meant was that I'm old when you said I'm one of the longest. Um, and there, I have worked in the Federal Public Defender's offices in Sacramento and San Francisco before I came to Washington, D.C., so I've spent my entire legal career as a Federal Public Defender. I do want to echo two things that were said by the prior panel, that I, too, was dismayed that um, Chief Judge Garland was not confirmed for the Supreme Court because I think he would have been a great Supreme Court Justice, 
and also Congressman Richmond's remarks about race in the criminal justice system, which I think still pervades the criminal justice system. Um, and I do, so I suppose you ask what I'm doing here, um, it, speaking on behalf of Judge Kavanaugh, and I will tell you why. I have two disclaimers I have to make. Um, I speak only on my own behalf, not on behalf of our office here in Washington, D.C., or any other federal public defender office or the federal public defender system. And also, I have read essentially none of Judge Kavanaugh's civil opinions, but I have read almost all of his criminal opinions, and I have argued in front of him numerous times, uh, probably more than 20 times, in criminal cases, and that's when I'm here to talk about his decisions in criminal cases. And I have to say, say that he is extremely well prepared in oral argument. He asked the pertinent questions. He asked them in an extremely nice manner. Um, not all judges are like that, but he asked the most important questions and zeroes in on the most important issues in the case. I think I was um, asked to talk about a couple of cases that I argued. One of them uh, was a woman who uh, was convicted of extortion, testified extensively at her trial about how she had been severely beaten by her boyfriend and forced into committing the offense. And um, I took over the case after the trial proceedings and argued that her lawyer had been ineffective for failing to present expert testimony on battered women syndrome. Um, it went up and down to the Court of Appeals and back, and Judge Kavanaugh um, wrote the opinion for the Court of Appeals saying that her lawyer had been ineffective for failing to retain an expert on battered women syndrome, and he wrote a primer essentially on the defense of battered women's syndrome for lawyers and over a dissent of one of his colleagues. In another case that I argued and tried actually, um, it was a terrible tragedy of a uh, person in the military who had uh, died after a hazing incident involving a gang and there were uh, major issues about jury instructions and closing argument um, and the uh, the case was reversed again in a two-to-one panel opinion, uh, and Judge Kavanaugh wrote a concurring opinion in that case, talking about how important it was that the jury be properly instructed on the mens rea uh, for the crime, and that while, the def while my client had committed some heinous acts, he deserved to have a fair trial, and the trial in this case had not been fair, and he wrote a concurring opinion to emphasize that. I should add, that there's a number of other cases I've argued and our office has argued where Judge Kavanaugh has been very protective of making sure that mens rea has been proved um, in various cases, including a case called Burwell where I was appointed amicus by the Court of Appeals for an end bank argument. Judge Kavanaugh was one of three judges um, that descended from the end bank that adopted the views that I put forward. Um, he's also been a major advocate on the Court of Appeals of writing about the bizarre situation where defendants who go to trial and are acquitted of a number of um, counts in the case, including a case where everybody was acquitted of all but one count, but then they're sentenced for the conduct of which they were acquitted. The judge takes that all into account and gives them a heavier sentence, which I should add that Congress could end uh, very quickly in a bill with a couple of sentences telling judges they should not take account of acquitted conduct. He's been a very um, he's been very critical of that. Um, I should also add that I've served on two committees with him. Uh, so I think the bottom line is he's been extremely fair in criminal cases where it might be assumed that he would just reflexively affirm criminal cases. He has been extremely fair and thoughtful is my experience. And I've also served on a committee, two committees with him, one of whom provides for CJA lawyers, Criminal Justice Act lawyers. His um, concern has always been to provide the most effective lawyers for defendants in the highest quality. And I just want to end with one thing. He sends me emails occasionally um, talking about the, how he likes the good job that our office does in defending criminal um, defendants and our clients. And he sent me a, an email totally unsolicited uh, quoting the Chief Justice's dissent in a forfeiture case. And he said, federal prosecutors, when they rise in court, represent the people of the United States but so do defense lawyers one at a time. And Judge Kavanaugh sent that to me, that quote, and said, that's a nice line that summarized what you and your office do so well. So all of that is why I'm here to support the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and other members of the committee, 
Thank you, for your thank you for the opportunity to be here today to share my experience and perspectives on gun violence in America. It needs to be a critical part of your consideration for any judge, particularly for the highest court in the land. My view is significantly impacted by my experience as a survivor of gun violence at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida just six months ago, and also losing my uncle Patrick Edwards 15 years ago in Brooklyn, New York. My name is Alea Eastman, a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. I work across the country to help amplify the voices of young people, and particularly young people in communities of color whose day-to-day -day experience with gun violence is always ignored, mischaracterized, marginalized, and minimized by the press, the public, and the corporate gun lobby. 102, February 14th, fourth period, Holocaust history, my last period of the day. The classroom door was locked today because of the new procedures. In the beginning of the period, we began presenting our hate projects that we've been working on. Nicholas Dworet was in my group. Little did I know, 79 minutes from then, he'd be saving my life. 221, we heard a round of extremely loud pops. We had no idea what it was or where it was coming from. The class was in complete silence and we all stared at each other in immediate fear. Within seconds, we heard it again. We all immediately ran. The class split in half. Half of my class ran to the safe spot, which was out of the view of the window that was in the classroom door. The other half was diagonally across from the window, in complete view. I was not in the safe spot. As I sat down, I remember telling myself, if I were to get shot anywhere, I wouldn't make it. I needed to be behind something. The only thing in front of me was Nicholas Dorette. Helena Ramsey began passing books down so we can shield ourselves from bullets, but yet everyone thought it was a drill. 222, I clenched the book from Helena and then looked down at my phone to call my mother. As I raised my finger to hit the green call button, the loud pops were now in my class. I thought to myself, what kind of senior prank is this? As I began to see red on the floor, I assumed it was a paintball gun. I looked up and saw Helena Ramsey slumped over with her back against the wall. I began smelling and inhaling the smoke and gunpowder. Then Nicholas Dorat rapidly fell over in front of me. I followed every movement of his body. When he fell over, I fell over with him. I then placed myself underneath his lifeless body, placing his arm across my body and my head underneath his back. Bullets continued flying. I kept my eyes on the ground so I knew when to hold my breath and close my eyes when the shooter got near. I began talking to God. I told God that I knew I was going to die. I asked him, please make it fast. I didn't want to feel anything. I asked for the bullet to go through my head so I wouldn't endure any pain. I laid there for about 30 seconds, still protected by his lifeless body, waiting for the shooter to move on to the next class. After the shooting stopped in my class, his body became very heavy. I couldn't breathe anymore. I rolled him off of me and placed his head on his arm so he wouldn't be touching the cold ground. I sat up and looked over. Helena was still in the same exact position I last saw her. I froze. Still in absolute view of the window of the, shooter the shot, of the window the shooter shot into, two of my classmates then pulled me behind a filing cabinet. We were all crammed, some on the phone with 911, some on the phone with their parents. I immediately called my mom. I told her my last goodbyes. I told her how much I loved her. I apologized for all the things I might have done in my lifetime to upset her, and then the phone hung up. I then called my father. I told him how much I loved him. I told him to tell my brothers I loved them, and I said my last goodbyes. I couldn't hear anything they were saying, to me, but I made sure they could hear me, not knowing whether it was one shooter or multiple and not knowing whether they were coming back or not was an, an unimaginable amount of fear, sitting behind the Fallon cabinet waiting to die. I began hyperventilating. My classmates began breathing with me and trying to keep me calm and quiet. It didn't work. They then covered my face. I felt like I was suffocating, but it was to keep me quiet. 2.30, Broward County Police Department was heard from outside the shattered glass. I thought it was the shooter playing a trick. Then a SWAT team member came to check the pulse of Helena and Nicholas. He then looked at me with compassion and said, I know. We all ran out, passing bodies in the hallway on the way out. When I got outside, I was completely disoriented. The police then said, he's still on the loose, guys, and we need you to work with us. I was petrified. Four o'clock, I finally found my friend and her mother. They noticed the unimaginable. They called the police over and they began picking body matter from my hair. I completely broke down. The police looked took me back on campus to gather photos of me and collect my bloody dress. They placed me in a chemical suit meant for chemical and biological exposure, then recording my, recorded my statement. 9.30, at the Marriott Hotel, I was finally allowed to physically touch my mother. It was absolutely horrific, so real and mind-numbing. I will never forget what I saw, what I did, and what I experienced that day. I will never forget Nicholas Dorette, who even in debt, helped protect and save my life. 
Days later, we received news that my mother would be having a miscarriage because of what the shock of the shooting did to her body. The shooting didn't only impact me on February 14th, it impacts me every day of my life. I've also lost a family member to gun violence. I lost my uncle Patrick Edwards in the streets of Brooklyn, New York. He was shot in the back. The bullet then pierced his heart. He was only 18 with his whole life ahead of him. And unfortunately, that is the same story of thousands of black and brown families across the country. Gun violence disproportionately impacts black and brown youth, whether that being police brutality, homicides, or domestic violence. As for people of color, law enforcement is the shooter in some cases. History of bias, brutality, and racism in so many communities. Like many of my brothers and sisters of color, I am not comforted by deputies with handguns, let alone assault rifles. I am very concerned since learning Brett Kavanaugh's views on guns and how he would strike down any assault weapons ban. Too many danger dangerous and prohibited people continue to be able to readily access and, and use dangerous weapons to terrorize Americans at home, work, church, school, and on our streets and anywhere we go on our day-to-day -day life. As you consider what to do and who to appoint to make us safer from gun violence, remember my story. Remember my classmates who died. Remember the victims of color who, that face mass shootings every day. Remember all victims of gun violence from Parkland, Brooklyn, Miami, Milwaukee, Oakland, and all over America. As you make your final decision, Think about it as if you had to justify and defend your choice to those who we lost to gun violence. If Kavanaugh doesn't have the decency to shake hands with the father of a victim, he definitely won't have the decency to make life-changing decisions that affect real people. The youth is urging our society to, society to recognize the depth and seriousness of the gun violence epidemic in America. We are all here with an urgent message for you. If the youth across the country can fight to eradicate gun violence, why can't judges, lawmakers, and Donald Trump understand that young people are dying from this senseless gun violence? Thank you. Bolsa. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Senator Whitehouse, and members of the committee, I'm honored to be testifying before you today. My name is Rebecca Tableson. I'm here today from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I clerked for Brett Kavanaugh in 2010 and 11 and I enthusiastically support his nomination to be an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I'd like to talk about two things today. First, what Brett Kavanaugh is like as a judge, and second, what Brett Kavanaugh is like as a person. At work in his chambers, Judge Kavanaugh has a motto of sorts. It's process protects us. I'll admit it is not very catchy, but it's true to the judge and to his core judicial philosophy. What it means is that Judge Kavanaugh goes through an intense step-by-step -step process in order to decide each and every case. That process starts with an open mind and a foundational commitment to the belief that either side might be right. Judge Kavanaugh then reads and analyzes every brief and rereads every precedent in the case and he insists that his law clerks find the very best version of each argument in the case, even when the lawyers themselves have not. In addition to the party's arguments, Judge Kavanaugh also takes very seriously the views of his colleagues, the other judges on the case, especially when they differ from his own. I can remember
do something. <laughs> I, I do not know the face of the technician. Oh, I can't direct anybody except him. There's something wrong with this system. Back on now. Okay. Is this okay, ma'am? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Start over again. Yes, sir. Re Rebecca. Um, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Senator Whitehouse, and members of the committee, I am honored to be testifying before you today. My name is Rebecca Tableson. I'm here today from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I clerked for Brett Kavanaugh in 2010 and 11, and I enthusiastically support his nomination to be an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I'd like to talk about two things today. First, what Brett Kavanaugh is like as a judge, and second, what Brett Kavanaugh is like as a person. At work in his chambers, Judge Kavanaugh has a motto of sorts, process protects us. I'll admit, it's not very catchy, but it's true to the judge and to his core judicial philosophy. What it means is that Judge Kavanaugh goes through an intense step-by-step -step process in order to decide each and every case. That process starts with an open mind and a foundational commitment to the belief that either side might be right. Judge Kavanaugh then reads and analyzes every brief and rereads every relevant precedent. And he insists that his clerks find the very best version of every argument in the case even when the lawyers themselves have not. In addition to the party's arguments, Judge Kavanaugh also takes very seriously the views of his colleagues, the other judges, especially when they differ from his own. I can remember all too clearly being corrected by Judge Kavanaugh once when I, fresh out of law school, spoke too dismissively about another judge's view of a case. I learned from that. Understanding Judge Kavanaugh's humility and respect for his colleagues is essential to understanding his identity as a judge. Judge Kavanaugh completes his entire process from scratch for every issue in every case. It's no coincidence he's often the last person at work in the courthouse each night, but it's worth it. This process, as he says, protects us. It protects against snap decisions, shortcuts, and prejudgments. By never skipping a step, never giving short shrift to an argument or ignoring a precedent. Judge Kavanaugh ensures that his decisions are based on the law and the facts of each case and only those things. That process also protects us, American citizens, from having unelected judges ruling based on their own predispositions or preferences. Only after completing that process does the judge decide once and for all what he thinks. And once he's decided, he is difficult to budge. He is independent and stubbornly so. He cannot be pressured by his law clerks or his colleagues, and he cannot be intimidated by other actors in government. It is simply not part of his process. Politics also have no place in Judge Kavanaugh's process. Having known the judge for almost 10 years and having worked with him very closely, I myself do not know what his views are on the political issues of the day. And as a law clerk, it would have been unthinkable to even mention the political implications of a case. In fact, had we known in advance how to decide a case based on the parties or the amici or some policy goal, we might have skipped a few steps in the process and gone home a bit earlier at night. But he never did, and so we never did. For those reasons, if you want to know what Judge Kavanaugh is like as a person, his cases are not the best place to look because he keeps his preferences out of them. His process reflects his fairness, work ethic, and judicial temperament, but the outcomes are based on the law, not his personal views. But I can tell you that as a person, Brett Kavanaugh stands out. He has testified extensively this week, so I don't need to tell you how smart thoughtful, and unflappable he is. When his guard is down, when he's not before this committee or on television, he is the same way. But in my view, those are not his most remarkable qualities. 
Instead, it's his everyday, universal, disarming kindness. I sometimes find myself saying that Judge Kavanaugh is normal or approachable, but those cliches are not quite right. Instead, those are compliments designed for federal judges who no one expects to be normal or approachable. In truth, Judge Kavanaugh is far, far nicer than is normal and far more approachable than almost anyone you will ever approach. He has an easy laugh and a great sense of humor. I myself am rarely, I'm rarely funny, as Senator Booker has pointed out. But he laughs at all of my jokes, including especially the jokes at his expense. Although his credentials are elite, you would never know it to talk to him. The judge is a regular at his neighborhood bar, for example, where he's partial to a Budweiser and a hamburger, and where the longtime regular bartender did not even know that Brett Kavanaugh was a lawyer till he saw his nomination to the United States Supreme Court. If he's confirmed, Judge Kavanaugh's humility, collegiality, and kindness will stand out on the Supreme Court. Judge Kavanaugh is going to stand out on the Supreme Court for another reason as well, which is his support for women in the legal profession. Elite legal circles are predominantly male. The year I clerked on the Supreme Court, for example, 26 of the 39 law clerks were men, and that is typical. Just this morning, the New York Times ran an article about the barriers faced by women and people of color throughout the legal profession. According to that article, an ABA report found that in 2016, 2016, only 35% of active American lawyers are women. Judge Kavanaugh, by contrast, has hired more women than men as law clerks. One year, all four of his clerks were women, which was a first for the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. That is something no Supreme Court justice has ever done. After hiring us, Judge Kavanaugh goes to bat for us. As the members of this committee know, hard work and smarts are not always enough to reach the top of your profession. Instead, it takes guidance from people who have been there and advocates willing to fight for you. Studies have shown that women are often at a disadvantage on those fronts. But Judge Kavanaugh is a force of nature. Thanks to his sponsorship, about 85% of Judge Kavanaugh's female clerks have gone on to clerk on the Supreme Court. We have clerked for justices across the court, including Justices Kagan, Breyer, and Sotomayor. We have served in all three branches of state and federal governments. We are professors, prosecutors, and nonprofit attorneys. One of us is now even a judge herself. I know of no federal judge who has more effectively supported women in this profession than Brett Kavanaugh. 10 years after I first met Judge Kavanaugh, I'm now figuring out how to be a lawyer and a mom to three kids aged three and under. In fact, if you heard a baby crying outside this chamber earlier this morning, that is my fault. She is three months old and she absolutely insisted on coming. I know firsthand how important it is to have an advocate like Brett Kavanaugh and I attribute my still vibrant legal career in large part to him. I am only one of many. A significant number of Judge Kavanaugh's former clerks have been here for these hearings, and we have uniformly recommended him for his character, his work ethic, and his kindness. The United States and the American people would be well served with Judge Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Thank you. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and distinguished members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I'm privileged to represent 130 million people with pre-existing conditions today, and I'm grateful for the invitation to testify before you. My name is Jackson Corbin, and I'm 13 years old. I'm a lot like other teenagers. I love comic books, Marvel movies, and I love to play Minecraft and Fortnite with my friends. Ten years ago, my brother, mother, and I were all diagnosed with Newman syndrome, a genetic condition that affects various systems of the body. As a result of my Newman syndrome, I have a lot of pre-existing conditions. Newman syndrome affects my growth, so I'll never be as tall or as strong as other people my age. I have stomach issues, reflux, and I get really bad headaches. My most severe condition is my von Willebrand's disease, a form of hemophilia. This means I cannot play contact sports or do things like roughhouse, roller skate, 
or jump on trampolines. I take medication to control my reflux and to clot my blood if I get hurt. Having my clotting medicine at home means I don't have to go to the emergency room every time I lose a tooth or get a bad bruise or cut. My brother Henry is my best friend. He is 10 and a half years old and he has Noonan syndrome too. We do everything together, including going to our specialist visits. My mom always says the greatest thing she ever did was give the two of us to each other. Noonan syndrome affects everyone differently. So in addition to having all the same conditions as me, including von Willebrand's disease, Henry has even more special health care needs than I do. When Henry was a baby, he had a life-saving stomach surgery and a blood transfusion. Now he has what's called gastroparesis, which means he vomits almost every day, sometimes even in his sleep. The medicine he takes helps, but not all the time. We share a room, and at first it was scary to see him vomit in his sleep, but now I'm used to it. When I hear him gagging, I roll him over so he doesn't choke and run to get my parents. Henry also has heart problems and asthma. I worry about Henry a lot. I have heard my mom and dad say that they are grateful for our insurance because the cost of our care is more than my family makes in a year. That means if the Affordable Care Act is repealed and Henry and I lose our insurance, my parents will not be able to afford to pay for our care. I have been fighting for health care for nearly two years. Last year, in the first speech I ever gave on the lawn of the Capitol, I compared myself to Dr. Seuss's The Lorax. The Lorax says, I am the Lorax, and I speak for the trees. And so I said, I am Jackson, and I speak for the children. I said that because I had met so many children with special health care needs who are unable to speak for themselves. I wanted to be their voice. But as my journey continued and I met even more children and adults with pre-existing conditions who, like me and Henry, are scared for their future, I realize that I'm not only speaking for the children anymore. Today especially, I speak for everyone. I speak for myself, Henry, and all the other children across the country with special health care needs. I speak for the parents who struggle with their own health issues while caring for, well, while caring for their, their children, including my own mom, who has Noonan syndrome too. I speak for every person with a disability who high fives me in the Senate hallways as they fight for our care. I speak for every person with a disability who will never be able to live independently. I even speak for the man who has lupus, who altered the suit I'm wearing today. Most importantly, I speak for every American whose life could change tomorrow with a new diagnosis. My Noonan syndrome is a part of who, of who I am. It's been a part of me since the day I was born and will be a part of me for the rest of my life. If you destroy protections for pre-existing conditions, you leave me and all kids and adults like me without care or without the ability to afford our care, all because of who we are. We deserve better than that. I might be a kid, but I'm still an American. The decisions you are making today will affect my generation's ability to have access to affordable health care. We must have justices on the Supreme Court who will save the Affordable Care Act Save the Affordable Care Act, safeguard pre-existing conditions, and protect our care. Please give us the chance to be healthy, to grow up, and to lead this country one day. I know I want that chance. Thank you. Hunter. Mr. LaChance, go ahead. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, my name is Hunter LaChance. I live in Kennebunkport, Maine, and I'm a sophomore at Kennebunk High School. I'm 15 years old, and I suffer from asthma. I live in a state that has some of the highest rates of asthma in the country. According to the Maine Center for Disease Control, nearly 12% of adults in our state have asthma, compared with 9% nationally. Maine children also suffer from a higher rate of asthma than the national average. I am one of those statistics. Despite Maine's many beauties, it has worse air quality than most people realize. Because Maine sits at the end of America's tailpipe, air pollution from upwind states is carried into Maine by the prevailing winds. Air pollution makes life extremely difficult for those of us with asthma, 
and makes it harder for me to breathe. <coughs> for me to live a healthy life, air pollution needs to decrease, not increase. I am concerned that the Supreme Court could make major decisions in the next few years that will cause air pollution in Maine to increase if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed. Many people in this room may have asthma or know someone who does, so what I'm about to describe to you may be familiar. Here is a coffee stir. If you have one, I encourage you to put it to your mouth and try breathing through it. Now imagine only being able to breathe through this sized hole for an hour, or a day, or even a week. This is what it's been like during an asthmatic attack. Unfortunately, I'm not alone in having asthma impact my life. Asthma affects nearly 25 million Americans, including over 6 million children. Two million people go to the emergency rooms each year because of asthma. I'm here today because my future and my health may depend on it. I'm just your everyday kid from Maine. I play sports, like to swim, and love playing in the snow. But my active life changed when I was diagnosed with asthma at the age of 10. Suddenly, everything became more difficult. I was sidelined from sports, began missing school, and my parents constantly worried about my health. The year after I was diagnosed, I missed close to a quarter of the school year. I can vividly remember times when my asthma attacks were so strong and scary that I was removed from class by my teachers and sent to the nurse's office. Most of the time, the nurse sent me home or asked my parents to get medical attention. I remember one really bad attack when I was homesick for three weeks. Three weeks. Asthma is a leading reason why kids miss school and has directly impacted my ability to learn from my teachers and spend time with my friends. Although air pollution doesn't cause asthma, it triggers attacks. On ozone alert days, people across the country have trouble breathing, and this should worry everyone. It worries me. In Maine, we need strong federal regulations on air pollution because pollution doesn't stop at state borders. If states upwind from Maine are allowed to pollute more because federal regulations are weakened, then that's bad for me. It's bad for Mainers, and it's bad for anyone in America with a respiratory disease or asthma. That's why I'm here. I'm deeply concerned that if Judge Kavanaugh is on the Supreme Court, he would vote to weaken laws that protect my health, because he already has. In a 2012 ruling, he rejected the cross-state air pollution rule based on the Clean Air Act's good neighbor provision, which regulates air that crosses state lines. According to the EPA, this rule reduces sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide balloons and will prevent 34,000 premature deaths. During his time on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, Mr. Kavanaugh has repeatedly struck down other Clean Air Act protections. This worries me a lot because clean air is a life or death issue for so many people like me. We need a Supreme Court that will protect clean air because lives depend on it. We also need a Supreme Court that will uphold the protections to address climate change because my generation's future depends on it. For me, climate change means that life will be even more difficult with more ozone alert days, more dust and soot in the air from forest fires, and more mold due to extreme weather and flooding. Here's my coffee, sir, again. Next time you have the chance, pick one up and try breathing through it and see how long you can last. This is what it feels like to suffer through asthma. Through asthma. If the Supreme Court fails to protect clean air, then it's failing to protect me and millions of other Americans. Please don't confirm someone for the Supreme Court with a record like Judge Kavanaugh's, a record that could mean more air pollution, more asthma attacks, and more premature deaths for the millions of Americans unfortunate enough to be afflicted with asthma like me. Thank you for letting me testify today. Thank you, Mr. LaChance. Now, Ms. Mahoney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Whitehouse, Senator Whitehouse, and members of the committee. I'm honored to add my voice in support of Judge Kavanaugh today. I worked with him at the Solicitor General's office, and I appeared before him on the D.C. Circuit, and it's hard for me to think of anyone who is more qualified. I'd like to make two points. First, I want to share my view that Judge Kavanaugh has much in common with my former colleague, Chief Justice Roberts, whom the Senate voted to confirm by a wide margin. Second, I want to explain why Judge Kavanaugh's extraordinary record of mentoring female lawyers is so important to my profession. In 2005, I testified before this committee in support of Chief Justice Roberts' confirmation, and I'm struck by the many similarities between him and Judge Kavanaugh. Some are obvious. Both are extraordinary lawyers. 
Both worked in the White House Counsel's Office and the Solicitor General's Office, and both served as judges on the D.C. Circuit. But they also share a civility and even-handedness on the bench that reflects their genuine effort to consider all sides of an argument thoroughly before reaching any conclusions. I've had the pleasure of arguing before both men. Like the Chief Justice, Judge Kavanaugh asks difficult and incisive questions, but he's polite and he conveys his thoughts with an open mind. As the ABA panel confirmed this morning, my view is widely shared by the bar. Don Verrilli, Solicitor General during the Obama administration, has called Judge Kavanaugh a brilliant jurist who is a gracious person on and off the bench. And a bipartisan group of appellate practitioners praise his unfailing courtesy to counsel and to, to the other judges and his colleagues. In an era when some appellate judges have behaved like brusque advocates for one side during oral argument, Judge Kavanaugh has been a model of the proper judicial disposition. The Chief Justice and Judge Kavanaugh also understand the proper role of a federal judge to be an independent, neutral arbiter. During his confirmation hearing, the Chief Justice famously described judges as umpires who apply the rules without fear or favor. I think it is fair to say that the Chief Justice has done so. At various times, both sides of the aisle have denounced his rulings, just like the same thing that happens to umpires. And Judge Kavanaugh has similarly demonstrated impartiality and fairness in his 12 years on the DC Circuit. He repeatedly ruled against the Bush administration where he worked prior to becoming a judge in his first three years on the bench. He's ruled in favor of an Al-Qaeda terrorist, in favor of a pro-choice Democratic interest group and against the Republican Party. And to the surprise of some, even the ACLU has recognized that Judge Kavanaugh has been sympathetic to Title VII claims. As Judge Kavanaugh has explained in speeches over the years, a judge must check any prior political allegiances at the door, and I am confident he will stay true to that ideal. Second, Judge Kavanaugh also stands out as a mentor to women lawyers. I know you've heard the statistics a lot, but they're worth repeating. Um, over half of Judge Kavanaugh's law clerks have been women. 21 of those 25 have been hired to clerk on the Supreme Court, and this is simply astounding. These women have gone on to serve in all three branches of government, in the White House, in the Solicitor General's office, four federal prosecutors, one as a Deputy Solicitor General of the District of Columbia, another, as you just heard, serves as a judge on the 11th Circuit. It's difficult to overstate how important opportunities like these can be for a lawyer's career, especially in appellate practice. Credentials like a Supreme Court clerkship or a job at the Solicitor General's office are keys that unlock doors at the highest levels of the legal profession. Very few women have historically held these elite positions. When I clerked for Chief Justice Rehnquist in 1979, almost 80% of the law clerks at the court were male, and a large in gender imbalance endures today. Almost twice as many men as women have been hired as Supreme Court clerks since 2005. In the most recent Supreme Court term, women delivered only 12% of the oral arguments, and women make up only 19% of law firm equity partners. I was one of the lucky few. I argued 21 cases before the Supreme Court, and this never would have happened without the mentorship of a federal judge just like Judge Kavanaugh does for his clerks. Chief Justice Rehnquist helped launch my appellate career by hiring me as his clerk, and in 1988, he then arranged for me to argue my first Supreme Court case. I was the first woman to receive the honor of being appointed by the Supreme Court to argue a case by invitation. With that argument under my belt, Chief Justice Roberts then recruited me in 1991 to join him in the Solicitor General's office as one of four deputies, a position that has rarely been held by women. These were the opportunities that made it possible for me to compete with the men who dominate the Supreme Court bar. For more than a decade, Judge Kavanaugh has been instrumental in opening these doors for a new generation of women lawyers. He's been a teacher, advisor, and advocate for women in ways that unquestionably demonstrate his commitment to equality, and that will ultimately reduce persistent gender disparities in the legal profession. In short, Judge Kavanaugh's independence, his civility and open-mindedness, 
and his generous mentorship are just a few of the many characteristics that make him superbly qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Now, Ms. Smith. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Melissa Smith, and I am a union member and public school teacher at U.S. Grant High School on the southwest side of Oklahoma City. I'm also the very proud daughter of a police officer who served his community for 41 years and who taught me how to use my voice. He made sure that I not only knew my rights, but that I knew how to exercise them. Because of my father, I went into juvenile justice where I quickly realized that most teenagers have no idea that they have rights. So I became a high school social studies teacher where I can open my students' eyes to the concepts of equality, justice, and fairness. I teach them that under the US Constitution, they do have rights. I teach them the impact of the law and their roles and responsibilities within the government so that they can be engaged and active in our democracy. Today, I am honored to be able to show my students exactly what it means to use your voice and participate in our government at the highest level. As you consider your vote on this lifetime appointment, please consider our experiences. Oklahoma City Public Schools is the state's largest district where almost 90% of our families are economically disadvantaged. I'm a proud general at US Grant High School. We have the most dedicated staff and incredible students. Our district has had to cut almost $40 million from its budget in the last two years. Our fine arts budget was slashed by 50% and our library media budget was completely eliminated. Our school building was built for 1,200 people just 11 years ago, yet we currently have 2,200 staff members and students. Classrooms that have almost 40 students rarely have enough desks for all of them to sit in. It is often first come, first serve to those classrooms. Some teachers don't even have classrooms at all. They have all of their belongings, textbooks, and supplies on carts, and they push them from classroom to classroom, hour to hour. I'm telling you about our funding crisis in Oklahoma for two reasons. First, because Judge Kavanaugh's stated position on private school vouchers would exacerbate the situation in Oklahoma City. Vouchers do nothing to help student achievement, but do everything to undermine the public schools that 90% of children in this nation attend. Siphoning more funding away from public education will destroy public schools. The second reason I'm telling you about our funding crisis is that I have seen firsthand how the collective power of unions allows individuals to band together to bargain for resources for students and teachers. Judge Kavanaugh has a strong history of siding with big business over the needs, rights, and safety of individual employees. His record shows that he sides with employers who do not adhere to their collective bargaining agreement, and he does not see the need for union representation in employee meetings. I can tell you that through my union, <clears throat> I've learned the power of collective voice. I can advocate for my own working conditions which are the same learning conditions for my students. Unions give voice and agency to people who can't find it otherwise. They make it possible for us to accomplish together what we could not do on our own. Five months ago, Oklahoma teachers walked out of our classrooms. Our legislature passed a $6,000 pay raise in an attempt to stop that walkout, but we were fighting for more than just a pay raise. We were fighting for our students and their needs that often go well beyond what you would expect a teacher to have to take care of. I have physically picked up a teenager off the floor and carried her to the counselor's office. She was sobbing, saying that she didn't want to live anymore. Thank goodness our counselor was able to be at school that day. I have seen the terror on a transgender student's face when he shared that he identifies as male, and then that terror turned to joy when I, as a trusted adult, accepted him for who he is. Just last week, a fellow teacher wrote a reference letter for a student and his family for their hearing to determine whether or not they can remain in this country. She stressed about it for days because she needed it to be perfect. Her student has never known anything but his life in Oklahoma, and he is terrified of being sent to a place that is not his home. The morning after the 2016 presidential election was a tough one at US Grant. Many of our students are undocumented or have undocumented family members. The US Grant family rallied around all of our students more than usual on that day. We don't ask if they or their parents are undocumented. That's not our purpose. And so far, the US Supreme Court agrees. Now, why am I sharing these experiences with you? Because I worry about my students and who will look out for them. I worry that our government is too far removed from the people it serves and that the consequences of that gap are far more dangerous than we realize. 
If confirmed, Judge Kavanaugh's decisions will impact not just teachers and students in schools now, but the futures of my students and for generations to come. The experiences of my students and fellow staff members show that there is a real impact of Judge Kavanaugh's jurisprudence on America's future. Thank you for allowing me to be here today. I would like to end my statement the same way I end every single Friday in class with my students. Be the example, have a good weekend, and please make good choices. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Christmas. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Feinstein, and other distinguished members of this committee, I am honored, grateful, and humble to appear before you endorse, to endorse the nomination of Judge Brett Kavanaugh to sit as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. I have known this nominee for three decades. He is a close personal friend. I hope my testimony today will illuminate a side of Judge Kavanaugh that is not often seen in media accounts. I met Judge, Judge Kavanaugh in 1988 during my <laughs> first year at Yale Law School when he was a second year law student. In addition to both of us pursuing our love of the law, we watched Sports Center, played pickup basketball games, and loved going to Yale football games. We became fast friends. The following year, we roomed together with six other law students in a house behind the Yale gym. I've always admired Judge Kavanaugh's ability to create de deep relationships with people from all walks of life, conservative, liberal, athlete, academic, male, female, white, black. I think the one reason for this is he never assumes he's the smartest person in the room. Judge Kavanaugh deeply believes he can learn something from everyone. A wonderful confidant, Judge Kavanaugh has always made me feel comfortable speaking to him about basically anything because he genuinely cares how others, others feel and authentically tries to understand how they think. During law school, I often sought out Judge Kavanaugh's advice. He would implore me to first understand the issue from all points of view. Put yourself in their shoes, I recall him advising me. How would that make you feel? Then he would challenge me, demand of myself that which you ask from others. Should he be fortunate enough to be confirmed, I believe, Judge Kavanaugh will bring that same humility and compassion to the Supreme Court. It's who Judge Kavanaugh is. Since graduation, the same eight law school roommates have spent a long weekend together every year with an astonishingly minimal absentee rate. And Judge Kavanaugh has been no exception. These 26 reunions have kept us all close, even as our families and careers demanded more time from each of us. I will never forget a long drive I took to Bucks <clears throat> County, Pennsylvania for one of our early annual reunions. Judge Kavanaugh listened and asked questions for the whole ride as I explained my bewilderment over those who deny the continuing effects of slavery and Jim Crow laws. While I was raised in California, I have deep family roots in Mississippi. I believe then, as I do now, that the laws of our country must remain responsive to historical prejudice, discrimination, oppression, and mistreatment of African Americans. There was no doubt left in my mind following that ride that Judge Kavanaugh deeply cared and still cares about truly understanding my black experience and point of view. Over the years, Judge Kavanaugh and I have traveled together many times in and outside the country. I, jo I drove with Judge Kavanaugh to Boston to watch him run his first Boston Marathon Judge Kavanaugh made the trip to California for my wedding, and I flew back to DC for his. While our age is no longer conducive to pick up basketball games, we have been able to commiserate over coaching our children and learning that the first rule of being a good youth basketball coach is understanding you are no longer a player. Our support for one another has been a steady and reliable force as we move through life's ups and downs. Earlier this year, Judge Kavanaugh and I, along with other law school roommates and friends, gathered over a weekend for the funeral of the son of another roommate. I witnessed Judge Kavanaugh's love, care, and support of our friend during the most difficult of times. He attended dinners, participated in fellowship well into the night, and spent the day at the funeral service in support of the family. In a time of personal crisis, I won't need to look far for my friend because Judge Kavanaugh will already be there. So, 
you may ask, what does coaching basketball, showing up at each other's wedding, listening to my experiences as a black man living in America, or attending a funeral have to do with determining whether Judge Kavanaugh should become a Supreme, Justice, Supreme Court Justice? The answer is, it speaks directly to his humanity. Judge Kavanaugh cares. He is far from being an ideologue. He does naturally what a good judge should do, seek to understand before offering an opinion. Judge Kavanaugh is a tremendous son, friend, husband, and father. He's honest, empathetic, and intellectually curious. That's the person I know. Over the course of my life, I've found that a true test of a friendship is when support for a friend is indeed inconvenient. For me, from the perspective of a lifelong Democrat, it is inconvenient to support Judge Kavanaugh, especially during this time of an unprecedented partisan divide and polarization among Americans. But I know it is the right thing to do. As an American, I'm quite concerned about the attacks on our esteemed institutions like the judiciary. My expectation of any judicial nominee I support, especially when it is for the Supreme Court, is that he or she possess a powerful sense of fairness and impartiality. As an African-American, I expect a nominee I support to have a deep sense of obligation to protect the interests of those disempowered, particularly those whose voices are too often drowned out of our political discourse and cannot be heard. Again, all this requires a judge who is compassionate, humble, and principled. Judge Kavanaugh is such a nominee. Everyone here today is well aware of Judge Kavanaugh's extraordinary qualifications, both educationally and professionally. However, it is Judge Kavanaugh's humanity that compelled me to come here today to testify on his behalf. For this reason, without equivocation or reservation, I respectfully urge this committee and the Senate to confirm Judge Brett Kavanaugh as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Chairman of the Committee, I should thank all of you for your testimony. I know you have to work hard to do it. Some of you have traveled a long way, so just generally, thank you. And then uh, I'm going to ask my questions, and then I'll call on Senator Whitehouse, and I would ask for maybe 10 or 15 minutes if one of my Republican colleagues would moderate uh, while I step out, and I'll be close by. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Christmas, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, say that for four days now, we've had a lot of people exercise their public constitutional rights to speak, as you've heard it at this day, uh, afraid of Justice Kavanaugh, or Kavanaugh being a justice on the Supreme Court. We've had three or four panel people right here that you've heard uh, their own testimony. And so there's this fear that he doesn't, might not take into consideration the, uh, the, the needs of people less fortunate than he is uh, with various problems that we've heard expressed here. So I think you probably has spoke a little bit to this in your testimony, but emphasize for us, so speak not to me, but to the people that have these concerns. Well, Senator, I, I understand those concerns. I do not share that fear. Uh, Brett is one of the most thoughtful, empathetic people uh, I know. Um, I've spent much time with him talking about uh, issues that are very dear to me. Uh, he has been generous with his insight. Um, he cares. And, and I think that the empathy that, that he naturally exhibits will serve him well. And I would encourage people to um, understand that th this man is, um, is thoughtful, is humble, uh, and thinks to understand before he makes himself understood. From your point, I'll follow up, from your point as a lawyer, and, uh, and uh, as uh, you expect a judge to look at the facts of the case and the, what the law is and leave their own personal views out of it, 
So can you explain to the people that have these concerns about him those things that have to be taken into consideration that maybe don't deal exactly with a person that has special medical problems like you heard here today? Yes. Um, and I recall Brett when he came to my wedding, or I should say Judge Kavanaugh, and he spent time with my family. Um, I, I recall him uh, speaking at length uh, with, with members of my family who had no real knowledge of what it's like to be a judge and be involved in, in, in D.C. And, and the way that Judge Kavanaugh is. And, and I was just struck by how easily uh, and comfortably he was able to speak to everybody um, uh, who he had just met uh, during that wedding. Um, there was a period where my niece graduated from Howard uh, University, and I had uh, mentioned uh, Judge Kavanaugh that I may come out, and, and he arranged for 20 uh, of, of the members of my family to, to tour the West Wing, and he showed up on a Saturday with a couple of his aides. Um, that, that's the sort of person he is, so I, I understand the concerns, but the man I know is generous with his time and thought, and uh, I love the discussion about process. Uh, he seeks to not be influenced by people outside, and, and he's one of the most prepared, thoughtful uh, people I know. Yeah. I will end with Mr. Kramer. Uh, I assume, uh, not being a lawyer, but I can assume what public defenders do. You're dealing mostly defending people that don't have resources of their own. In fact, that may be 100% of your clientele. You've heard uh, several days that uh, my colleague from New Jersey has expressed concern about, uh, about uh, people that can't defend themselves in court, uh, the jury system not working the way uh, it traditionally works, uh, and mandatory minimums, all that. Can you give uh, people of low income uh, that you represent uh, uh, maybe other problems? that uh, the assurance that they're going to get uh, the, their concerns addressed the way they ought to be through somebody that's on the Supreme Court? Thank you, Chairman Grassley. Um, yes, absolutely, I, and I tried to get that out. Uh, the fact, the reason I'm here is because of the fairness that Judge Kavanaugh has shown. Our clients are without resources and tend not to be a very popular group. Um, and. Judge Kavanaugh has shown through my experience, my numerous arguments in front of him, and the opinions he's written, a, fun, a belief in a fundamental, and I share, completely share Senator Booker's views on the criminal justice system, but Judge Kavanaugh has shown through his opinions in the criminal cases um, that I've argued, as well as his, his service on the CJA committee that I've been involved with, a concern for the fundamental fairness of the system and a uh, that people should be, even though they are without resources and represented by a public defender, that they should have the best representation possible. And that's why I wholeheartedly support his nomination. And I note that it, uh, one more thing that it's, in a sense to me, remarkable. Usually a judge who wants to be confirmed for a position or another court um, would never have a public defender near the hearings um, talking in support of them. And I, I think that, again, shows Judge Kavanaugh's um, concern for the fundamental fairness of the system, and that's why I support him. Okay. Uh, Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Elia, may I use your first name? I could call you Ms. East Eastman if you wanted. No, please. Okay, Elia. I just wanted to um, tell you that you have had to live through an experience that no child should have to live through, and what you've brought into this hearing room from that experience has been stunning. Thank you. Your testimony was incredibly well delivered Thank you. and incredibly well prepared. And I hope that not only you, but your friends and family who are with you here today are very, very proud of what you've been able to draw out of that horrible experience you went through. Thank you. Take care of yourself, because these things don't go away. Yes. But Keep doing what you're doing Thank and you. do it with pride and confidence because you really shown today. Thank you. And uh, Jackson, may I use your first name as well? I just want to thank you as well. It may seem a little weird coming from 
an old guy across the podium, but um, when I was 13, I was about your size. And I know what it's like to be the small kid. And I just want you to know that when you spoke today, you were the biggest person in this room. And you did a wonderful, wonderful job. And you brought a really important message to us. So to you and to your family and friends who are here, congratulations. Well done. Please be proud and keep your voice. Thank you. Hunter, you and I have a, may I use your first name also? At some point, you know, you can say, no, I'd prefer you call me Mr. Lachance. No, Hunter's fine. Okay, Hunter's fine. You and I uh, share a similar predicament. We are the inhabitants of downwind states. Rhode Island, uh, like Maine, is a tailpipe state. And if it weren't for the EPA, there is nothing that our state environmental officials could do to protect us from out-of-state pollution, very often from coal-burning plants and so forth. And uh, we have the same situation you do. We have a lot of kids, and when the air gets bad, you often see them in the emergency room. You uh, have situations in Rhode Island where we're, you know, you're driving into work in the morning and it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. You should be out playing. You know these days. But on the radio, you hear, today's a bad air day. And we want little kids, we want old people, and we want people with breathing difficulties to stay inside on what otherwise would be a great day for you to be out swimming and playing sports and doing all those things. So the voice that you brought here was very, very important. Uh, to each of you, I would say um, part of the problem that I have in this whole nominations process is that you are up against enormously powerful forces on the other side. The National Rifle Association essentially has dominion over Congress with respect to everything that has to do with guns and the ammunition that tore through your friends. Um, the, I don't know what you'd call it, a mania, a fetish, an ideological crusade against providing your family with reliable health care simply makes no sense to me, and yet it's enormously powerful, and we came very, very close to a vote here where it would have been taken away from you. And so, um, and of course, the polluters have almost as much dominion around here in Congress as the NRA does. Um, they bring in phony scientists who quarrel with the real science because they're paid to quarrel, even if their science isn't real. And they do economic studies that only show the harm to the polluting companies and totally omit what it's like to be you on a day that you can't breathe except like through that little coffee straw. So this is a very one-sided place. And the forces that have the most money and that make the most money are able to use it here in ways that keep it very, very unbalanced. And my concern is that the current Republican majority on the Supreme Court and the decisions of Justice Kavanaugh reflect a desire to enhance that power, to defer decisions that the court could make into this very unbalanced forum, to diminish the regulatory agencies where there's the actual expertise to understand, say, how chlorofluorocarbons work or what a blue sky filing should look like for a new stock offering or complicated things like that. And so that's my biggest concern. And I'm not going to take any more time because I've, I've burned it all already. But I really, really was so impressed with each of the three of you. And I just wanted to say thank you. Well done. Don't ever give up. Those other forces may be big, but this is still our country. Thank you. As a public defender, you've spent your career representing defendants who don't have the money for a fancy law firm. Uh, yes. Or any kind of a law firm who may have been accused of some very serious misconduct. Now, when appearing before Judge Kavanaugh, have you ever felt that your client's economic status or situation or charge uh, conduct affected the judge's treatment of your client? 
No, I would say just the opposite, that they've always been treated without regard to any of those factors. So how, how have you ever had a case uh, where you felt your client's economic situation or charge conduct affected Judge Kavanaugh's decision in the case? I don't think it's ever affected his decision in the case. He examines the facts and the law and um, decides based on that without regard to those circumstances. Well, he, he as a judge is most well known for his jurisprudence on broad structural issues like the uh, separation of statutory interpretation or the, uh, well, sometimes his jurisprudence uh, on individual rights gets less attention. For example, his discussions of the importance of mens rea requirements, which I am very concerned about, and the problems, among many things, and the problems inherent in sentencing based on acquitted conduct. How has, the judge, how has Judge Kavanaugh contributed to criminal law and the rights of defendants? Well, especially in the acquitted conduct, he is bound by the Supreme Court precedent, but he has encouraged um, judges as a matter of discretion, which they have, to not use acquitted conduct uh, for sentence. He is, um, in a number of cases, some of which I've argued, um, on mens rea, he has uh, reversed convictions or noted uh, in concurrences that or dissents um, that he believes that people should not be uh, convicted of certain crimes without the proper mens rea, and he's uh, written a number of those cases. So I think in both of those areas, those are important individual rights for my clients. Well, thank you. Ms. Mahoney, uh, uh, you've known Judge Kavanaugh for over two decades since both of you were in the Solicitor General's office together uh, at the Justice Department. You've also appeared before him in court. Now, what kind of a jurist is he on the bench? Phenomenal. Um, I. I, um, Do you have an advantage because you had served with him before? <laughs> no, no, I, I'm sure it wasn't an advantage. Well, what's the matter with him? Yeah, <laughs> right, I'm sure it wasn't an advantage. He is um, extremely careful about his work um, and one of the harder, hardest working judges out there. Yeah. And that's the way he was in the Solicitor General's office too. Uh, he's kind of renowned for his work ethic, for trying to find an answer in the case. And I think he believes that if you look long enough and hard enough, in most cases, the answer is going to come, and it's just a product of doing the work. Well, that's great. How many other uh, lawyers who've worked with Judge Kavanaugh or argued cases before him? Uh, uh, you know, many of them. On uh, I, I don't. I, I know most of the appellate bar in Washington D.C. Many of them have argued before him. Many of them. Uh, know him from working with him either in the White what are House. Their, what are their opinions? I, I don't know anyone who doesn't put Judge Kavanaugh in just the highest category they can come up with. He is uh, he, he's, he's remarkable, um, and it, people uh, really adore him. I, I will tell you that you know around Washington, at least in, in my world, when people were debating who would be appointed to the Supreme Court, when Justice Kennedy uh, retired, the answer from almost everybody that I talked to was, well, it ought to be Brett Kavanaugh. So, I mean, this was, you know, this is the Supreme Court bar and the appellate bar in the Washington, D.C. area, but there is just really deep, uniform respect for him as a jurist and as a man. Everybody I know who knows him uh, speaks very glowingly of him. Glowingly. Just like you. Uniformly. Glowingly. Well, it seems to me he's precisely the type of person we want on the bench. It would be a travesty if he doesn't get 100 votes. Well, no, you put a lot of, <laughs> All right. You put a lot of pressure there on There you person. go. Just just do that. <laughs> Keep it up. I, I appreciate that. Right. We're happy to have all of you here. Uh, this is very important. Your testimonies all will be paid serious, given serious attention. Uh, Let's, who's next on this? Uh, uh, Blumenthal. Senator Blumenthal, you're next. Thank you, Senator Hatch. Uh, I want to join in thanking all of you for being here. This is another great panel. Uh, I want to join my colleague, uh, Senator Whitehouse, who very eloquently and powerfully thanked uh, Ayala Eastman and Jackson, Corbin and Hunter Lachance. You have really shown us how an individual voice 
can make such a difference. But I also want to thank uh, Melissa Smith for your comments on how a collective voice can be impactful. And a lot of young people would not have their individual voices, but for your service as a teacher, I've always thought that being a teacher, uh, along with being police, firefighter, emergency responders, you are the unsung heroes, our public service employees. I want to thank you for your personal testimony about the importance of, of the issues that matter in real lives to real people and have real impact. Thank you. And um, I want to ask Ayana Eastman, since we're talking about real people in real lives, uh, you know, in Connecticut we had Uh, we had a tragedy similar to the one you experienced. And uh, I lived through an afternoon and then a week similar to what you did in Parkland. Not the same firsthand experience that you did, but I saw the impact on loved ones and children and parents and teachers as you did, and I saw the impact on moms and dads like Fred Guttenberg, who was here earlier in the week, as you know, and you commented in your testimony about him. If I were Judge Kavanaugh, who, as you know, said that assault weapons should not be banned, cannot be banned under the Second Amendment of the Constitution, what would you say to him? that my life, along with all the other youth, is more important than that gun. And if he said to you, um, you know, there is this legal principle that says, unless there was a ban or one analogous to it at the time of our Constitution or traditionally in our law, what would you say about the real impact of that kind of assault weapon on your life? Yeah, it, it's unimaginable. The shooter at my school shot 34 kids in under six minutes. And that gun ended 17 lives on February 14th. That gun ended lives at Sandy Hook. That gun ended lives all over the country. And there's mass shootings that happen almost every month. And I believe that that gun needs to be banned, any assault rifle. And he needs to listen to us because our lives are just as important as any American's freedom to own a gun. Well, I hope that Judge Kavanaugh is listening to you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks so much to all of you for being here. Uh, my friend and colleague, Senator Kennedy from Louisiana, had to step out for a few minutes. Wasn't sure whether he'll be back in time, but he asked me to convey to you his gratitude uh, to each of you for your testimony and your willingness to provide insights. Uh, Ms. Mahoney, I'd like to start with you. Um, I uh, uh, heard mention a minute ago speculation about unfair advantage in court. And Senator Hatch, I can, I can tell you, she always has an unfair advantage in court because she's so good. <laughs> um, uh, you, you've always Senator. been one of my uh, favorite um, litigators to watch argue cases in the Supreme Court. It's an odd little uh, uh, hobby of mine, watching Supreme Court litigants, and uh, always enjoyed you uh, arguing. One of the things I've appreciated about your arguments is that you focus on the law. You focus on uh, what, uh, why your client's case is right. And you focus, you seem to have an approach that echoes something that you said a minute ago, which is that if you're willing to go to the hard work of finding the right answer in a case, you can find the right answer. The, the law will normally supply a correct answer, and you, you seem to believe that Judge Kavanaugh shares this view. Tell me how that can help um, instill a sense of civility among members of the bar and among jurists, uh, the belief that there's a right answer in the law. I, I, think, I think there is um, a right answer in the law. I think he believes that, and it, and it should instill a sense 
of confidence in the judiciary because there is sort of this pervasive view that the justices, or it's becoming more pervasive, that the justices are just partisans, you know, deciding for their team. And, um, and I certainly don't believe that's the case. I don't think that's what's going on. There are different ideologies, but I don't think it's partisanship. And I think that Justice Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, hopefully, uh, will perform his role in a way that people will understand that he is just working to get the answer. The way he asks questions, the way he probes evenly, uh, the way he uh, shows respect for, for everyone, uh, and the way he explains his decisions, and the way he surprises people sometimes with the way that he rules. Uh, you won't be happy. Republicans won't be happy every time. Democrats won't be happy every time. But it will be a product of his reasoning and his effort and his work in the case. And, and I think uh, Americans should be grateful for that kind of um, judicial approach, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And I would hope that we could get beyond some of this polarization. As someone who's devoted her career to arguing in front of the Supreme Court, you can confirm that there is no aisle. There's no political aisle. In there the is Supreme no Court. political aisle. And in no, fact, five to not. four decisions are very rare. They're very rare. Yes, they are. Um, uh, Ms. Tableson, uh, I, I appreciated your comments. I, I, having served as a, as a law clerk myself, I know that there's a special bond relationship that develops between a law clerk and uh, yeah, the, the judge or justice for whom the, the law clerk is working. Um, I, one of the reasons for that is you're able to interact with the, the jurist on a day-to-day -day basis, um, not only in seeing, uh, in your case, how Judge Kavanaugh interacted with uh, his law clerks, but also how he interacted with his colleagues. What can you tell us about what you saw and what, how that would portend for how he would interact with colleagues, regardless of their backgrounds and regardless of what some people might identify as their political ideologies? Certainly, Senator. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals is composed of uh, many judges who have diverse views on the law and on judicial philosophies more generally. But at least when I was there, their views of Judge Kavanaugh are not diverse. Instead, they uniformly respect him. They appreciate his collegiality, his civility, his hard work, and ultimately the fact that he's a straight shooter. Uh, he, there are certainly always going to be disagreements but those are disagreements that he has in good faith. There's no hidden agenda, nothing like that. He says what he means, and he means what he says. Right. I think on the Supreme Court, he is going to bring those same characteristics, and I think he's going to be um, sort of a uniter for that reason. I think he's going to bring out the best in uh, his fellow justices, should he be fortunate enough to be confirmed, and uh, is going to have great relationships with justices across the ideological spectrum. Thank you. Um, Ms. Smith, I have great respect for teachers. Both of my parents worked as educators in different capacities at different points in their careers. And uh, they always taught me to have great respect for my teachers, especially social studies teachers, because of the importance of uh, the subject matter you teach. Can you help, help me understand? Uh, I understand that uh, <coughs> resources are, are scarce and resources, more resources often need to be devoted to public education to make sure that you as a teacher and your colleagues, uh, those with whom you work, um, have the capacity to do your job to educate people. Help me understand the connection between <coughs> your concern for those resources and the jurisprudence. judge. One of my biggest concerns is his um, positions on public school vouchers, taking money from public education to give um, a few select people some, some choice, um, takes money from us um, to fund someone else's education. We will be left in my district with the majority of, of, our, of our same students um, with less funding than we have now. So when you say his position, you don't mean his policy position because he's acting not as a policymaker, but as a jurist deciding on whether or not something is lawful, deciding whether or not the policymakers are empowered to make that decision. Right, I isn't understand that, that. Isn't there a difference between those two things? Yes and no. We often believe that, that our, whether they be elected officials or judges are not supposed to bring their personal views into it and only base decisions on the laws, but um, it doesn't always seem like that's the case, maybe not with Judge Kavanaugh, but there's always a concern that personal views will um, influence judgment. 
Um, that's a concern that, that teachers have, that students have. And when he has publicly spoken in support of public school vouchers, um, that's a concern that we have. I see my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Senator Booker. I didn't mind if he kept going. I, 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 I didn't want to. I know I'm the last person, I think, sir. Well, I think we got another panel waiting. Oh, you do have another panel. I yeah. apologize. Okay. Um, for, uh, first of all, I just want to thank all the panelists for coming. Uh, I really do appreciate you participating in this process, and it's, it's extraordinarily helpful. Um, Elia, you, your testimony uh, was really heartbreaking and painful uh, to listen to, but you, the poise with which you spoke of something that I know is horrific and unimaginable was extraordinary. Thank extraordinary. You. Um, and, and there are specific policy things that you all are, are advocating for. Uh, I know I've met with lots of uh, the students from Parkland. Um, and I'm just wondering if you just give you another opportunity, not just because I also think you are an extraordinarily eloquent speaker. Thank you. Uh, um, but, but are there any particular policy issues that you all are advocating for that you can maybe speak to in a little more detail about what yeah. you'd like to see uh, uh, and how that relates to a Supreme Court justice? Yes. Right now we're focusing on an assault weapons ban because they are just unnecessary. Next year I'll be 18 and I could go get an assault rifle. Like why would I need that? And also um, high capacity magazines. We want those gone too. And also my focus, I really want people from the Congress to focus on the youth from black and brown communities because that's often the elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about and their lives are being taken away every single day. So I think focusing on the entire spectrum of gun violence and not only mass shootings, but the shootings that happen every day in urban, com urban communities are just as important. And I guess that's what spoke to me uh, a lot because uh, I live in a, a community with a, a, a lot of, uh, even though my incredible mayor has done a lot to lower the, the uh, uh, the shootings in my city, we still have a lot. I've had one on my block uh, just this year where somebody was murdered with an assault weapon at the top of the hill where I live. And uh, I appreciate your, your concerns about that and your advocacy extraordinary. And I think that for you and the other young people on this panel, you should know in many ways your voices um, uh, can be more powerful than any adult. And I, I just really want to thank uh, uh, everybody, all the three of you for being there. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Kramer. Um, you said uh, that, uh, General, you agree with me on criminal justice uh, issues? Yes. That's all I wanted to hear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sir. And also, That's no, good enough for me. <laughs> good enough for me as well. Um, no, sir. Uh, uh, the, the, can you just give me that under... Uh, that, I tried to make a point yesterday about the balance of power shifting in, America, in American law. I mean, we, we seem to have a, a, a right to a jury, but that seems to me, and this, I'm not saying you should agree with me on this, I just want to hear your real opinion on it, it's really shifting dramatically because uh, in a plea bargain, which is not really a fair bargain, but now prosecutors have a lot more of a, of a threat of jeopardy uh, to, offer, uh, to offer that makes often uh, people take a plea bargain because they're too afraid of going to trial. And when they go, do go to trial, the, su the chances for success are pretty, are pretty low. And, and, and I know that uh, um, the f criminal... Uh, 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 d public defenders often will let people know what the reality is. Is that, is that shift in our American uh, uh, criminal justice system happening? Senator Booker, that's a great question, um, and absolutely. I think you know the statistics. Over 97% of the cases in federal court pleaded guilty last year, and, and similar statistics in state court. And I would not call it a plea bargain. I would call it a plea imposition. Um, the terms are given. You take it. because, And you're absolutely right about mandatory minimum sentences skewing the power in the system, uh, it's all in the prosecutor's hands. I've been around for a long time and seen a huge power shift as a result of sentencing guidelines, mandatory minimums, and just draconian sentences, especially of people of color. It's affected uh, disproportionately. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. There's been a huge shift. Yeah, and that's the painful thing for me is I see young kids getting caught up for drug crimes that kids in privileged communities, you know, I too went to Yale, I went to Stanford, Lots of drugs, lots of drugs. Um, I will not make any con personal confessions right now, but lots of <laughs> drugs. Um, uh, and, and so here are kids getting charges for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing, and then they're presented with a plea. I've had young kids sit in my office and say, uh, look, I was terrified facing 10 years stacked mandatory minimums. This guy told me I can get out right now, and then I end up with a then I end up with a criminal conviction, but they don't realize that's a lifetime sentence. 
And, and so I guess, just can you make this point for me, uh, that this idea of a right to a jury trial, that's kind of being eroded in the United States of America. Would, would you agree with me? I, I would call it a disappearing right, Senator Booker. And um, also, I think you're absolutely right. And since you didn't make any confessions, I don't feel I have to make any either. You're good. Um, but um, but you're right. There's You're talking about the neighborhoods. There are tactics in various neighborhoods that if they were um, engaged in, in other neighborhoods in the cities or suburbs, that would just be the the they would not be tolerated by the population there, but because of a powerless population in the neighborhoods where it does occur. And and you're, so you're right on both points about the tactics that occur in various neighborhoods, and you're absolutely right about the disappearance of the of the jury trial. Okay, thank you. My time's expired. I just want to say something uh, to Mr. Christmas because I've met Mr. Mr. Christmas and I know have previous we've met each other before. And, and I just want to testify to your character uh, because it's a t you said something it was, he said something that was really, I think, really important uh, about uh, the partisanship and the tribalism uh, often and, and how friendships are tested that you were speaking to what you know of him as a friend, not as a, as a judge, uh, but as a, as a friend. And I want to appreciate that. And I, I want to make an open offer for you because you said you stopped playing basketball because your age. The Senate has a basketball game, and I promise you, uh, there are age appropriate of, of us that, that can play, and you probably would be like Michael Jordan if you came and played amongst us. <laughs> I'll do my best. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have uh, two things left uh, for this panel. Senator Kennedy, you wanted some time, and then uh, Senator, uh, uh, well, now we'll have, we'll have, I guess we're going to have Senator Arono, too. Go ahead, Senator Kennedy. Um, I had to step out for a few minutes, but I, I, I heard your testimony, uh, each of you, and I just want to thank you for it. And I know you each spent a lot of time putting the testimony together. The stuff doesn't just write itself. Um, I, I was mentioned to the earlier panel. I, um, I, I enjoy this, this immensely. I learn a lot from listening to your different perspectives. And I just want to thank you. Oh, no, doesn't want to be recognized. Well, Mr. Chairman, I have questions for the next panel, but yes. I certainly thank this panel yes. for being here. Uh, I'm going, for courtesy to the ranking member, uh, he wants to speak for a minute to some people on the panel. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman. I just wanted to make one point because there's so much uh, discussion about mens rea, and I just wanted to provide what I see as some context uh, for this. Um, I've read uh, Judge Kavanaugh's decisions on mens rea, which have focused so far on individual defendants and very often individual defendants who faced very significant terms of incarceration. And I see no objection whatsoever in any of uh, the decisions that I've read of his. Um, I have also been at the center of the effort to try to negotiate a sentencing and reentry reform package along with Senator Cornyn and Senator Grassley and uh, Senator Booker and Senator Lee and others. And as we did that, what began to pop up and what popped up through uh, big industry funded groups was a late arriving desire to reform mens rea. And the obvious motive for that is a, a, a group of offenses, a category of offenses, that are called public welfare offenses. And those are offenses in which we say, particularly about a dangerous instrumentality, like a pollutant or benzene or dynamite or something like that, that at some point, if you're a big corporation and something really goes wrong, you spill your 10,000th barrel, that's a crime. And we don't care what your mens rea, what your degree of intent is, your job as a big corporation that pollutes or has dangerous things is to make sure that doesn't happen. That's why we put that marker out there. And it's a very well-established type of criminal conduct, is it not, Mr. Kramer? Yes, absolutely. Uh, public regulatory offenses like that, there are, they are, there's a number of them that, right, that have no mens rea requirement. And my worry, and I'll just put this out, this is, there is a marker, and this will be telling if it happens, is if this body of precedent that Judge Kavanaugh is building up with respect to individual defendants who face significant terms of incarceration, all of a sudden has a very big morph 
and suddenly becomes the basis for an attack on these public welfare offenses. I've seen that maneuver begin to happen in Congress, and if it starts to happen in the courts, to me at least, that would be another telling sign of the big influencers and interests that operate so much of uh, what happens in our court systems coming in to seize a prize, and I hope that we don't go there. If you, you want me to, to respond comment briefly, I don't want to. Uh, uh, no, you uh, go uh, ahead and respond. Briefly. The only thing I can say, and, and um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about, is that um, Judge Kavanaugh, the opinions he's written are in cases that have a mens rea requirement, knowing, willfully, and I have never seen him write that it should be extended to public with, he's in, in other words, he's um, uh, going with the will of Congress and what Congress enacted, and I've never seen him take that step in an opinion. And of, I hope he never does. Of, of a case of a crime without a mens rea requirement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once again, even though I thanked you once, uh, we know you go to a lot of work to do this for uh, the people of this country and the Senate in the consideration of this nomination. Thank you very much, and you're dismissed. Uh, <coughs> <the coughs> How are you doing? All right, Corey. <coughs> Come on, Buka. I don't, I don't want to ruin them for those kids, yeah. otherwise I'd yell at them. <laughs> Would the people of the second panel, or the, the last panel, come to the table, please? <clears throat> uh, before I introduce the next panel and swear the next panel, uh, I want to take the opportunity to uh, give uh, appreciation from the chairman of the committee. 
uh, for our, all the staff work that goes into this. And uh, I've been fortunate as a senator to have an outstanding staff over many years, and I hope they know how much I appreciate them, both committee staff and personal office. Uh, before closing this hearing today, I'd like to name staffers specifically assigned to work on this nomination hearing. Uh, some are my permanent staff led by Chief Counsel for Nominations, Mike Davis, and including Laura, Lauren Mailer, Steve Kenny, Jessica Vu, and Catherine Willey. And then others are here only temporarily because we get additional resources when we have a, a uh, Supreme Court nominee, so I want to name them and say thank you for their extraordinary work and commitment to public service. Um, the special counsels added specifically for this Supreme Court nomination were led by Andrew Ferguson and included Tyler uh, Badgley, uh, Lucas Crossflow, uh, Colleen Ernst, uh, Megan McGlynn, and Colin uh, White. The law clerks uh, were uh, Camille, Peoples, Abby Hollenstein, Tim Rodriguez, Dario Camacho, <coughs> Elizabeth Donald, Bob Minchin, Nathan Williams, Sam Atkinson, Nick Gallagher, Michael Talent, Asher Perez, Garrett Ventry, as did Jacob Raymer as an intern. So I thank the legal team for their important part in the Senate's consideration of Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, uh, I think before I introduce you, I would ask that you stand so I can swear you, please. Uh, do, do you swear that the testimony uh, you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I help you, God? Thank you all very much. I know a lot of you here. Uh, names I recognize, you're famous around town and famous in history, so I probably won't do uh, justice uh, to, uh, your nom uh, to your introduction. Uh, Monica Masto is a real estate agent, Washington, D.C. She's known Judge Kavanaugh for 25 years. Uh, John Dean, who I've known not as a person, but I've known uh, since before I even got to Congress, uh, by his reputation, served as Richard Nixon's White House Counsel from 1970 to 1973. And then, of course, a famous lawyer, Paul Clement, is a partner of Kirk, Kirtland and, and Alice, served as Solicitor General of the United States <coughs> 2005 to 2008, and has argued over 90 cases before the Supreme Court. Judge Kavanaugh and Mr. Clement clerked at the same time on the Supreme Court. Judge K Kavanaugh clerked for Justice Kennedy, and the justices whose big shoes Judge Kavanaugh is nominated to fill when Mr. Clement clerked for the late Justice Scalia. Professor Rebecca Ingber, I hope that's right, is an assistant professor of law, Boston University School of Law. Uh, professor Adam White has uh, had me on panels with an organization he's with, and he's also from Iowa, uh, but not, not right now from Iowa, but was born in Dubuque, Iowa. By the way, I talked about you in my opening statement this morning. Uh, Senator uh, Professor Adam White is assistant professor at George Mason Scalia Law School and is executive director of C. Boyd and Gray Center for the Study of Administrative State. He is also a research fellow at the Hoover Institution and a member of the Administrative Con Conference of the United States. And uh, I also had a chance to meet your parents about an hour ago. Uh, and they uh, out, came out just especially for you. Uh, Professor Lisa Heinzerling, is that right? Uh, is a Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Professor Jennifer Maskett, served as a law clerk for Judge Kavanaugh from 2006 to 2007 and went on to clerk uh, for Justice Clarence Thomas, Supreme Court. She's an assistant professor of law at George Mason Scalia Law School and is of counsel to the law firm of Consul Voy McCarthy Park. 
Professor Peter Shane is uh, Jacob E. Davis, and Jacob E. Davis is second chair in law at the Ohio State <coughs> University, Moritz College of Law. So uh, will you proceed, uh, Ms. Mastall? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, I am honored to be here today to address you in support of my friend and my daughter's favorite coach, the Honorable Brett Kavanaugh. My testimony today will not be from a legal perspective, but from a personal and parental perspective. Consider it more about the person than the nominee. I have known Judge Kavanaugh for many years, but in recent years have seen him on a regular basis thanks to his position as the coach of the CYO girls fifth and sixth grade basketball team at Blessed Sacrament School. In our house, he is not known as Judge Kavanaugh, but as Coach K. He was my daughter's coach for two years. Our first year, his daughter was in fourth grade and therefore ineligible for the team. He still coached. In my book, that alone qualifies him for sainthood. As a high school and college player, Coach K had the job prerequisite of basketball knowledge. More importantly, however, he had the other necessary attributes of patience, fairness, and diplomacy, and he had them in spades. Fairness with young players and opposing teams, patience with boisterous parents, and diplomacy with referees who are on their fifth game of the day and making some questionable calls. In the few hours a week of practices and games, Judge Kavanaugh teaches much more than the fundamentals of basketball. All of the other important concepts were there too. Teamwork, hard work, commitment, setting and achieving goals, and striving to be your best. It is an enormous task to communicate all of that to young girls in so little time. But his calm demeanor got the message across. No yelling or gavel was necessary. Of course, the Kavanaugh's contribution to our community extends beyond basketball. School auctions, food drives, and service projects are abundant at Blessed Sacrament, and Brett and Ashley are always there to participate. This leads me to another personal perspective. Brett is relatable to everyday Americans. In the public eye, Supreme Court justices are strictly cerebral, ethical, humble, and courageous. He is all of those things, but I am one of the everyday Americans who sees him getting his children to practice, managing four games a weekend, serving as a lector at church, running on the high school track, and socializing with friends. As my final note today, I would like to read Coach Kavanaugh's final note to my daughter from his end of the season player evaluation. I share this with the utmost confidence that every player on the team received the same honest, appreciative, supportive, heartfelt, and confidence building message. It stated, thanks Mary Grace, you are an excellent athlete and were a great contributor to the team. We loved your spirit and attitude. We really enjoyed coaching you and wish you all the best. We look forward to having you on the team next year. Keep up your great spirit, attitude, and work ethic, and you will be a big success in all you do. It kind of makes me want to go back to fifth grade basketball. Thank you for the opportunity to share this personal perspective. As the great UCLA basketball coach John Wooden said, young people need models, not critics. I think this final note says it all as to the model Coach Kavanaugh has been to our children. I know the parents of his players feel as fortunate as I do that our girls had such a wonderful mentor. Through basketball, he taught them the skills they will need not only for a season, but for a lifetime. Thank you. Mr. Dean. Mr. Chairman. Ranking member, members of the committee, thank you for the invitation. In my allotted time, I'd like to take a few points from the statement I've submitted for the record. I've made two overriding points in that submitted statement. First, if Judge Kavanaugh joins the court, it will be 
the most presidential powers friendly court in the modern era. Republicans and conservatives only a few years ago, I know well, fought the expansion of presidential power and executive powers. That's no longer true. Judge Kavanaugh has a very broad view of presidential powers. For example, he would have the Congress immunize sitting presidents from both civil and criminal liability. Under Judge Kavanaugh's recommendation, if a president shot somebody in cold blood on Fifth Avenue, that president could not be prosecuted while in office. Also, it's not clear to me, listening to the testimony, that he really believes Nixon, or U.S. versus Nixon, was correctly decided. A second general point from my uh, uh, submission, a very vital, I think, process point. Ranking member Diane Feinstein stated on the morning of September 4th, just before the hearings opened, that after participating in nine Supreme Court confirmations, it had never been so difficult to get access to background documents relating to a nominee as in the current proceedings. Unsuccessfully, the minority sought to postpone the, these hearings until all the requested documents were provided. The chair, however, declined to consider the motion that would make review possible. This committee is deeply involved in the final phase of vetting Supreme Court nominees. Based on personal experiences with the confirmation, for example, of Ren William Rehnquist and studying the confirmation of Clarence Thomas, it's clear there was an across-the-board failure to fully vet the nominees, and it has haunted their careers on the court, it's hurt the court, and the American people. Because of the withholding of documents, Judge Kavanaugh may be traveling the same path as Rehnquist and Thomas. When writing a book that I did several years ago, The Rehnquist Choice, I explained how Rehnquist was selected by Nixon as one of the two uh, for two openings that occurred in 1971. I also reported my sad discovering that Rehnquist had dissembled during his confirmation proceedings. He did, however, notwithstanding false statements, become uh, an associate justice. When Ronald Reagan nominated him to be chief justice in, 90, in 1986, again, he was not vetted. And there, in those hearings, he was confronted not only with his earlier false statements, but new material that resulted in new false statements. All the court historians that I have examined and court scholars find clear and convincing evidence that Mr. Rehnquist lied at his two confirmation proceedings. This hurt him and it hurt the court. Because Justice Thomas was not fully vetted, his career on the court has been under a cloud as well. Thomas's truthfulness vis-a-vis -vis Professor Anita Hill's claims of sexual harassment have never been fully resolved, nor has the controversy ever ended. A definitive study of this controversy was undertaken in 1994 by journalists Jane Mayer and Jill Abramson, Strange Justice, the selling of Clarence Thomas. They found per a preponderance of evidence supported Anita Hill's claims. This controversy has received renewed attention with the Me Too movement, which is growing stronger and it's not going to disappear. In fact, Justice Thomas's truthfulness is an issue in this year's midterm election. A Democratic candidate in Massachusetts has made an impeachment of Thomas for his false claims during his confirmation, one of the planks of her campaign. In closing, Judge Kavanaugh's nomination has raised issues about the truth truthfulness of his confirmation to become a judge on the D.C. Circuit. His answers to this committee have not resolved the issue. Frankly, I'm surprised that Judge Kavanaugh is not demanding that every document that he's ever handled be reviewed by this committee, unless, of course, there's something to hide. Thank you. Oh, uh, Mr. Clement. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, Senator Whitehouse, and members of the committee. It's a great pleasure and honor to return to the Senate Judiciary Committee, where I served as a staffer some two decades ago. It is an even greater pleasure and honor to be here today to testify in support of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination to the Supreme Court of the United States. 
Judge Kavanaugh and I first met some 25 years ago when we clerked at the Supreme Court together during the same term for different justices. Although the law clerks were an impressive bunch, Brett immediately stood out. Unlike most of the rest of us, whose legal experience consisted of a single appellate clerkship, Brett came to a Supreme Court clerkship with two clerkships under his belt already on the Ninth and Third Circuits, and he had also served as a Bristow Fellow in the Office of the Solicitor General, where he spent a year following the court closely and working on briefs and oppositions and other Supreme Court filings. As a result, while the rest of us were feeling our way rather blindly, through the process of preparing our first pool memos and sorting through our first sets of briefs, Brett was already fully versed in the court's certiorari criteria, rules, and even stood ready to handicap the likely quality of upcoming oral arguments by members of the Supreme Court bar. Brett quickly came to be seen by his fellow law clerks as a resource on everything from the minutia of Supreme Court practice to matters of high constitutional doctrine. But what really stood out about Brett was not just his knowledge of the court and the law, but the undeniable fact that he was a well-rounded, likable, and unpretentious person. You expect a Supreme Court law clerk to have a first-rate legal mind. You do not necessarily expect a Supreme Court law clerk to have a sweet jump shot. I can tell you from firsthand experience that Brett had both. He was as comfortable talking about how to break a full court press as he was discussing the Rooker-Feldman doctrine. For all these reasons, Brett was admired by fellow clerks from all chambers and across ideological lines. None of us was the least surprised to see him become the first of our ranks to argue a Supreme Court case and the first to become a federal appellate court judge, beating out judge Justice Gorsuch by a nose. Judge Kavanaugh and I became friends during our clerkship year and have remained friends ever since. But I am not here today testifying out of friendship. Rather, I am testifying today because of what I have seen in observing Judge Kavanaugh in his over 12 years of service on the federal appellate bench. By happenstance, I was in the courtroom to witness one of Judge Kavanaugh's first oral arguments as an appellate judge. He was incredibly well prepared. He demonstrated a mastery of the record and asked penetrating questions of both sides. He carefully listened to the arguing attorney's answers as well as the questions emanating from his more seasoned colleagues. None of this surprised me, but I was struck by the fact that he's expressing this mastery of the record and a profound interest in the legal arguments in the context of a petition for review from a decision of the Federal Energy Re Regulatory Commission, or FERC. Now, at least in my days as a law clerk on the DC Circuit, FERC cases were not among the most coveted by the law clerks or the judges. FERC cases were notoriously complex, with long administrative records filled with strange acronyms in doctrines unknown in other areas of the law. I feared for my friend Judge Kavanaugh that he would be saddled with the assignment of the FERC case while his more senior colleagues authored opinions in higher profile cases addressing more readily accessible doctrines. While my fears were realized, I'm quite sure that Judge Kavanaugh did not mind. As I've seen in the ensuing 12 years, he approaches every case with the same thorough approach, regardless to the amount in controversy, <coughs> the degree of notoriety, or the agency involved. He recognizes that each case is the most important case for the clients and lawyers involved and treats each case accordingly. Let me close with just a few words about judicial temperament. The concept has been much discussed in the course of other judicial confirmation hearings, but the topic has received less attention in the course of these particular hearings because Judge Kavanaugh has so plainly demonstrated the requisite judicial temperament over his years on the DC Circuit. That said, I believe it is a mistake to think of judicial temperament as if it is a binary characteristic, something a judicial candidate either has or lacks. Instead, there are degrees of judicial temperament. And I'm here to tell you, based on my own experience arguing in front of Judge Kavanaugh, that Judge Kavanaugh has judicial temperament in spades. He is respectful of counsel in both his demeanor and in his level of preparation and engagement. Nothing is more to discouraging to litigants or their clients than a cold or underprepared bench. There is no fear of that with Judge Kavanaugh. He understands that appellate cases are serious businesses for the parties involved and prepares accordingly. So I think based on my experience knowing him just as a friend and as a judicial colleague, as a judicial uh, officer, by any conventional measure, I believe he is enormously qualified to serve on the nation's highest court. I'm confident he will serve with distinction 
and I urge you to vote for his confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Clement. Now, Professor Ingber. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, and distinguished committee members. It is an honor to testify before you today. My name is Rebecca Ingber. I'm an associate professor at the Boston University School of Law, and previously I served in the State Department Office of the Legal Advisor, where I worked with colleagues at the Departments of Justice and Defense in the intelligence community and at the White House on matters involving international law and war and executive power. So my testimony today will focus on Judge Kavanaugh's jurisprudence in these areas. Judge Kavanaugh has clearly had an exceptional career and has many obvious strengths. But I believe there are some concerns his jurisprudence raises that should be addressed before final consideration of his nomination. <coughs> in particular, and as I explore in more detail in my written remarks, Judge Kavanaugh's opinions reveal that he is exceedingly reluctant to impose checks on the president's powers in the national security sphere. Now, this is not an area where Judge Kavanaugh has merely followed precedent with his hands tied. To take one prominent example, in a case involving the president's authority over detainees at Guantanamo Bay, <clears throat> Judge Kavanaugh wrote an 87-page separate opinion to argue that the court should not look to international law to inform the president's war powers, a position that is contrary to over two centuries of settled precedent. In fact, all three branches of government have long looked to international law to define war powers over the entire course of this nation's history. When Congress authorizes the president to use all necessary and appropriate force, it does so against the backdrop of that history. The Supreme Court has ratified this understanding repeatedly, including in opinions that look to international law both to read the president's powers expansively and to interpret the outer limits on those powers. They did just that in Hamdi v. Rumsfeld, which Justice Kennedy joined, which looked to international law to find that the 2001 statute authorizing the president to use military force also authorizes detention as well as limits on that detention. And perhaps because these rules have always guided our understanding, international law is one of the only tools the courts and the political branches have for interpreting war powers. Thus, it is often the only limiting principle for interpreting the outer bounds of the president's wartime authorities. Now, I want to clarify a misconception about international law. These are not rules imposed on us by some outside source. The international laws of, rule of, the international laws of war, for example, are rules that we have affirmatively chosen to be bound by, specifically in wartime, and which the United States, including the US military, has always played a principal role in shaping. These are rules that benefit our military as well as all of us. These rules are so built into the national ethos that we may forget they derive from international law. For example, we know that it is unlawful for the president to kill families of terrorism suspects. Why? because the international laws of war prohibit the targeting of civilians, and we have always interpreted the president's authority to wage war in light of those rules. If the Supreme Court were to adopt Judge Kavanaugh's position on this or other areas where he has invoked national security to dismiss the court's role in checking the president, the result would be that the president could wield nearly unreviewable discretion when he invokes war or national security. For my time in government, I know there's a great deal of thoughtful decision-making and robust process that happens inside the national security apparatus. But I also saw firsthand the importance of the court's role in checking presidential power, even when the president invokes war or national security. Mistakes happen. Bad decisions may come about through incompetence, through insufficiency of facts, exigency, and even, yes, through the intentional abuse of power. Even a robust process can lead to presidential overreach. After all, the premise of the separation of powers is that each branch will seek to enhance its own authority. And the other branches, including the courts, are there to impose limits. Moreover, while Judge Kavanaugh would have the courts defer broadly to the president in this area, the reality is that the executive branch looks to the courts to understand the parameters of its authority. When a judge defers broadly to the position that the government takes in court, a position taken not under the best view of the law standard, but rather that of a defensive litigant trying to win its case, the court's deference often has the result of a merits decision. And that becomes the law for the executive branch going forward. If the courts never, if the courts never push back on the government's litigation positions, 
The result is a one-way ratchet of expanding executive power. And because so much of executive branch decision-making in this realm happens in secret, accountability through public scrutiny alone is often insufficient. Judicial review is at times the only means of holding the president accountable. For these reasons and those in my written testimony, I urge you to consider the dangers in a judicial approach that cedes to the president unreviewable discretion in this realm. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'd be pleased to answer any questions the committee has. Thank you, Professor. Now, Professor White. Uh, thank you. Chairman Grassley, Ranking Member Whitehouse, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify in support of Judge Kavanaugh's nomination. Uh, Ch Chairman Grassley, as you very kindly mentioned, uh, my first education in civics and history came from the teachers in Dubuque, Iowa, and the University of Iowa. <coughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here today, a great honor to discuss Judge Kavanaugh's own deep appreciation for our Constitution and the rule of law, as exemplified by his 12 years of service on the D.C. Circuit, 300-plus judicial opinions, and a deep record of legal scholarship. His record is particularly impressive on questions of administrative law, that is, the body of law that governs administrative agencies and defines the agency's relationships with Congress, with the courts, with the president, and with the people. In my longer written testimony, I focus on four important aspects of Judge Kavanaugh's approach to administrative law. Today, I'd like to highlight two issues in particular. The first involves doctrines of judicial deference to administrative agencies' legal interpretations. Not long ago, skeptics of judicial deference were found primarily on the left. Now, increasingly, judicial deference also finds critics on the right. Uh, I'd like to echo uh, a lot of Professor Engler's comments towards the end of her testimony on the inherent challenges and problems of judicial, excessive judicial deference to the executive branch, not just in, in matters of foreign policy and national security, but also with respect to executive regulatory agencies. But throughout his time on the D.C. Circuit, Judge Kavanaugh has faithfully applied the Supreme Court's increasingly complex approach to judicial deference, including Chevron deference, especially in recent cases involving agencies claiming immense new regulatory powers under the guise of decades-old statutes. My second point today goes to the, to the design of administrative agencies. From time to time, Congress has passed laws giving a certain degree of independence to the leadership of federal regulatory commissions or to other officers by limiting the president's ability to fire those officers at will. Making officers independent from the president raises profound constitutional questions because, as Professor Amar uh, explained this morning, the Constitution vests the president with executive power, the Constitution obligates the president to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, and when you break that link of accountability between officers and the president, you undermine both of those constitutional commitments. So on the limited occasions where the Supreme Court has affirmed statutes giving regulatory commissions or other officers a measure of independence, it has done so carefully and subject to crucial limits. Judge Kavanaugh has followed those judicial precedents very carefully in cases where Congress improperly attempted to vest even greater independence in newly created regulatory agencies beyond the limits previously allowed by the Supreme Court. And this includes the PHH case, as Professor Amar noted this morning. In applying those Supreme Court precedents, Judge Kavanaugh has, attra has attracted criticism from those who would like to see administrative agencies be made even less accountable to the courts, the President, and the Congress. Now, in an era when agencies are often eager to enact policies that Congress hasn't legislated, some of Judge Kavanaugh's critics favor those energetic agencies over Congress. And in a system where an elected president might disagree with the policy preferences of an administrative agency, some of Judge Kavanaugh's critics favor making the agencies independent from the president rather than accountable to the president. And in an era when the administrative agencies have been increasingly eager to impose unprecedented and immense regulatory programs despite the lack of clear legislative authorization, some of Judge Kavanaugh's critics favor judges becoming more deferential to agencies, not less. I think Judge Kavanaugh, in applying the Supreme Court's precedents under the Constitution, has the better of these arguments. His approach, in my opinion, is administrative law at its best, empowering agencies to administer the laws efficiently and effectively, but always subject to the deeper fundamental commitments of our Constitution's structure and rights. For that reason, I hope that you will give your advice and consent to the, to the appointment of Judge Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. 
Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Professor White. Now, Heinz, uh, Professor Heinz early. Microphone. Uh, push the red button or whatever color the button is. Thank you, Chairman Grassley and uh, Ranking Member Whitehouse for inviting me to testify here today. My name is Lisa Heinzerling, and I'm the Justice William J. Brennan, Jr. Professor of Law at Georgetown University. I will testify about J Judge Kavanaugh's views on administrative law. They're somewhat different from the views we've just heard. Administrative agencies are at the heart of administrative law. These agencies are the institutions you know by their initials the EPA, the FDA, the FTC, the FCC, and so on. They are the institutions that do the day-to-day -day work of government, staffed by experts, created and set in motion by Congress, and subject to requirements of public input and reason giving. Administrative agencies combine expertise, politics, and deliberation in a way other institutions do not. They are responsible for everything from addressing air pollution to enforcing rules against financial fraud. They are essential to the daily business of government. Judge Kavanaugh would limit the ability of Congress to structure and empower administrative agencies to do this important work. He would eliminate Congress's power to provide agencies with some measure of independence from the president by protecting their top officials from being fired for political reasons. <clears throat> he would also erase Congress's power to give agencies legal authority to deal with the most important problems we face unless Congress speaks with precise and crystalline clarity. His opinions stating these views read as if they are addressed to the administrative agencies themselves, but make no mistake. Judge Kavanaugh's sites are trained on Congress and its power to structure and empower administrative agencies. Judge Kavanaugh believes that the basic problem with the structure of government today is that the president has too little power and that Congress has too much. <coughs> Judge Kavanaugh believes that one of the constitutionally guaranteed powers of the president is the power to fire agency fish officials for any reason he deems sufficient, even where Congress has made a different choice. Yet long-standing Supreme Court precedent confirms Congress's constitutional power to create agencies that are relatively independent from the president. Judge Kavanaugh's approach to this precedent has been to treat it grudgingly and read it narrowly. Once on the Supreme Court, Judge Kavanaugh would be able to cast this precedent aside and in doing so, restructure modern government. The result would be a super powerful president, a diminished Congress, and a corrosion of the checking and balancing that the Constitution contemplates. Under Judge Kavanaugh's constitutional theory, the president would be able to exercise undiluted control over all of the administrative agencies. Ironically, Judge Kavanaugh has thus taken an instrument that is aimed at checking concentrated power, that is, the separation of powers, and turned it into an instrument calibrated to increase the power of the already most powerful person in the government. Judge Kavanaugh also has a cramped view of Congress's power to delegate crucial jobs to administrative agencies. He has indicated that his preference would be to discard or dra drastically pare back longstanding precedent giving agencies deference when they interpret statutes that Congress has charged them with implementing. The result would be uncertainty and disruption as agencies, citizens, and courts adjusted to a wholly new approach to statutory interpretation. Even more damaging, however, is Judge Kavanaugh's view that Congress may not empower an agency to issue a major rule, that is a rule that has great political and economic significance, without giving the agency a precise and crystal clear instruction to that effect. This interpretive approach would perversely disable agencies in the very circumstances in which we need them the most. It would skew statutory interpretation against agencies' power to undertake protective regulatory programs that run counter to Judge Kavanaugh's own political preferences. And it demands a legislative clarity that Judge Kavanaugh himself has said is difficult to achieve. Worst of all, it is quite clear that Judge Kavanaugh would apply his strict new principle of interpretation only to affirmative regulatory initiatives and not to deregulation or failure to regulate. This is not a neutral principle. Judge Kavanaugh often says that his motivating force is the protection of individual liberty, but the liberty Judge Kavanaugh embraces is badly skewed and terribly small. It is the liberty of powerful groups to do their business unhindered by government rather than the liberty that comes from meaningful government protections against harmful human behavior. In the name of liberty, Judge Kavanaugh has rejected rules addressing toxic air pollution, climate change, workplace safety, and financial fraud. 
without acknowledging that in such cases, liberty sits on both sides of the legal question. There is on one side the liberty of regulated groups to go about their business unimpeded by federal law. There is on the other the liberty of the rest of us to go about our lives at home, at work, at school, and in our communities with the reasonable assurance that the government has our back in protecting us against coming to harm at other people's hands. Thank you. Thank you, for Professor. Now, Professor Mascot. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> Ranking Member Whitehouse, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored to speak in support of my mentor and former boss, Judge Kavanaugh, and to share with you why I believe he'd be an outstanding Supreme Court Justice. So my testimony will highlight three aspects of Judge Kavanaugh's character and judicial service. First, his commitment to mentorship and consideration of diverse perspectives. Next, his fair-minded and careful consideration of legal questions. And then finally, his commitment to following the law independent of personal policy preferences. These are qualities that I've witnessed firsthand as Judge Kavanaugh's law clerk and then as a student of his opinions over the years. I served as a law clerk to Judge Kavanaugh during his first year on the bench. And already at that time, Judge Kavanaugh demonstrated a commitment to seeking out diverse perspectives. Our group of four clerks came from different parts of the country, had diverse racial backgrounds, grew up among distinct religious traditions, and graduated from Ivy League as well as non-Ivy League law schools. Judge Kavanaugh's decision to hire our group of clerks showed his value for perspectives of people from different walks of life. And the judge values hard work, achievement, and determination not any specific pedigree. We routinely had lively discussions in the judge's chambers as he prepared each month for oral arguments. The judge encouraged us to ask tough questions of him as he prepared and to debate legal issues with him and with each other. The judge wanted to hear and consider all sides of an issue, apply the law fairly, and help train us to bring more rigor and precision to our legal analysis. Skills that have stayed with me throughout my career so far, and now as a law professor, I view it as part of my job to pass along those skills to another generation of students. In addition to training us professionally, the judge also mentored us on a more personal level. We had regular lunches with the judge where we discussed our families, our professional aspirations, sports. Judge and Mrs. Kavanaugh had us in their home for dinner during the holiday season, a tradition that continued for many years. And Judge Kavanaugh's devotion to training and mentoring female and male leaders in the legal profession does not conclude at the end of a clerkship in his chambers. He's remained a close mentor to me, providing advice at every major point in my career since the end of my clerkship more than 11 years ago. And Judge Kavanaugh also branches out to assist young lawyers far beyond the four corners of his clerk community. He presides over student moot court proceedings, he speaks to student associations, and regularly teaches courses to students on law school campuses. Judge Kavanaugh's record of mentoring young lawyers and his practice of hiring law clerks with diverse life experiences demonstrate his commitment to giving back to the legal profession and show that he has an open mind. Judge Kavanaugh knows the impact that members of the judiciary can have on the legal profession, the state of the law, and individuals in the real world. Judges take an oath to decide cases according to the law and the Constitution, but care for people and the legal system in its entirety can make a jurist a more careful, modest, and thoughtful judge. Judge Kavanaugh's determination to consider all relevant issues and hear discussions from all sides also shows his humility and his commitment to equal justice under the law. During my clerkship, he approached each case with the same level of care, regardless of the identity of the litigants or the legal issues presented. He considered all relevant statutes, precedent, and history. And he was conscientious when writing his opinions. He'd worked through scores of drafts, wanting his opinions to be precise clearly written, and accessible to litigants and the public. In the years since clerking for the judge, I've become a professor who teaches and writes in the areas of administrative law and the constitutional separation of powers. And serving as a clerk for Judge Kavanaugh <coughs> prepared me to analyze issues rigorously, write carefully, consider all sides of an issue. Judge Kavanaugh's fair application of the law, his mentorship of young lawyers, and his commitment to constitutional principles and an independent judiciary demonstrate, I believe, that he'd be an excellent Supreme Court justice. I strongly support his confirmation. Thank you. Professor Shane, thank you. Professor Mascot. Thank you, Chairman Grassley, Senator Whitehouse, and distinguished committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. This committee's consideration of any potential Supreme Court justice 
inevitably immerses you in profound constitutional issues. No issue before you now is more important than Judge Brett Kavanaugh's approach to questions of presidential power and accountability. One straightforward constitutional principle frames any sound analysis of these questions. That principle is that no one, including the president, is above the law. My concern is that Judge Kavanaugh, both on and off the bench, has crusaded for an extreme interpretation of the president's constitutional powers that could effectively undermine a president's accountability to law and to this Congress. It is by no means the view historically associated with conservative constitutionalism. In the coming years, the Supreme Court may face a host of issues testing the justice's commitment to a presidency subject to effective checks and balances. Some issues may arise because our president and some of his closest associates stand at the center of an ongoing investigation of an election campaign tainted by covert foreign involvement and multiple potential crimes. Some issues have already emerged, uh, emerged because this president has refused to distance the performance of his public duties from those commercial activities that enrich his private fortunes. Let me list some of these questions for you. One is whether a president is potentially liable for obstruction of justice if he, and I'm quoting the statute, corruptly endeavors to influence, obstruct, or impede the due and proper administration of the law, unquote, through an official act. The president's lawyers say no, which is almost certainly both wrong and dangerous. Another is whether a president may relieve himself of criminal liability through self-pardon, a power that President Trump has said he absolutely has. A third is whether an incumbent president may be indicted while in office. A fourth issue is whether Congress or a court may subpoena presidential records and even presidential testimony in connection with investigations into the 2016 campaign. A fifth is whether a president is constitutionally entitled to personally direct the activities of all federal criminal prosecutors, including special counsel Robert Mueller. With regard to the president's business dealings, a case is already underway concerning the president's attempt to exempt himself from the reach of the Constitution's emoluments clauses. The president takes the position that unless a payment is made to him personally for services rendered, the profits he pockets from foreign and state governments patronizing his properties are not the business of this Congress. I am fearful of Judge Kavanaugh refereeing these questions for three reasons. First, he explicitly adheres to the tenets of a theory of the Constitution called unitary executive theory. This extreme theory could give the president total control over the actions and decisions of any executive branch official. If it became law, Congress would be unable, for example, to enact statutory limits on the scope of presidential supervisory power or an independent prosecutor. It is a theory subversive of effective checks and balances, which misreads our constitutional history and which the Supreme Court has so far wisely rejected. Second, Judge Kavanaugh's service in the George W. Bush White House coincided with that administration's advocacy of a host of dangerous and unprecedented claims for the reach of presidential power. During his first six years in office, President Bush raised nearly 1,400 constitutional reservations regarding roughly 1,000 provisions of over 100 statutes, more objections, more than three times the total number of objections raised by his 42 predecessors combined. After Judge Kavanaugh left his role as staff secretary, the pace of Bush signing statements slacked off. This fact raises the question to what degree Judge Kavanaugh is responsible for urging unfounded claims of presidential power. Finally, while on the bench, Judge Kavanaugh has approached issues of executive power with an advocate's agenda. His most important opinions on the DC Circuit rooted in unitary executive theory appear in cases where the court had no need to reach constitutional issues at all. He has shown himself willing to craft constitutional doctrine from whole cloth in order to advance his pre-commitment to extreme presidentialism. Our current president daily expresses his contempt for democratic institutions and the rule of law. He believes that all three branches of government, not to mention the press and the private sector, should heal to his personal command. He chafes at the Constitution's <clears throat> constraints on his power. Now is a dangerous moment to elevate to the Supreme Court any justice who would weaken the president's accountability to law. I have elaborated on these points in my written testimony and would be happy to discuss them further in response to your questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Before I take my five minutes, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to, since this is uh, 
I'm going to turn this over to Senator Kennedy to finish the meeting. He'll moderate. But I thought I ought to, first of all, thank the whole panel for participating. And then I want to thank all my colleagues on the committee, both Republican and Democrat, for their cooperation throughout these four days of hearings. And, and except for the first hour and 15 minutes on Tuesday, they all went very well. <laughs> so uh, uh, well, even that went well <laughs> in the end. <laughs> He's looking at you, Senator Whitehouse. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I do appreciate the cooperation that we've had the last uh, the last uh, 31 and a half hours. So I was going to say the last 31 and a half minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. Uh, my my first question is to uh, Professor Heiserling and uh, Professor Chain. Shane, and this isn't a question that I had my staff prepare, but uh, both of you spoke very highly of the fear of presidential power and what he thinks about that. So I'm asking you more of a process question than a substance question. Uh, is, it, uh, is it because you fear having a voice like that on the Supreme Court under any conditions, or is it because you think that his being on the Supreme Court may make a majority uh, understanding the present eight members of the committee, that that would make a majority and make it more dangerous than just having one voice. Microphone. I've been worried about presidential power for decades and across administrations. And so it isn't just the present moment, although the present moment does make me more fearful of presidential power. Uh, it is striking, I will say, even having said that, I will say that he, there will be a clear five justice majority for what I consider to be quite extreme views about presidential power. And would you have anything to add, Professor Shane, to what she said? Uh, my views would be very... Microphone. My views would be very similar, and I would, would echo what Mr. Dean said, that uh, I worry about having the most uh, executive power indulgent Supreme Court since the end of World War II. Okay. Professor White, uh, I think you heard a question I asked the last panel. We've had people express their constitutional rights in demonstrating at this hearing. You've had my colleagues ask uh, views about whether or not J Judge Kavanaugh has any concern about people of <coughs> less means. A and uh, you heard it. Uh, specifically from people on the previous panel. So uh, how do you feel his experience shows or doesn't show that he has those would take those concerns into mind? Sure. Well, the challenge for any judge is to see the case at hand uh, through the eyes of all parties to the case uh, and those who are affected by the case. Uh, in administrative law, a real challenge, uh, I teach it, and before that, I practiced it. And a real challenge is to see administrative law through the eyes of those who are regulated as much as through the eyes of the regulator. It's easy to be a professor, right, or be a high-powered lawyer and see yourself as someday wielding the power of an agency. And of course, you want to be independent. Of course, you want the, uh, the, <coughs> the courts to defer to you. But knowing that regulatory power has significant impacts on not just big corporations, but on landowners, homeowners, farmers, that's important as well. And so when the Supreme Court in recent cases became more critical of the EPA's impositions on landowners claiming authority to regulate wetlands, right? when Judge Kavanaugh took pause at the impacts that the EPA's unprecedented program for greenhouse gas regulations could have on small businesses, churches that fell within the regulatory ambit the EPA was claiming, those two, I think, deserve to be part of this conversation about the impact of government power uh, on people without the means to fight back against it. Thank you. And Mr. Clement, uh, since you <coughs> appear so much before uh, courts, and I guess I said 90 cases you've argued before the Supreme Court, uh, tell me what type of a judge you see uh, Judge Kavanaugh being uh, during his time, during the times of oral arguments. Thank you. Chairman Grassley, I think he's been an exemplary judge on the bench. I think I would describe him as an active judge, but he actively questions both sides. 
I think as an active questioner, he is going to fit right in uh, where he confirmed to the Supreme Court. I think the Supreme Court right now is about the hottest bench that the Supreme Court has ever been. Um, I think each of the last justices that have been confirmed by this committee have tended to ask more questions than the justice they replaced. Uh, so I think he will, he will fit right into what he referred to as the team of nine. And I think from an advocate's perspective, that's what you want. You want somebody who's going to push you, but it's going to push your uh, adversary in the argument and ask the hard questions of both sides. And I think that's what you would get with, uh, that's what you're already getting with Judge Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit, and I think that's what you would see on the Supreme Court of the United States. S Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dean, I don't know if you've been watching the hearings, but my um, take on what we've seen is that for a number of very good reasons, including the Minnesota Law Review article in which um, Judge Kavanaugh um, expressed a policy desire that the president be immunized from uh, law enforcement investigation, and the Kavanaugh comment that U.S. v. Nixon was wrongly decided, and the Georgetown Law Journal episode in which she was asked, as a matter of law, can a president be indicted and put up his hand no with those who uh, agreed that a president was beyond indictment. Um, so it was a very live issue through these hearings about whether the president could properly be the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation. And of course, we know that <clears throat> this president is the subject of an ongoing criminal investigation. And we further know of a separate criminal investigation in which this president has been identified as a named director of the criminal activity. So in that circumstance, what I heard over and over was Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Judge Kavanaugh citing his assertion that U.S. v. Nixon was one of his top four cases. And all other facts being equal, you would say, okay, these other things don't matter very much. But since he said U.S. v. Nixon is one of his top four cases, then obviously that will overwhelm all these other things and we can count on him to uh, do the right thing. But a little bell kept ringing in my mind because whenever he said that, he seemed to just drop very quietly in that it was a trial court subpoena in U.S. v. Nixon. He never raised that point. He never said this would be very different and you know, separated the two arguments. But it strikes me that if his favorite top four U.S. v. Nixon decision is limited to a trial court subpoena and doesn't protect the ability of law enforcement to proceed through, for instance, a grand jury subpoena, he played a little game with us to try to have the best of both worlds, to reserve a little escape hatch for himself to be able to shut down for instance, Mueller investigation or Southern District of New York investigation subpoenas while still purporting to uphold United States v. Nixon as a big favorite decision of his. Would you respond to that? I, I would agree with your analysis. And as I said in my uh, opening statement, uh, I wasn't clear at all that he had uh, reversed his position on U.S. versus Nixon. <clears throat> excuse me, when he said that uh, he wasn't sure it was properly decided. He also used it in the uh, 2016 Law Journal article, along with Marbury versus Madison, Youngstown, and Brown v. Board of Education, in the context of a judge needing a backbone. He didn't say it was rightly decided, uh, and he repeated that several times during the hearings. So I don't think he has... Uh, inform this committee of his real position on that very important case. Yeah, and actually through a rather clever subterfuge, which I think is um, a shame if that's the case. We, we'll, answer, we'll pursue the question further. Um, Ms. Heinzerling, um, you have 
uh, made some powerful statements today, perhaps the best of which was that there's liberty on both sides of the regulatory equation. As you know, <clears throat> we usually see in politics the polluter big money side heavily engaged and then, you know, good luck to the individual victim like Hunter Lachance here earlier with his asthma. Um, and we very often see phony baloney studies that are put together that look at the cost benefit of regulation, but only look at the cost to the polluter, to the regulated industry, totally omit what happens on the other side. Um, could you speak a little bit more about the liberty side of uh, the regulated, the, the beneficiary of the regulation, and how they stand up on the political side in terms of the balance of political power on this question. If you could give us about 30 seconds, Professor. Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the, the laws that uh, engage the administrative agencies in protecting against the kind of harm I mentioned range across a very broad uh, area. And the people who are protected by those rules are the ones who are left unprotected when Judge Kavanaugh says that Congress has no authority to grant that broad a power or to um, give the power, for example, to an independent agency. And we don't hear about that in his opinions at all. We only hear about the liberty of the regulated group. So I wonder to what extent he thinks about the people on the other side. And if you think about it and you think of the witnesses who were on the panel before this one, it's basic things like going outside, being able to go, st go to school on certain days and so forth. That Those are basic elements of liberty that I think weigh, weigh just as heavily on, in the legal equation. Or ought Thank to. Or ought to. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> Professor Coons. My order says Coons and then Klobuchar. <laughs> Professor Klobuchar. In that case, let's talk about some things. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. You're thank welcome, you, Professor. Chair. Uh, thank you to all of you. And um, I think I'll, I'll sort of start where we were uh, ending over there. And I spoke, of course, in my questions with Judge Kavanaugh at length about uh, the 2009 article in the Minnesota Law Review, given it's from my state, um, in which he argued that a president shouldn't be subject to uh, investigations while in office. Uh, Judge Kavanaugh actually, uh, Mr. Dean, suggested that Congress can always impeach the president if there's evidence of wrongdoing, because I asked the similar questions that uh, you raised in your testimony of, well, what if she committed a murder of the president? What if she did this? Um, and he has a, a different differentiating word of a dastardly crime, which I didn't get to the bottom of really, but then also said that, well, you can always impeach the president. And one of the questions that I asked was, well, um, in modern day, these investigations have been done uh, not by Congress, but with the special counsel, independent counsel. And could you talk about uh, the difficulty um, if we don't actually have an, an ability to have an investigation uh, in terms of an impeachment proceeding? I was one who believed very strongly in the independent counsel law. I think that's when Congress did express itself that indeed a sitting president could be investigated. And that withstood several tests on its constitutionality. Uh, we're currently, with the expiration of the sunset clause of the independent counsel law, uh, putting an end to that, we now do it through the regulations of the Department of Justice. And there are certainly no restrictions uh, other than a policy right now at the Department of Justice that prohibits investigation of a president. Uh, the history <clears throat> of that policy, uh, people seem to forget why it was written. Uh, it happened in 1973 when a vice president was under investigation by a Maryland grand jury and defending himself by saying, you can't indict me, you can only impeach me. Uh, a, an opinion was requested of Office of Legal Counsel, <clears throat> excuse me, and they concluded, and I think it was a predetermined uh, uh, solution to a problem, that indeed 
the vice president could be indicted, but the president couldn't be indicted. And that, is, is, that policy has stood since then. Mm -hmm. And you've previously drawn parallels between <clears throat> Watergate and where we are. Is, is that policy has stood since then. Mm -hmm. And you've previously drawn parallels between <clears throat> Watergate and where we are today. Uh, how important was the independence of the federal judiciary in helping our country to weather the Watergate scandal? Just really quickly, because I had one other question. It was, it was vital, let me put it that way. Okay. I would assume that it was. Um, um, Professor Henserly, thank you for being here. Um, I had asked Judge Kavanaugh about how the White House noted that he has overturned agency action 75 times when they announced his nomination. They said he was a leader in overturning uh, uh, these agency decisions. And when I asked him about it, he responded to me by stating that he has also ruled in favor of agencies at times. Uh, what did you think of his response, and how do you view his record in this area of law overall? Yes, it, it would be astonishing if he ruled against the agency in every case. That would be a sign of something seriously amiss. So if there's a handful of cases, I think he may have mentioned about six cases, something like that, in which he ruled in favor of environmentalists. I think most of them were not brought by environmentalists. But if there were a handful of cases, th there would be no nothing surprising about that, and also nothing about it that would indicate that he was even-handed, quite frankly, about the environment. He's issued a number of major decisions, narrowing the environmental laws, requiring a cost-benefit balancing in the face of either clear or arguably ambiguous language. And he has forwarded this message from case after case in the big cases. So in the little easy cases, it's no surprise if an agency might win some of them, or if the environmentalists w might win some of them, if it's an easy case on a procedural matter. But in the big cases, the big environmental cases, he has been all on the other side. And I'll just say, the Supreme Court only takes big cases. Thank you very much. Senator, and Senator Crapo, you're not interested in asking questions? You passed? Senator Coons. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a report on the nomination of Judge Kavanaugh by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law and by the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Without objection. Mr. Dean, uh, thank you for your written testimony and for appearing before us today. Uh, you alone in this panel have the unique historical experience that I think is uh, directly relevant to the question of what happens uh, when presidential power is unchecked and a president is not uh, accountable. Um, based on your experience, um, what are the dangers of a presidency that doesn't uh, face strong checks in the Supreme Court and Congress? And what would have happened in Watergate if President Nixon had been able to avoid compliance with a subpoena or if he'd been able to fire the special prosecutor without some consequential response by Congress? Well, of course, when he <clears throat> first, when he fired the special prosecutor, uh, he reacted to the negative publicity that it generated and the interest of Congress suddenly in impeachment. Uh, <clears throat> so he thought he could possibly stem that tide by uh, bringing a new, uh, he thought it initially favorable and maybe not as aggressive investigation with the appointment of Leon Jaworski. Uh, the second special prosecutor, however, was equally as effective as the original one, Archibald Cox, which I don't think the White House had anticipated. Uh, as far as the courts uh, and the rulings, uh, we would have had a very different history had the Supreme Court not uh, dealt with the tapes case as they did. It would have uh, resulted in Nixon surviving. Mm -hmm. Without the tapes, uh, it was my word against his, and in the polling, he, I, while I was out polling him at times, uh, it wasn't enough to resolve the problem. So without the smoking gun, which was made possible by the Supreme Court's yes. decision in U.S. v. Nixon, presidential accountability might not have occurred. We might not really know what role the president had played, and we might not have avoided the constitutional crisis um, of both confidence um, and we might not have removed a criminal president. And Professor Shane, I. I questioned Judge Kavanaugh fairly aggressively on his view of the scope of presidential authority. Uh, based on his writings, his speeches, his opinions as a judge, uh, I'm concerned he has a view of presidential power that's dangerously unbounded. You've had a chance to review his work. 
do you share my concerns? And what do you make of his enthusiastic and repeated embrace of Scalia's dissent in Morrison? There's a lot to that question, Senator, so I'll, I'll, is, try, to, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, what most concerns me about Judge Kavanaugh's position is not just um, that he, he has embraced the tenets of unitary executive theory, but that he has gone to such lengths to try to create a kind of legal foundation for it in the DC circuit in cases that had nothing to do with unitary executive theory. There was much discussion uh, during Mr. Olson's panel about the case of Morrison uh, versus Olson. And um, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, of course, has uh, famously said that he would uh, like to put the final nail in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the PHH case that was being discussed, this was a case that the DC Circuit unanimously resolved on purely statutory grounds. And Judge Kavanaugh saw fit to write an extensive uh, opinion uh, for the panel on, on the constitutional issue, it later got overturned on bank. But the, issue, the opinion he issued for the panel pulled out of thin air this completely uh, unmoored theory about why a single-headed independent agency was unconstitutional. It was full of arguments that would be perfectly fine for Congress to entertain as a matter of policy, right. but they had nothing to do with the Constitution. With regard to Morrison versus Olson, it is still good law in the Supreme Court uh, that independent agencies are constitutional. Whether they are a good or a bad idea is up to Congress, which has the power to make all laws necessary and proper, not only for carrying into execution the powers of Congress, but the powers of all officers and offices of the United States government. And, Th thank yeah. you, Professor. If I might, a last question to Professor Hinterling. Um, since we went around and around about this several times, per, uh, Judge Kavanaugh and myself, um, in trying to explain his reliance on or his interest in or I would say his fixation with Scalia's dissent um, in Morrison, um, Judge Kavanaugh tried to describe it as you know, sort of a one-off case about a now expired independent counsel statute. And I kept coming back to this dissent in PHH, which Professor Shane was just referencing. Um, do you think that dissent lays out the unitary executive theory um, and displays some significant enthusiasm for it um, that is a well-founded justification for my having concerns about Judge Kavanaugh's uh, views on presidential power. Absolutely. Professor, if you could, just to be fair to everybody, if you could give us about 30 seconds. Yes, absolutely yes. He would have struck down a major federal statute that was very new that set up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau in which Congress had made a judgment about the degree of and the structure of the agency that was necessary in order to counterbalance the power of the financial industry. And he wrote a, a dissent from an en banc denial uh, in that case. So yes, absolutely, you are right to be concerned. I'd like to thank the whole panel and um, just conclude by pointing out that the reason I raised these concerns in impressing Judge Kavanaugh was that it's exactly his quotes about U.S. v. Nixon, his dissent, his enthusiasm for the dissent in Morrison, his dissent in PHH, that leads me to still have concerns that he would not hold the president accountable uh, to an investigation, uh, to a subpoena, or to testimony in a way that we need in our current environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to all the panelists. Mr. Dean, in your written statement, you explained that if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed, we will have the most pro-presidential powers Supreme Court in the modern era. And uh, mo uh, most recently in Trump v. Hawaii, uh, the court upheld the president's uh, basically bald assertion of national security as uh, a way to uh, sustain his uh, Muslim ban. And at least one justice, uh, Justice Sotomayor, said that she saw parallels to Korematsu. So that's already pretty far down the road as far as presidential powers. So what current controversies do you think might come before this court that you have serious concerns as to how Judge uh, Kavanaugh, if he gets in the court, will support the president? In answer, <clears throat> excuse me, in answer to your question, I must say that one of the f things I did before I uh, uh, came to Washington was talk to some academic friends that I think know an awful lot about presidential powers. They're the people I uh, turn to and uh, have discussed these things at great length. They cited that case as one of the examples of how things are quickly slipping out of bounds and where we're headed. 
the fact that uh, uh, we have a president who is unchecked right now by other branches makes it particularly timely to be worried afresh, given the Kavanaugh positions on uh, so many cases that would enhance presidential power. He could, I could see him as the leader of the 5-4 uh, that would enhance presidential powers. And he did not respond affirmatively to any questions as to whether he would recuse himself exactly. uh, should these kinds of questions come before this Supreme Court. Professor Heinzelang, I found your, your testimony really interesting because uh, in my review of uh, Judge Kavanaugh's decision, there are various patterns, and I think he does create some new novel ways to decide um, agency action cases, for example. And when Judge Gorsuch came before us, there were a lot of questions regarding the what we would call the frozen trucker case in which uh, Judge Gorsuch, in my view, uh, his this, this decision or dissent was just outrageous and defied common sense. And I'd look at the SeaWorld v. Florida, the SeaWorld of Florida case as Judge uh, Kavanaugh's frozen trucker case. Do, are you familiar with yes. the... Yes. So w do you think that th this is an example of how far he, uh, Judge Kavanaugh, would go to protect the corporate interests over a, an individual? Yes, I do. I, yes, I do. Explain? Thank you for that question. Uh, in SeaWorld, he took a clear statute, a statute that really fit the situation like a glove, and held that it did not fit that situation because he could imagine that the single enforcement action based on a single day at a single amusement park might be deployed, that theory might be deployed, to rule out tackles in football. And that can't be what Congress meant. And so he took clear language about assuring a reasonable surf, um, workplace against recognized harms that were avoidable and that the agency has held in an evidentiary hearing all of those factual circumstances were met in that case. And he said no in dissent. He said no, I, I don't believe this is covered by the statute because I can't believe Congress meant to rule out tackles in football. That wasn't what the case was about. And it, it, was, it was absolutely, in my opinion, a departure from both the, the language of the statute the, and the interpretation by the agency and common sense. I think there is a pattern of that kind of decision making by Justice uh, Kavanaugh. Let me cite to a couple of other examples. I mean, you know, the standing is one of the threshold issues. If you don't have standing, you're out of court. So, for example, in Public Citizen Inc. v. National Highway Safety, Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, but there was a public interest group challenging the adequacy of tire safety standards because they thought that. Uh, that this may increase the risk of harm. Um, and he found that that was way too speculative a, an interest to articulate, so this public interest group was out. On the other hand, in Grocery Manufacturers Association v. EPA, where the grocery manufacturers process foods people challenged EPA action saying, well, what you are making us do might increase prices for them, and uh, that would just be too much. And he said that was not too speculative for him. So when an, a business interest comes forward and says, this is going to cost us money, maybe. But when a public interest group comes out and says, this is going to harm people, he finds that too speculative. Have you seen this kind of pattern in his uh, decision making? Yes, and I, I will say that this is a pattern, I think, across standing cases where the courts have, in my opinion, wrongly made it very difficult for public interest groups, and in particular groups like environmental groups, to come to court to complain about violations of federal law. And they make it very easy for business groups to do that. So that's a very, in some ways, subtle way mm -hmm. of loading the dice against the public interest groups that we've been talking about. The Roberts Court is already heading toward, the, they're, they're much more oriented toward uh, pr protecting corporate interests over individual rights. We don't need another justice going in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Blumenthal. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Uh, welcome to you all, and thank you for being here. I know some of you have come from a far distance, but you recognize, as we do, the importance of this decision for us, and uh, I want to begin uh, perhaps by asking Mr. Dean a couple questions. Um, 
Sir, when you came forward, which was before the United States versus Nixon case, uh, you didn't write an anonymous op-ed, did you? No, I did not. You came forward. Actually, it, I did send a, my only discussion with the media was having my secretary read a quickly dictated line to get to my superiors. They were making a mistake if they were going to make me the scapegoat of their activities. In effect, you announced to the world what you were going to do. I did. And to your superiors. Yes. And the result was a bombshell. Yes. And the United States versus Nixon case produced evidence that corroborated the evidence that you had provided, correct? Well, I had testified I believed I had been recorded. That prompted the Senate staff to ask Mr. Butterfield if that was possible. He said it's very possible and very likely. Uh, the special counsel uh, filed immediately for those tapes, the tape cases, and the fight in the courts started. The whole dynamics of Watergate changed, and it became all about obtaining the tapes and whether they would cooperate or not my testimony. And I can remember vividly the picture of Alexander Butterfield revealing those tapes. And it was also a bombshell, correct? July 16th, 1973, it was. And we could go through the history here, but where I'm going with my <clears throat> points is that it wasn't just or maybe even primarily the United States Supreme Court in United States v. Nixon. It was a number of individuals who had the backbone and guts to come forward, whatever motives at the time, and speak that truth to power, correct? Yes. So we tend here to talk about the law about U.S. v. Nixon, about a unitary president, about all kinds of concepts that mean little to the American people, but we're talking about basic courage to stop a constitutional crisis. But this, this system is important to those who do want to rely on it. There is now arguably a cancer on the presidency as malignant and metastasizing as there was then, correct? Yes, I would agree with that. And the only way to really stop it is not by relying on laws alone, but on people respecting the laws, taking acts of personal courage, and coming forward to speak that truth to power. Would you agree? Even with anonymous op-eds. Even with anonymous op-eds, which could lead others to come forward. Yes. Non-anonymously. Yes. But cases are not <clears throat> built, built on anonymous sources. Eventually, there have to be witnesses willing True. to testify and speak that truth to power. You have said that uh, your belief is that President Trump would never resign because he, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, is shameless. I think you've used you, something like Yes. It. Would you give us, in your view, your analysis, knowing Richard Nixon as you did, uh, the reasons why he resigned? I suspect it had something to do with the fact that he saw impeachment coming and he was told by Hugh Scott and Everett Dirksen that he lacked the votes in the Senate to avoid conviction. But let me ask you your... I, it, it was very much the fact that he was going to lose in an impeachment battle, that the House would impeach and the Senate would find him guilty and remove. Uh, that appeared to be the case. But I think also Richard Nixon had done something that was made it very awkward for him. He had pulled people aside and told them a falsehood that he had had nothing to do with the cover-up until I had told him about it, uh, which was a flat-out lie, and he had been caught in that by the release of the so-called smoking gun tape. 
But even more basically, I think he left because the man at his core had a respect for the rule of law. That's one of the differences I find today in Mr. Trump and the reason I don't think he would resign. He, does, he could care less about the rule of law. And ultimately Thank also, you. just you can begin question. to wrap up. Yes, sir, Senator. Go ahead. Uh, one more. Ultimately also, it was those Republicans in the United States Senate who delivered the message, we won't stand for it. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, let me ask a few questions. I'll, I'd love to be able to ask all of you questions. I just don't know if I have time. Let me start with Ms. Mastel. Did I say your name? Yes, that's correct. I, I want to be sure I understand. Um, Judge Kavanaugh coached your daughter? Yes. And his daughter wasn't on the team at that time? Correct. <laughs> and when he finished coaching the kids, at the end of the season, he wrote them all personal notes? Yes, a detailed evaluation of things to work on, things you did well, and then the final note, which is what I read. Did, did, does he generally do that for his teams, or do you know? I think he does it for everybody on the team, for every team he's coached. I want to switch gears. I think I heard Professor White and P Professor, is it Henseling? Henseling, my apologies, talk a little bit about, about uh, transfer of power from Congress to the President. And I'm thinking of it in terms of the Chevron doctrine. Um, here's, and, and, I, and I'd like you to each quickly help me out with this. Here's my problem with the Chevron deference. I just don't understand how it's constitutional. And here's why. I, I look at the, uh, the APA, which, of course, Congress passed. And Congress says, the review, this is the law, the reviewing court, not the agency, the reviewing court shall decide all relevant questions of law, interpret constitutional and statutory provisions, and determine the meaning or applicability of the terms of an agency action. That's a statute, 5 U.S.C. Section 706, as I'm sure both of you know better than I do. So how can, con how, how can the courts construe that congressional directive as giving the power to an agency? That, I mean, it's, that was not clearly not Congress's intent. Could you each give me about 30 seconds on that? This is a great question, and it's a, a real, it's a puzzle in administrative law a little bit. The, the text of the Administrative Procedure Act says what you say it says, and has been sort of hidden from view in a way for a number of years. But I think the answer would be that even where a court defers to an administrative agency on the interpretation it's offered, it's still making the legal judgments, the relevant legal judgments. It is deciding, for, in the first instance, is the statute so clear that it shouldn't defer at all? And in the second instance, even if the statute isn't clear, it's making the judgment about whether that interpretation is permissible. So if I could, not to interrupt you, but yeah. I have to keep this on schedule. That's fine. So you, you think that Chevron deference is, is unconstitutional in your No, I think it's consistent with the language of the Administrative Procedure Act. I don't think it's unconstitutional, think it's no. Okay. Uh, Professor White. One of the interesting things about Chevron and its relatively short history is that you've had critics and proponents on both sides of the aisle. The mm -hmm. most eloquent case for Chevron's constitutionality and propriety came from Justice Scalia in a 1989 Duke Law Journal article. That said, there's been an increasing awareness, I think, on both sides that in the biggest cases, Chevron deference illustrates either a delegation of judicial power to an agency or it respects a delegation of legislative power to an agency. That's why you see, I think most recently in the King v. Burwell case, okay. where Chief Justice Roberts with Justices I Ginsburg, stop the press. well, as I say, with Ginsburg, Breyer, and others uh, set aside Chevron. Right. Okay, I got it. You've helped me a lot there. Uh, Professor Mascott, did I say it correctly? Yes, Senator. Uh, did you ever see? Uh, did you ever see Judge Kavanaugh take politics? in the consideration in deciding a case? No, Judge Kavanaugh spent his time learning the record inside out, looking at the law, no. statutes, and precedents. But, but you were with him a year? Yes, sir. You never saw him take no. politics, ever? No. Not once? Nope. Okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, Mr. Clement, uh, should the uh, Supreme Court televise oral arguments? Well, that's an 
Excellent. Could you turn your mic on? That's an excellent question. I've only I think got 42 seconds. Sure. I, I think that that's an excellent question. It's a question that I think this, the justices are ultimately going to have to answer at some point unless Congress forces its hands by passing statute. And then there'll be a very interesting question whether that statute is constitutional. My own view, for what it's worth, is that uh, televising Supreme Court arguments makes an awful lot of sense. Um, it's it's an, one of the odd realities that everybody seems to think that until they become a Supreme Court justice. And then they tend to have a different view. But as, as I sit here as a Supreme Court advocate, I honestly don't see a particularly compelling argument why the public shouldn't get to see what the proceedings televised. And I think if they did, they'd have a very high opinion of the Supreme Court of the United yeah. States. Well, I appreciate that. You're a hell of a lawyer. All right, uh, I'll let Ms. Or, or Senator Hirono go over, so I'm going to go over 20 seconds. Mr. Dean, um, I don't care about your politics. I really don't. I have friends on both sides of the aisle. Um, like Senator Blumenthal, I remember vividly the early 1970s as well when you worked in the White House. Um, I think you and your co-conspirators hurt my country. Um, I believe in second chances, but you did the right thing ultimately, but you only did it when you were cornered like a rat. And I, it's hard for me to take your testimony seriously. And I, I'm going to give you a chance to respond. But I couldn't sleep tonight if I didn't tell you that. I'll not give you a chance to respond. The, uh, the president has also called me a rat. Uh, and I don't think I, you I'm understand. I'm not calling you a rat, though, no. in the sense of your, your, what you did with the, with the prosecutor. That's not what I mean. But, uh, but um, I honestly feel that way as an American. I think you hurt our country. Uh, I uh, wrote a book based on all the Watergate conversations that were secretly recorded, learned a lot that I hadn't known. Out of the thousand conversations that Nixon had on Watergate, I was involved in 39 of them. I think every, every conversation I had with him, I'm trying to warn him, alert him, find out how much he does know or doesn't know. I tried internally to end the cover-up. I didn't succeed. That's the day I think I met Richard Nixon. I didn't know the man, hadn't had dealings with him. There's a great misconception about what a 30, early 30s White House counsel could do around a White House. So maybe you'd want to, I'll send you a copy of that book, and it might give you some insights into what really did happen in there. Okay. All right. Well, we're done. Um, I want to thank I want to thank this panel very much. Um, I'm going to say what I said to the earlier panels. Uh, I know this testimony doesn't just write itself, and you all spent a lot of time on it. And and uh, um, I, I really want to thank you. I I think all of us get a lot out of this part of the confirmation process. Um, the record will remain open until noon on Monday. And that's consistent with uh, other Supreme Court nominee practices. With that, thanks to everyone. These hearings are adjourned.